Testing. Thanks very much. Um, Basil now will be making the introductions. He's just making his way to the stage. Um, so we'll be starting momentarily, just making sure all the microphones work so that you can hear us all. Yes. Okay. Hi. Well, thank you very much all for coming here today. Um, this is the fifth installment of our Big Data in Cybersecurity. It's, uh, we hope to be uh, the most interesting uh, and the bigger than any other time. Uh, it's going to be over two days, as you all know, so hopefully most of you will be here tomorrow. Um, our speakers and the people who are here uh, to help with the conference are coming from a lot of different uh, organizations, universities, the Scottish government. Um, we are, uh, it's a, a cyber academy is a part of the university, part of the School of Computing that is organizing this event. And um, I'm happy to be the manager of the cyber academy for the last two years. Um, we are having a, um, the cyber academy has uh, it's as its current strategy to create new strategic partnerships with businesses and other organizations from the industry, the government, professional bodies, and bring them into the university to work together, create world-class conferences and attract industry leaders and top academics from around the world. And today we have some of them with us and organize public awareness events to, that will benefit society as a whole. Uh, one of the most important projects we ran this year was a cybersecurity taster for a new diverse audience. Uh, it was deemed to be a very big success. We had a, a great retention uh, rate, and we're still uh, evaluating the findings from this uh, course. Uh, some of the people who participated are actually still are here today with us. Uh, the pilot was funded by the Scottish government, and hopefully we'll be running uh, more of these uh, courses uh, really soon. Uh, many of the people who attended uh, are now considering a career in cybersecurity, studying either in a university or college level or uh, through uh, more practical means like apprenticeships. Um, there was part of the strategic business's um, objectives actually is our partnerships and our partnerships with uh, some of the uh, organizations based here in Edinburgh uh, have proven to be very important. Um, I have to say first of all uh, Royal London is becoming uh, a platinum supporter of the Cyber Academy, and that's thanks to Ivan here, who is a graduate from the university. Uh, ECS Security, again, uh, a relationship that has grown up through <laughs> one, uh, uh, Harry McLaren, one of our other graduates. Um, I have to say that ECS Security is the single largest recruiter of graduates from our uh, MSc program. Am I allowed to say that, Harry? <laughs> so uh, this year, nine out of 10 people had in, the, in their SOC were actually from Napier. So that's, that's a big number. And uh, ID Cyber Solutions is the third uh, business that is joining us and will be delivering a joint training together. Now, for the coming year, 2019-20, We've got a lot of conferences uh, planned. Uh, there's a big blockchain conference that's gonna be on in September, big data in health later in October. Adrian Smales here is gonna be running that. Uh, we've got the cybersecurity in education. That's 
one of Bill's projects. Uh, uh, two of uh, two smaller conferences, one in phishing and one in fake, fake news as a cyber threat. Uh, in uh, sometime in September, we'll be running a mega cyber meetup where the biggest meetups in in Edinburgh in uh, in the field of cybersecurity, uh, blockchains, and IoT will come together to a really big event. So please follow our website and our social media. And we're going to have two GDPR events this year. The one's going to be the 500 days, and the other one's going to be next year, two years, and two days. That makes sense you know, for the calendar. We got two uh, acclaimed speakers coming in uh, later on this month. Uh, Bruce Nair is one of them. Andreas Andronopoulos, uh, another guru in blockchain, is going to be joining us. Uh, that's both these speakers are here on the same day, on the 19th of June. More information at the reception outside. And we plan to have uh, to deliver a lot of training for uh, uh, with the Cyber Academy in our soft lab. Uh, incident response for managers and for IT professional. Uh, both me and Adrian are going to be involved in that one. Uh, delivering some Splunk, cryptography, uh, digital evidence for legal professionals. That's going to be together with the Law Society of Scotland, Cyber conta, a Combat, Curator, and a lot more. And next May is our birthday, our fifth birthday. So there's going to be a party, and everybody <laughs> will be welcome. Again, follow our social media, and you'll find out uh, the details. Some of the organizations that we work with right now, and uh, we are building our relationships, are the Law Society of Scotland, Full Proxy, uh, uh, who are working with F5, and Symantec, uh, Palo Alto, QA, and the Scottish Paralegal Association. Uh, last but not least, I would like to thank our sponsors for today, SIXA, uh, which is uh, sponsoring the academic stream, Full Proxy, and Seven Elements. So thank you very much all for, you, for being here, and we'll start with the next, uh, uh, with our next, uh, the first, actually, speaker, Dave. So, Mr. Socrates Katskas. So, eh? Is it? Bill, Bill, is it recording? It's recording. Okay. Thank you very much. I have my own ah, you portable mic. That's yeah, that's good. fine. And this is a clicker. Is it also a pointer? Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, I guess. No. Uh, no, no. This, Wrong. Is the, yes. this is the black screen. Yes. <laughs> okay. So where's the, the pointer? The, the, the pointer? Ah, sorry. It should be this one. Is it? No. Uh, no. I sorry. have my own. <laughs> <laughs> so don't worry. Sorry, sorry. If it doesn't work, don't worry. No, uh, I might not I, even I, I need don't, it. Don't, I, don't worry, Basil. I don't think the, the point will work with the screen. So. Uh, you may be right. No, it does. Okay. Yep. Okay, uh, you no. Tools on the trade always good. Ah, okay. So, good morning, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. Many thanks to the organizers for uh, the, the opportunity to be here with you today, for the invitation and the opportunity to be with you today uh, and uh, talk with you uh, about the challenges that arise uh, from our new endeavor and paradigm shift in computing. The last one having been uh, cloud computing or fog computing, but the new one being integrating IT with OT. You see, in terms of security, we, we keep doing fatal mistakes. Originally, we connected inherently insecure machines over an inherent, inherently insecure communication channel, the internet. And we ended up with the mess we have today. Now this was not enough, and we are connecting even more insecure devices to all this mess. So what do you expect? Challenges, so many of them uh, which we don't even know how to address. Some of them we know how to address, but still open questions, a lot of them. So a few words uh, where I, uh, on, on where I come from. I have uh, more than one hat. But uh, today, I'm wearing the NTNU uh, hat, the Norwegian University of Science and Technology. I'm a professor there. I'm uh, leading the Critical Infrastructure Security and Resilience Group, 
at the Center for Cyber and Information Security within the Department of Information Security and Communications Technology. Now, CCIS is a public-private venture. We have about 25 partners from industry and government, so CCIS is fully supported by them, and also the Department of Justice of the Norwegian government with the overall aim of bridging academia to the real, the real world. And uh, NTNU is the largest university, of course, in, uh, in Norway with about 40,000 students now. We tend to believe it's, uh, it's the best as well, even though our colleagues at the University of Oslo might have a different opinion on this. Uh, but it's a research intensive university with more than 500 PhDs awarded every year. Now, enough of this, let's get into the, uh, the actual talk. As uh, Industry 4.0 is part of the title in good academic tradition, let me just say a few words about Industry 4.0. Uh, possibly for those among you that possibly are not familiar with the term. Uh, obviously, since this is the fourth, there have, there have been three before this one. The first one happened in the UK, actually, in the 18th century. And the enabling technology there, because all of them were driven by some new technology or some new application, uh, was the, the steam, the power of steam. So it happened in the, started in the 18th century, uh, mostly evident in the manufacturing process, the, the clothing industry at the time. The second one happened uh, around the uh, 30s, 1930s, in the US. The enabling technology was electricity, of course. And it manifested itself mostly with mass production and uh, assembly lines mostly in the automobile uh, industry. The third one is much more recent, in the beginning of the uh, 20th, uh, uh, 21st uh, century, or the end of the 20th, and uh, the enabling technology was, of course, IT. The fourth one is the one that uh, we experience today, and the main element here is the convergence of IT with operational technology, so the introduction of uh, uh, information technology into the process, the industrial process at large. And the, the end result is what we call cyber physical systems. There are several enabling technologies that have allowed this uh, evolution. It's not a revolution, it's, it's mostly an evolution, I would say. So uh, you would say that the enabling technologies behind Industry 4.0, what drives the, uh, the, the, the new evolution uh, are new devices. The IIoT is the industrial Internet of Things. We focus on this rather than the Internet of Things at large. Machine-to-machine -machine communication, those of you working on big data, big data analytics have their place in there and so on and so forth, technologies that you will be able to recognize. I don't need to go through them, through all of them. And, uh, well, it manifests itself into many industrial areas with, an, uh, uh, right now, a focus, an emphasis on smart uh, manufacturing. That doesn't mean that other areas uh, in, in industry are not, uh, are not uh, uh, influenced by, by this, uh, this, this, these developments. Now, all these will create some security challenges, uh, but before going into that, let me give you uh, a reference model, an architectural reference model for what is called the Industry 4.0 factory of the future, focusing on manufacturing technology, on smart manufacturing, but also this can apply to any other industrial process, more or less. So several levels here, underlying the manufacturing processes and the equipment, what we have already today. This already exists, but then you can see several levels above that with industrial control and supervision devices and systems, two levels here with sensors and actuators, with SCADA systems and PLCs and RTUs, distributed control systems and human machine interfaces, and then the upper levels of, the, of all that, the highest, of course, being 
the cloud because everything now is on the cloud. Personally, I don't think this is a good idea, but anyway, this is the trend. So we will move towards this anyway, to the cloud and to mobile, mobile computing. So this is how this looks like. Well, this is really nice. I mean, it's brilliant, right? It's, it's, a, it's a great idea, but it doesn't come for free because uh, unfortunately there are some, well, how should we call them? Not exactly angels, okay? All reversed angels out there. And all this creates tremendous opportunities for these guys. So usually what these guys can do and they couldn't do when the manufacturing process was limited to this or at most to this, they can get in all this model through the upper, the upper layer, which of course is open to the outside world. One of the ways, and in fact, I think this is the most uh, frequent one, Steve will talk about, the human factor is always the weakest link in, in the chain. And uh, you don't really need to revert to sophisticated types of attacks to get into a system like that. You would probably get much more chances of success if you just employed social engineering techniques, one of which, of course, is, is phishing, to, uh, to get legitimate credentials for getting into the system. That's what experience says. Now, once there, up there, you can walk your way and work your way through down to the late, to the last uh, or the first uh, level, which is actually the manufacturing process. Some may wonder, but surely we do have protection mechanism between the layers, don't we? Well, yes, we do. And in theory, layers are air gapped in between. But unfortunately, air gaps are not airtight, usually. So this is entirely possible, and in fact, experience has shown that this has happened many times, it's still happening, and it will, um, I'm afraid, continue to happen in the near future. So, let's see why. Uh, well, maybe I'll put all those, originally I had thought of giving them one by one to you, but maybe it's better to do that, uh, to stay within the time limits or not. Oops. Okay, the first one, characteristic of all this industry 4.0 model, uh, which you don't find in pure IT systems, is the requirement for resilience. We cannot assume that the overall system will be secure. We, we must assume that it will be attacked, it will be successfully attacked, and therefore it should be able to still function even at a reduced capacity or functionality under attack. You can't simply shut it down. Imagine that an industry 4.0 paradigm is of course the smart grid by itself. And you imagine the smart grid shutting itself down because of an attack, well it could, but uh, that's not a good idea. Then there is a convergence between safety and security. Whenever you mix or you join IT and OT, through this model, you can get access through the IT to the OT. And that means that you can affect the physical process underneath the cyber, the cyber process. Now that in turn means that when we design systems like that, we should take care that both safety and security are taken into account. And this is not trivial to do, particularly because <coughs> Most of these systems have been designed in the past with safety in mind. They have been optimized with safety in mind. Now, if a security engineer attempts to change the requirements of a system, the design specification of a system, to instill security on top of safety, and imagine what? You have conflicting requirements most of the time. How do you handle this? Well, the response, of course, the answer is that you should take care of uh, uh, specifying, making all these specification jointly from the beginning so that you don't have conflicts. This is easier said than done. All these systems 
have a nature of systems of systems, federated things. And in fact, this goes together with scalability. Imagine uh, an industrial process that uh, also incorporates wireless uh, sensor networks. People do put additional wireless sensor networks in the factory or the industrial process at any time. So it needs to be scalable, but this creates security challenges. And the systems of systems nature creates the following uh, difficulty. Uh, this is not a really uh, characteristic of convergence between IT and OIT. It applies to IT alone as well, but it's more pronounced here. Suppose that we have two components which we know that individually are secure. They meet some security requirements. Do we know what will happen if we put them together? Will the end result will be secure? There's no way of knowing that. Unless you revert to formal techniques, which are not really very useful when you talk about large-scale systems. Interaction with the physical world means that we should take threats and attacks much more seriously than we do in, uh, in IT, simply because they can result in physical damage as well, or in uh, damage to health, or even to injury to, uh, to people. <coughs> These processes that are underlying the, the cyber part of Industry Point 4 uh, uh, model, they are usually time aware and deadline sensitive. The usual answer of security experts, or not so much experts, not so that uh, experts, uh, when asked how they are going to secure a process or a communication, would be that they would use encryption. And indeed, encryption is nowadays the most frequently used tool for securing uh, communications, at least, or not only communications, but storage. And uh, it is a paradigm that has been ported over several computing paradigms up till now. So even in this case, one would be tempted to say, okay, why don't we use encryption to encrypt our communication and all that? Well, it would have been a good idea, but sometimes by encrypting communications in an industrial process, you do much more harm than an attacker would do if you didn't have them encrypted, simply because of the time criticality of the underlying process. Encryption has this uh, unfortunate disadvantage of being quite slow. So we need to come up with lightweight encryption mechanisms, which we have not yet. Add to this the fact that all this computation, or most of this computation, in industrial processes is performed in resource-constrained devices. So it's not only time-critical process that you're handling, but also you try to handle that with a restrained uh, resources platform. There is a need to accommodate in-place business processes in such systems. What does that mean? Authentication, right? Yes. Should we use biometrics? Yes, of course, it's a very secure means of authentication. Can you use biometrics in the control room of a power plant? Yes, you can, but you would be sacrificing the availability of the system, and you cannot do that, because you simply need to have the system available to the operator, available at an instance and you cannot afford to use complex biometrics, uh, biometric authentication mechanisms to do that. Do we have solutions? Yes, we do. But they are not yet commercially available. In fact, they have not even left the lab, most of them. There is a requirement for always on. If an IT system needs to be updated or to uh, be patched security-wise, well, you can always bring it down. You can't bring down a power plant. You can't bring down a factory. You can't bring down the smart grid. You can't bring down any of those things. So you have to find ways of doing all this with the system on 
and it's a nightmare. Dynamic domain of use. People come and go. Roles come and go in such environments. So if you try to manage keys, for example, authentication keys, between autonomous vehicles, let's take another example. This is a federation whose members change possibly every minute. You can't simply use the traditional ways of managing keys. Difference of a life cycle between IT and OT systems. Well, as we all know, IT has a very short life cycle. Things change rapidly. Manufacturing technology, mechanical equipment, electrical equipment do not change that frequently. So you find in a power plant, you may find equipment whose lifetime exceeds 50 years and is designed to exceed 50 years. Can you make sure, even if you can ensure, that this type of equipment will be compatible with your security solutions today, that it will be compatible still with your security solutions after 50 years? That's quite a challenge. There's still some more of a technical nature. Okay. By definition, Industry 4.0 is based on, at least partially, new devices, IoT devices. None of these have been designed with security in mind. They have been designed with functionality in mind. That means that they are inherently vulnerable. It's exactly the same thing, the same mistake that we did when we originally used PCs, which had been designed for an entirely different purpose, and ported them for use in critical applications, in the office or in production. Increased connectivity because of wireless networks. This was also touched upon before. We have a complexity of the supply chain, and this is uh, well, this is not so much of a technical nature, but uh, blockchain people will, of course, be familiar with the trend of uh, using smart contracts between elements or components of the supply chain. Now, this is a great idea, right? Because it increases productivity, it makes things easier, but at the same time, it means that you open up parts of your system to external entities, and this creates a challenge by itself. Legacy industrial control systems. Would you be surprised if I told you that Windows XP for industry are still being used in industry and in critical industry, as a matter of fact? I guess some of you would not. But even those of you would be surprised if I told you that still there exist DOS machines in industrial systems. Controlling critical functionalities. Dealing with this is usually a neglected issue. You know, in research, we usually have a trend of looking to the future. Right? So we now research ways of designing the future systems. But this is not enough in this case. We need to look at how to take care of legacy systems because we will always have legacy systems there. The industrial Internet of Things by itself poses a challenge, mainly because it is based on insecure protocols. The industrial protocols, again, were never designed, communication protocols, were never designed with security in mind, simply because security was not an issue, because they were designed at a time when it was implicitly assumed that in order to hack a protocol, you would have to be physically present, and this was taken care otherwise. Now, this is not the case anymore, because you can get through that from top of the model to the bottom. I already uh, hinted about the interconnection between the logical and the physical world that takes place because of this uh, IT and OT convergence, and this results in threats that we have never experienced before, and they are called cyber-physical threats because it's a combination of cyber and physical and physical threats. 
old equipment or even modern equipment in industry is uh, very frequently having unused functionalities. This is the dream of a hacker, an unused functionality. No one knows about it. Usually it's not configured. It's not configured at all. So you would expect default passwords or even no passwords to be there. And this is typical. On the human side, every transformation, every digital transformation of this form brings about organizational and behavioral changes and this affects security as well. Just one example. How the future worker or the current worker will cooperate with a robotic arm when they are actually collaborating and not just working independently. This is expected to bring about behavioral changes and these do indirectly affect security. <coughs> uh, I will come to those two later on. So as part of the solutions that we have, so let's not call them challenges at this, uh, at this, point, at this point. Now, when trying to organize a discussion to give an overview of solutions in any area, I always have a problem organizing that and I have found a way of doing it which, well, maybe is appropriate. Uh, some of you may recognize in this the NIST framework for improving the cybersecurity of critical infrastructures. What it does, it actually takes you by hand from the beginning of the life cycle of any cybersecurity program in an organization, which is to identify your needs and your requirements, deploy the protective measures, deploy detective measures, and then respond and recover. So this is one way of organizing the discussion about what we have done. Under identify, things that, uh, terms that usually come up are uh, risk analysis, vulnerability analysis, threat modeling, attack investigation, penetration testing, security requirements, elicitation, and so on. There has been quite uh, an extensive amount of research done regarding uh, primarily risk analysis uh, for systems that have a cyber and a physical uh, part, for IT and OT systems, or for cyber physical systems. Remember that the related challenge there is that when we do a risk analysis for such systems, we should take care jointly of security and safety. Now, there have been several methodologies for doing that. The problem is <coughs> that all of them are domain specific, simply because the safety requirements, the safety needs are domain specific. So you can't come up with a generic method for risk analysis of such systems as, for example, the ISO 27005 uh, standard. There's no way of doing this. It's not a simple plug-in into the workflow of the 27005. So there is still open room for that. Same for vulnerability analysis. Vulnerability analysis in all these devices is not, is not an easy task to do. Threat modeling is quite different if you consider the fact that we are talking also about cyber physical uh, threats and adversarial models that cannot be found in pure IT systems. Attack investigation is something interesting. In a purely IT system, of course, we can test attacks and we can test our cybersecurity solutions as well. And we do have uh, cyber ranges for doing this, right? Well, in Industry 4.0 systems, you can't possibly experiment with a live system. It's not a good idea. You can't take a smart grid or a factory and uh, install countermeasures and then launch attacks against it to see whether your countermeasures will work. Not a good idea at all. So what we need to come up with is the equivalent of cyber ranges for such kinds of systems. Now, these can be called, it's a term uh, my team has coined, cyber physical ranges, but of course the architecture of these is quite different than an IT, a uh, pure IT uh, cyber range. And it would need 
to have not only real hardware parts, but also emulated and simulated parts, because you can't simply make a test that, that would resemble uh, a large-scale industrial uh, installation. <laughs> Techniques for penetration testing in such systems are emerging. No real standardization there yet. Quite an open uh, area for research, as well as tools and methodologies for uh, putting together security uh, requirements. There are several tools, of course, for eliciting security requirements in IT systems. <coughs> Some of them, researchers have now started to work on extending them to include uh, cyber physical uh, systems, including safety requirements as well. Again, they would have to be domain, uh, domain specific. In, uh, in our lab, we're doing some work on this with uh, uh, secure tropos in the, the maritime domain right now. So for the cyber enabled uh, uh, ships. Under protection, there are three major categories of uh, solutions that have appeared in the literature for uh, such types of systems. These are hardware security measures, the usual uh, stuff about secure execution environments in several varieties. That's one area. Uh, another area is securing the communication channels and uh, one of the prominent uh, research areas there is how can we explore the um, uh, fifth generation 5G uh, communication systems within such uh, environments. We're now starting a project, the Horizon project. Uh, in fact, the kickoff meeting is uh, tomorrow and I can't be there, uh, on using SDN for securing the smart grid. And general protection approaches have also been proposed, but I would say that the uh, real message is here that you can't really come up with a one-size-fits-all approach, because that would not be uh, efficient. Comment about the encryption algorithms has been made already, and since there are several people here interested in blockchain technology, blockchain technology, we are being, we are being using it also in, in my lab in several projects for uh, securing device integrity in uh, industrial in industrial settings or even smart home settings. It works, but uh, well, there are other ways of doing it as well. But of course, this is a sexy thing. I mean, blockchain is uh, something that uh, is, is high on research now. I guess my guess is that uh, the expectations are higher than what we will be eventually able to deliver. This is not this is not strange. Remember the, the case with artificial intelligence back in the 60s and the 70s? Artificial intelligence was promising the world. But unfortunately, it didn't deliver. Well, it does deliver now. Why? Because, of course, the computational power is there. And the data, the big data are there. So that AI tools and techniques can effectively be used. Perhaps, I hope, something like that would happen with uh, blockchain technology but not yet. Under detection, well, under detection, we usually speak about intrusion, intrusion detection for, uh, for industrial control systems, such systems, convergent IT, OT, let's say. And the, the characteristics there, of course, machine learning is a prominent technology which is being used, but also there are several specific things that need to be considered when you design an IDS for such, uh, for such systems. Uh, one of them, the most important, I would say, is that uh, you can't simply port the logic that we use for network intrusion detection or for host intrusion detection in a system like this. Because if you just look at the network, you may be watching a perfectly normal traffic, but the control signals that are being sent may be such that they would even destroy the underlying physical process. A trivial example, which we usually discuss, uh, we, we bring in this, in this discussion, suppose that you have a system 
uh, which includes two liquid tanks, or there are two valves, and the sequence of opening of the valves has to be A first, B second, because otherwise all hell breaks loose. Okay? Now, if you, look, if you look at the network, and a, a command is given to open B first rather than A, the network will not see anything which is abnormal, but the hell will break loose. Okay? And that's why we look at what we call physics-based or process-aware intrusion detection systems for these systems. Now, this is uh, one before last time. I only have a slide on conclusions. It's not mine. ENISA does a very good work on this, so I borrowed this from the ENISA report on good practices. And as usual, don't only look for technological solutions. Cybersecurity solutions always are a combination of policies, organizational practices, technical practices, and so on. In fact, well, Bruce Schneier has already been quoted once today. Yep. <coughs> uh, they say that every cybersecurity lecture should have at least one Bruce Schneier uh, quote in order to be decent. So my quote is that Bruce Schneier uh, has said or written that uh, all the fundamental things about cybersecurity we have, we know, we have discovered. The problem is putting them together and apply them correctly. So we shouldn't really be looking for more technology. We should be looking for how to apply what we know efficiently. Okay. I hope I have convinced you that this convergence that we experience gives rise to serious challenges. We have not experienced those before. This is not particular to this convergence. Porting security solutions from one paradigm to another has never worked fully. But of course, it, it can work partially. So this is also true in this case. <coughs> securing legacy systems, I already emphasized this before, is equally important to securing our future and our modern systems because we will be living with them for long. There are several open research problems. I think they are exciting. If there are people in the audience that also find them exciting, we do have openings in, uh, in NTNU at the PhD and postdoc level. You're welcome to apply. If you can live with the weather in Norway, <laughs> which is not much worse than uh, uh, the northern of the UK, I would say, even though today uh, Edinburgh is lovely. <laughs> and this situation, as I said in the beginning, is likely to continue because we still make the same mistakes. We put insecure things together. This is good news, actually, for those of you studying cybersecurity. You will be sought after in the future, so you will have a brilliant career in front of you. So, thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you for that, Professor Katikas. Um, that was very interesting. We will hold questions because we're slightly short of time. We might have some time just before the break. Um, so if you can hold questions Absolutely. For, for, for then. That well, I'll be around time. the whole day anyway. So, Fantastic. Yes. <laughs> Glad to hear it. That would be, be really good. Um, now we have um, Fission, the threat that keeps on going, um, by Professor Fennell, uh, from, uh, who's the Associate Dean from Plymouth University. Okay, thank you, very much. thank you very much. Morning, everybody. Good morning. Come on. Good morning. Good morning. That's better. Makes me feel welcome now. Okay, so as you can see on the slide there, we're talking about a little known problem called phishing. Now, before we go much further, how many of you have uh, experienced a phishing message in the last week? Received a message? Okay, so for the benefit of the recording, a good half of the hands went up there. And bearing in mind the camera's not on you, it's on me, how many of you have responded to a phishing message being unaware that it was a phishing message in the past at all? Okay, nobody. That's good. You're all security aware. Unfortunately, you are 
not the typical pattern of the whole population, as we shall see. So, um, in terms of an outline for the talk, just making sure this is working, beginning with a bit of an overview of what this, this threat actually is, just to evidence the fact it does exist to some degree, the scope and scale of the problem, and the fact that unfortunately, as time has gone on, it has not got less, it has actually got worse, and then looking at some findings from a recent, small-scale, but interesting nonetheless, experimental study that colleagues and I did at the University of Plymouth, looking particularly at the ability of some of our technology to detect phishing messages to avoid us having to be able to spot them out for ourselves. Reflecting on the results of that, and then some conclusions. Okay, so, you're all aware of this phishing problem, and, you know, with good reason, because it's been with us now for over 15 years. Around 2003, I think, was when you started to see the first real emergence of phishing as a threat and starting to get reported in surveys and media reports, etc. But nonetheless, it's still something, as your show of hands just now illustrated, that we face on a regular basis. The volume of the messages is getting worse, and the guises in which they're appearing is getting more creative. So, not gone are the days of the, the messages looking like something that says, please verify your bank account details. We still get plenty of those, but we also get many other forms as well. I have some that I'll illustrate as we go. Now, of course, as a result of this, we've got various technologies that are there to try and help us. We've got things that are on the, in the network looking to block the messages. We've got filtering but we still get them. Again, your show of hands shows. We're still receiving this stuff on our devices, on the desktop, etc. So we need a level of awareness as users to be able to spot things. But many users, of course, would much prefer to rely on the technology. So there's a question of how much can we do that? How much can the technology protect us, flag things up for us, even if it's not blocking them completely at source? And if we look at some of the evidence around to show this, this scale, one of the, the sources I've drawn here, the UK Cyber Security Breaches Survey from this year, the results are very much the same as the, the last couple of years, showing that fraudulent emails are amongst the most commonly encountered problems amongst the respondent organisation. So we're talking here about a population of around, let's say, 1,500 UK businesses, part of the respondent group, and 80% of them reported, as the category was called, fraudulent emails or being directed to fraudulent websites. Okay, vastly ahead of some of the other forms of problem that they are encountering. So things like malware and ransomware, still a problem, but not to the scale of this. Not to say that the impact of the problems is all the same, but certainly that the likelihood of encountering this is significantly greater. Moreover, talking about the impact... Almost half of them cited phishing as causing the most disruption to their organisation in the prior 12 months. So it is something that's impactful and causing issues. And also, the second most commonly reported form of attack there mentioned uh, others impersonating the organisation in emails or online. Well, we can see that that has a potential relationship to the phishing problem as well, potentially being impersonated in that context. But they're not being the recipient, being, being the one masqueraded as. So, okay, I've said that this problem is growing. I've shown that it's significantly encountered in organisations. Let's see how the problem has evolved over the years in terms of scale. So these results are from the Anti-Phishing Working Group, which has existed for a number of years now, receiving reports and creating intelligence around the phishing problem. And what we can see here in the rather fetching orangey-yellow shade is the number of unique phishing sites being reported in the different sampled years. So I've taken some snapshots of years through the, the, the time period. So 2004, once fishing had been around for a little while, it was starting to get some attention. 2008, 2013 were on the way, and then the full extent of last year. And then we can see also the number of unique phishing emails being reported. This isn't the number of emails full stop that people have received. This is the unique reports of different messages, different phishing campaigns going around. And the most striking thing, I think, is the degree to which this problem has increased over time. So whilst awareness of the problem has grown, whilst the technologies, the safeguards, perhaps the awareness raising in organisations and for, for general users, 
has arguably increased, the problem hasn't gone away. We've got more of a problem to need that protection against. Now, of course, all types of fishing are not the same, so just to give some of the, the different categories that you might encounter, what I call bulk fishing or generic fishing, it's the sort that I mentioned before, the please verify your bank account details type of thing that you might encounter, you very often sort of pick that out as being fishing because you know you don't bank with the bank that it's masquerading as, and you know you can immediately ignore it. If it did happen to come in, sort of happening to coincide with a bank you're banking with, then perhaps it gives you more pause for thought. But these are generally just messages that are sent out indiscriminately, and they happen to find potential targets. Spearfishing, we're talking about something that is more targeted now, where the attacker, the scammer, has done some form of reconnaissance, information gathering, and they're targeting it at a particular organization, for example, and the staff within it. Clone fishing, where you're taking a message that's already been sent and resending it, perhaps with a different attachment, different links, perhaps claiming it's a resend of the previous message, but perhaps more likely to catch people out because they've seen the original, they th thought it was legitimate then, and now this time they're more inclined to believe it, even though now it's a scam. And then whaling, and even another more targeted one, going after high value or high prominence individuals within an organisation. So different types that we may encounter. Now what I'll look at in the study uh, as we go through it is basically examples of bulk phishing. So the ability of some of the technology to detect that. Okay, and also another term that's getting increasing uh, prominence as a, as a name and also as an abbreviation of BEC is business email compromise. Basically, where an attacker is using phishing, an attacker is impersonating a senior executive or similar in an organization, sending a message to somebody else, a more general employee, um, or a vendor, another a partner of the organization, and trying to dupe them into doing something that compromises the organization commercially, financially, etc. And this was the most significant uh, form of, of problem reported in uh, the US's Internet Crime Complaint Center survey in the last year. You see uh, that one there, sort of the combination of losses from uh, business email compromise and, and specifically phishing, dwarfing many of the other categories of abuse again. Okay, so talking about the problem, let's look at just some examples of the, well, actual scam and phishing emails that I've received in my inbox or spam folder just recently. So here's one that found its way through to the inbox without any form of uh, flagging as being potentially spam or malicious. And this one trying to encourage me to follow some links to an alleged Dropbox for Business link. Now this is not necessarily phishing, but this is some sort of scam email probably trying to lead me towards malware. Still coming in via um, email, so still a vector we need to be concerned about. This one now impersonating, actually targeting to people within my institution in the name of our vice chancellor, so trying to catch people, um, tricking them into opening a message because they believe it's from the boss, so to speak, and opening the attachment. Again, not necessarily phishing in this context, very likely to lead to some sort of malware compromising their system, could end up with the same sort of end result as phishing because the system could be breached. This one is a phishing-related example. This one arrived just yesterday. Um, this one claiming to be from our IT service desk. And I'm running out of email space, folks, so I need to click the link and log in, which will require my password, um, to get more capacity. Do you think I did it? I did. No, I didn't. Um, luckily, I was aware enough in that case to think that this might not be genuine. So I didn't follow the link. I, I do wonder if other people within the organization might have believed that they were running out. And then this one. This one, which basically is no, don't worry. This isn't phishing because it's not asking you to send financial details. So it's not one of those messages. It's just asking for your name, your date of birth, your age, your, all your contact details. So it's not phishing. It's just asking for that information. Not sure what they're going to do with it afterwards. But again, dressed up in a slightly different context. Okay, so it's not really clear if we look you know, for findings and results. What proportion of people do fall for phishing? None of you said you did, so that's good. So maybe it's 0% more generally. 
Probably not. Um, certainly when organizations put it to the test and do mock phishing scams and things of this nature, mock phishing testing, to see if their employees are susceptible, they come back with considerable positive, well, negative, I guess, in that context, results because people are falling for it. So, for example, in the U.S. Postal Service, where they'd done some training of their, their employees, I think, prior to this, they sent an email message round, um, over 3,000 employees, and, well, the significant proportion of employees failed to report receiving the message, which actually the company's policy that they'd been allegedly trained about suggested they should be doing, and a quarter of them attempted to follow the link that they'd been sent which could, of course, have, have put them and their systems into significant danger, depending on what that link was leading to, or indeed what it was asking them to then divulge. Another result that sort of shows a, another less encouraging picture, um, the average success rate, according to this study from uh, Bernstein et al. back in 2014, um, University of California and Google collaborating on this one, they found that the average success rate of phishing messages that they'd used there was over 13%, almost 14% success rate, depending on the, the nature of the message and the hook that was being used. So a significant potential for people to fall victim, depending on how it's been presented and dressed up. And also, variation according to the type of recipient, the type of user that receives it or indeed is targeted. So at the bottom there, we see, okay, according to this study from Positive Technologies, only 3% of IT security people were falling victim to phishing. Sort of vaguely encouraging, because you'd expect them to be the most aware. But almost a third of general employees finding themselves susceptible. So what that points towards, perhaps, is some need to bridge the gap between what security people know because it's their job, and what general users ought to know just in the sense of some sort of cyber awareness, that, that streetwiseness of being online, which many people seem to lack, even though they regularly use online technologies. So an issue around awareness raising and user education coming out perhaps there. Okay, now linking to that is the, the, the thing here, this experimental study that we did. Looking really to say, okay, if you don't do any awareness raising and you rely on the technology to protect people, as many people will be relying on it themselves, to what extent is that technology going to do the job? So this is just a, a little investigation using some webmail services as examples to see the extent to which they would spot and identify and flag potentially phishing messages that would be the basic text of phishing messages being replayed to them to see if they would alert the user if they would filter the messages out etc okay we were looking particularly would they be able to warn based on the message content so we weren't looking for things being stopped by blacklists etc it was the content of the message something that would enable it to be flagged out so if somebody was creating a phishing message from scratch with a certain type of language, or indeed replaying known scams, would they be spotted? So five email service providers, which I've anonymized here, just calling them S1 through to S5. So S1, S2, and S3, they were all large international webmail services. Um, and we selected those on the basis that they're in wide use by a significant proportion of the public population. Meanwhile, S4 and S5 were selected because they market themselves particularly as being sort of security-aware mail services and uh, therefore might be inspiring more trust amongst the potential user community. And in that context, if you're told that the mailing solution is more secure, you might expect more protection against mail-related problems. So... In order to, uh, to do a, a realistic test, what we decided to do here was take some messages that had already been identified as phishing from archives and replay those to the mail services from new accounts. And basically, these were taken from archives that have been, or repositories that have been established by universities. So the flavor of some of the messages had a sort of targeting students or campus-based people, but others were far more general messages as well. Um, but it's not, it must be acknowledged, representative of the wider population of phishing messages, whereas it says there, payment or financially related messages account for more than half of those, for example, that the anti-phishing working group would catalogue. 
So what we were looking at in terms of the messages and what we, want, we wanted them to have as characteristics were particular phrasing, links, and things of that nature that would be potentially characteristic of spottable phishing messages, identifiable phishing messages from the user's perspective. The sort of things that when I show you some examples, you will probably get a sense that they don't look like normal, legitimate messages. Here were the message titles. I won't show you the, the full content of all 20 messages, because that would be a bit dull. Um, but I'll show you some examples. But here were the full titles of the 20 that we used. And basically, we sent all of the messages, firstly, without any embedded links, and then again with the links that would have actually existed in the genuine attempt, just to see if there was any difference in the ability of the webmail services to pick them out, highlight them, label them, etc. So that gave us a total of 200 messaging attempts actually taking place. So, here's one of the examples, the don't get locked out of your account one. So, I've, um, the, this isn't with the link showing there, but there would be a click here, and that would be hyperlinked for somebody to view the document. Hands up if that looks like a sort of convincing message you would click the link for. I guess the clue is in the fact I'm telling you it's a phishing message, so you're all keeping your hands resolutely down. But hopefully, you would have spotted this one if it came to you. What we hope is that the message service, the email, uh, webmail client, would also be telling you this is spam. We'll see that in a minute. This one, a help desk notice with some special characters not displaying properly. We detect an unknown IP address, blah, blah, blah. Click here and verify your account. So your opportunity to provide your login details to whoever is asking for it. And a third example, if it works. We're upgrading our email system. How unusual. Um, please confirm your email is in use. Log in to confirm. Webmail team. As, as most people sign off like that. So again, I think looking at these, you can see, okay, these, these don't look particularly legitimate, and we would hope that users would be aware enough not to spot them. Would the webmail services be able to flag these as potentially problematic as well? Well, the answer, in many cases, is no. So in red there, we have the indication of the proportion of messages that found their way into the user's <coughs> inbox. Okay? In the, the green, we've got those where the messages were directed to spam folders, and we've got one instance where the message didn't arrive at all, so it was hopefully filtered out, blocked somewhere else within the process. So what we see is, other than with Webmail Service 2, the vast majority of messages were finding their way into the user's inbox. Okay, um, And we've got there, in each of the cases, we've got what happened when we had no links in the message and what happened when we reinstated the hyperlinks, whether that, as you can see in some cases, it enabled a proportion of the messages to then be identified as spam. So with links, obviously that's where you've got the link to follow, um, that's more likely to be picked out, but still not uniform success. What we also looked at was, were the messages labelled in some way? So, for example, if it did come into the inbox, was it highlighted as potentially suspicious, malicious, etc.? So the sort of thing I'm talking about is the indication that I've taken there. Now, I've taken that one from a normal desktop mail client so that it's not conveying any clue as to the five webmail services we were actually using. Of the five, only two of them did any form of message labelling anyway, S1 and S2. And what you can see there is, okay, of those that arrived in the inbox, um, in the case of S1, the vast majority, again, were arriving with no labelling at all. Um, in a couple of cases, when you had, well, the no links or with links, they were being flagged as potentially malicious, but most cases they were not flagged at all. In the case of where messages went to spam, we can see, okay, um, service two was very successful. Actually, it put them in the spam folder, and it was labeling them as spam as well, or flagging they were potentially spam, so you could see it when you opened the message. And a couple of them being suspected of being malicious, and nothing in that context um, being unlabeled, because they've gone to the spam folder. But what that gives us overall, though, is the significant majority of cases, as we saw, 
actually made it through to the user's inbox rather than being redirected to junk, to spam, whatever it's called. And they weren't in any way labeled to attract, to identify them as malicious or junk mail or anything. And across the, the both phases of testing, the with links and without links, only 6% of the messages overall were explicitly labeled as this could be phishing, this could be a malicious message. Um, labeling of spam was notably higher, almost 20% overall, but that was largely down to the success of webmail service number two. Now, it's interesting, that variation across the services, because they're all dealing with the same messages. All of those messages are known phishing messages, but only one of the five webmail services actually dealt with them, what I would say, competently. The other four, quite variable, and in some cases, quite poor. So, okay, there are some limitations in this study. We'll do some further stuff based on these initial findings. So, the overall size of the study was admittedly small, so both the number of messages involved, the variety of messages, and the webmail services under test. Um, and I say also what we were testing. So, we didn't look, for example, at whether attachments in messages made any difference. In actual fact, though, in many of the phishing cases, you're not dealing with attachments, so... What we're interested in is whether the messages with links were, were being flagged as a problem. And nonetheless, I say it's a realistic test of whether some representative, genuinely used, popular webmail services were able to spot known phishing messages and warn their users accordingly. And I say involving genuine content that already featured in known attacks. And we also, just to make sure we were getting some level of consistency, made up a couple of messages with phishing style wording to see if they also were treated in a similar way. So is it fair? Is this a reasonable test of the sites? Um, well, okay, should they be able to do it on the basis of message content rather than looking at where the messages are coming from, um, looking at blacklists, etc.? Well, overall, we would say yes, and actually our results support the fact that it's reasonable to do it because some of the webmail services, S2 in particular, Service 2, was able to do it. And so that's in stark contrast to services three and five, which allowed everything through into the inbox without any marking for attention. So in conclusion then, what does that tell us about the technology and whether we as users can rely upon it to provide the safety net for us? Well, it can provide some form of safety net in some cases, but that net has certainly got holes in it. It doesn't remove, at this stage, the responsibility of the user and the need for the user to have some form of awareness. Certainly the variation in the results that we, sh we observed, that gives an indication that services could improve. Some of those that are currently there could do as well as others that are there. Okay, if one can do it, they could all potentially do it. They need to improve the underlying technology. There are areas that you could advance or you could utilize in order to do this sort of content-based identification. Artificial intelligence, machine learning, they're thrown around quite readily in cybersecurity. This is an opportunity to learn what the phishing message, the language of the message looks like using stylometry, etc. And what it also highlights is at this stage, we still need to do that bit of user awareness raising. We need to help people understand what scam messages look like, the sort of things that they shouldn't be sharing and the mechanisms by which they shouldn't be sharing it. Okay? Otherwise, they are going to be significantly vulnerable. So it tells ultimately the same sort of story as was already mentioned in Socrates' talk there, that it's not a choice between technology and policy and people. It's the effective combination of the two. Now, if you want further information on this, it's very shortly to appear written up as a, as a paper in Computer Fraud and Security with my colleagues Kieran and Maria in that particular case. Um, and that's the details, so just look out for that one if you want the full details of how we did it. And other than that, my contact details are there if you want to get hold of me, ask questions outside of the context of the conference. And thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much. That was, uh, that was really quite enlightening. I think um, everybody has a problem with fishing. I know that uh, I certainly do. We now have uh, a very um, uh, interesting uh, member of uh, uh, the MSP, Kate Forbes, 
who is going to talk to us about uh, cyber resilience strategy, safe, secure and prosperous Scotland. So please uh, give a round of applause to uh, Kate Fogg and speak. Thank you. Okay. This is probably the best way to deal with politicians, isn't it? Turn the mics off. Can you hear me now? Yeah. yeah, until it goes on. Okay. Well, it's fantastic to be here with you this morning at the fifth international conference on big data in cyber security. Oh, there we go. In cyber. Sorry, you missed the welcome if you couldn't hear me at the back. But it's great to be here with you this morning. And as was mentioned, I am the Scottish <coughs> Government Minister for Digital. Uh, and I certainly think it's one of the most exciting roles there are um, just now. And what this event highlights is the importance of joint collaboration right across every part of civic society and of government when it comes to a, positioning ourselves to make the most of the digital revolution, for want of a better phrase, but secondly, recognising that for all the opportunities, they are only as good as our cyber security. And when it comes to my role, I see there is a role for government in ensuring that whether it's businesses uh, that work currently in the tech sector and that would identify as digital businesses, or whether it's businesses that frankly don't identify themselves as being a tech business, but are increasingly having to digitize, or whether it's the public sector that's making increasing use of data, that right across sectors, there is a responsibility to recognize what the opportunities are, but secondly, to make sure that we embed cybersecurity in all that we do. And that's why it's so great to see so many of you from both um, the, the Scottish cyber community, as it were, and the international cyber community in the room today. And it does highlight the strengths of our universities and innovation centres in this area as well. And that's, of course, particularly the case for Data Lab and for Edinburgh Napier University, who have partnered to organise this conference. And I'd like to take the opportunity uh, this morning to talk a little bit about that point around leadership, about the Scottish Government's wider approach just now to big data before focusing in on the cyber security aspects. Because Scotland's digital strategy sets out our plans of putting digital at the very heart of everything we do. And it reminds me of speaking at a conference in Dublin last year and introducing myself as the digital minister and talking a little bit about what I had responsibility for. And somebody in the audience stuck up their hand and asked, are you trying to become the minister for literally everything, for eating, breathing, walking, sleeping, and all the above? And that does go to the heart of our digital strategy, which is trying to embed a digital first approach to everything that we do, including the way that we pursue inclusive economic growth, including the way that we reform our public services, and including the way that we prepare our children for the workplaces of the future. And that requires innovation. And government can either be a catalyst of innovation or it can be a hurdle to innovation. But I believe that data holds the key to unlocking that innovation. And we're already fortunate in Scotland to hold world-class data about our people, about our organizations, and about our geography. We have the largest concentration of internationally significant and world-leading informatics research in the UK. And we've got a growing business sector that's driving the adoption of data science and analytics. But it's only when we bring those elements together that they offer that potential to stimulate new ideas, to grow our economy, and to solve some of the, the biggest social challenges that face public policy. We also know that when it comes to unlocking that potential, data-driven innovation can generate £20 billion of business benefits to the Scottish economy 
over the period to 2020 and deliver potential savings as well to the public sector. And that's why it makes sense for me to have a joint role, both as Minister for Public Finance and as the Digital Minister. And digital is not just about saving money, it is about the innovation and about solving some of the biggest public policy challenges. And that understanding of the, the joint uh, approach lies at the heart of Scotland's open data strategy, which sets out our ambition for making data open and available for others to use and to reuse. It's why we have invested and will continue to invest in our skills base, in research and in technology. And it's a key ambition that you see in, for example, the city deals, the £1.3 billion Edinburgh and South East city deal is to make Edinburgh city region the data capital of Europe. And that's not just about the rhetoric, it's not just about positioning ourselves reputationally as caring about data. It's also got the tangible steps and strategies to make that happen. And we've provided funding to the Edinburgh-based Innovation Centre Data Lab to boost and to support data innovation right across the country. And last year, an innovative big data project led in partnership, and partnership is key in all of this, by University of Glasgow, JP Morgan, Skyscanner, and a number of others won three million pounds of funding in order to make that partnership happen. And that project will aim to develop new approaches for big data science through business and academic collaboration. So we're already seeing the benefits of such work in areas of public services, which could be as diverse as promoting energy efficiency in Scotland's housing stock, or increasing the number of people within our further and higher education system, and predicting future demand for social care. Because I see both the innovative tech solutions that are really exciting, as well as the human element of actually transforming lives changing the way we do things and improving outcomes for the people that will either benefit or not benefit from uh, the growth in the economy and from uh, public services. So in all of that, where does cyber security fit into the picture for us in government? And since I was appointed as the first digital minister last June, so I'm always coming up to the point where I can no longer say I don't know what I'm doing because I've been there a year, but in that past year, my first priority has, to, has been to get out and actually speak to businesses. And my discussions with business leaders and with academics since I took up that post have really helped understand how the evolution of cybersecurity is totally intertwined with the rise of big data. And you cannot have any of that progress without strong cyber security policies and implementation. But understanding how they relate can help organizations better determine what capabilities they need to develop or acquire in order to take full advantage of the data they have and at the same time keep that data safe. And da big data is one of those unique, interesting areas that is better enabled by addressing cyber threats from the outset, which can also enable the detection of cyber security threats and generate solutions that help us to address those cyber security challenges. And I'd like to talk briefly about both of those areas. And again, as a politician, I've got this interesting bridge between those that are making the progress, doing the innovation when it comes to, to data and cyber security as well as bridging it to the businesses and the companies and the organizations, the length and breadth of this country that may not profess to understand these things, but certainly need our help to implement and ensure that they have strategies in place to manage their data safely and securely. Because for all that we talk about the new opportunities of innovation and big data, there are of course, numerous threats and I realize I'm speaking to a room full of people that understand intrinsically what those are. That cyber threat is significant and it's growing, it does not stand still. 
And where data is of the type that cannot be made freely available because of sensitivities, big data sets can be particularly attractive targets for criminals and hostile states. And it's against that background that the Scottish Government views cyber resilience as a fundamental enabler of our digital ambitions, including in the area of big data. And those potential benefits will only be realised, as I keep saying, if people trust us to hold their data securely and to use it in appropriate ways. And we're explicit about the fact that appropriate cyber resilience must be built into publicly funded big data projects from the outset. It's not about retrofitting once you've built the project. It's about ensuring it's in there from the beginning. And achieving that requires the development of a genuine culture. And culture is key. It's not just about strategies or a tick box exercise. It is about culture, the development of a genuine culture of cyber resilience in Scotland. It has to be viewed as an innate part of everything we do in the digital world, not some separate bolt on that can be considered later in the process or as is far too common once something has already gone wrong. And our work with partners to help develop that culture of cyber resilience is underpinned by our cyber resilience strategy and a suite of action plans. And together those set out the actions that we want to take to become a world leading nation in cyber resilience. They start with the cyber resilience learning and skills action plan which sets out that blueprint for government and for partners to work together to strengthen and embed that understanding of cyber resilience right across our education and lifelong learning systems and to develop a strong talent or a pipeline of individuals who are technically skilled in cyber security one of the aspects of my job that I most enjoy and take most seriously is going into schools. And I think last time I was in this building, I was speaking to um, a room full of high school children about cyber security. And I must confess that some of them looked like they didn't really want to be there. And so I asked them the question, just to try and engage, how many of them had that morning alone, it was only about 9 a.m., had checked Snapchat five times, hands went up. I said, keep your hand up if you've checked Snapchat more than 10 times, 15 times, 20 times. I was probably nearing 100 and there were still five girls with their hands up. And bridging from what they enjoy doing, what they feel safe and comfortable doing right now, to the recognition that that is only the case because of the importance of cyber security opens their minds, opens their eyes to the critical importance of how they protect themselves, how they protect their data online, how they understand data. And then what we want to do is push them into cybersecurity professional roles um, because we recognize the need there. But we know that not just in Scotland, it's not a Scottish problem, it's an international problem. We know that when it comes to cybersecurity uh, skills uh, and the data science sector, that we are all struggling globally with a skills gap. And Scottish universities have initiated various data science related programs to meet that critical shortage of data skills in Scotland. But it's gonna have to start at the youngest of ages to help them understand the future uh, roles and, and professions uh, and to give them a, a, that, that love that ensures that they then go into those roles, understanding that within their lifetimes and even within their educational lifetimes, those skills that are required are going to change again and again. But as talent increasingly flows through the system, it's vital that those disciplines are enabled <coughs> to talk to each other and that our data scientists are equipped with a sound understanding of the importance of cybersecurity to their work on big data. So that was the first action plan. I'll combine the next three to save time, but our public, private, and third sector action plans are helping to build a fundamental 
understanding of cyber resilience across the whole of our economy and our society. And that's vitally important to ensure that businesses, public sector organisations and charities all take up more of the economic and the societal opportunities afforded by big data and do so in a way that's secure. And finally, the Economic Opportunity Action Plan recognises that every government around the world, every economy around the world, is grappling with these issues. And if we get it right here, if we ensure we've got that talent pipeline, if we're creating and inventing the innovative solutions right here, then we have a huge economic opportunity when it comes to positioning Scotland at the forefront of these issues. Just before I, I close, having set out that context, I wanted to touch on the second aspect of the way in which big data and cybersecurity intertwine. <coughs> and that's the potential for big data to be an enabler of innovation in cybersecurity. And that really flows from my last action plan around the economic opportunities, not just in Scotland, but internationally. Because one of the big challenges that we face in ensuring fundamental cybersecurity is the sheer range and number of attacks that hit our networks every day, far more than any human being could sift through to identify the really dangerous ones. And that volume is only going to increase and go, not least, grow, not least with uh, the Internet of Things growing too. And ensuring fundamental cyber security would be difficult enough if our organisations had an army of skilled professionals to monitor network traffic and go hunting for advanced threats. But of course, the skills gap means that currently we struggle to recruit enough skilled people to do even the basic things that are needed to protect our systems. And that's where the potential role of big data in cyber security offers such exciting opportunities and the development of, of big data analytics tools that have the capability to integrate and to process network monitoring data in real time and either adjust defences automatically or help human beings to discern the signal from the noise, allowing them to do the absolutely key things that are needed to ensure the security of networks and systems will be, could be, is going to be transformational. And so events like this, where we bring together two mutually interdependent disciplines are so vital to each other's growth and vitality. And this is a, such an important conference in that regard. And, and your approach mirrors the approach that the government is taking, not to have various and different strategies in silos, but to recognise that they are actually all interdependent. For big data to be transformational, human elements have got to remain very important. And all of this has got to grow in an inclusive way. And I'm not just saying that because I was on Good Morning Scotland this morning being taken to task on the fact that the Scottish Government isn't doing enough in inclusive growth. But it's true that with every revolution, with every potential opportunity, we can either take advantage of that in an inclusive way or an exclusive way. And inclusion is morally the right thing to do at a time where inequality is rising, but it's also the most pragmatic thing to do as well. The diverse cyber threats have got to be tackled with a diverse approach. And as well, techno, technical innovation, we also need more people in cybersecurity jobs. We need more women in cybersecurity jobs. Um, and I want to make sure that we are targeting people with the aptitude who may never have thought of a career in cybersecurity and giving them pathways to come in and to ensure that they are part of the solution. So in conclusion, as I, I do draw to a close, the opportunities in big data are phenomenally exciting, but they're just rhetoric if we don't get cyber security right. And the opportunities in cyber security are really exciting, but they're gonna be even more transformational if we ensure that we build those using big data. They're completely interdependent. 
And our role from a government point of view is to try and act as a catalyst of innovation. Last week I had the Danish ambassador visiting, and we've had Estonians visiting as well. And in those two countries, you see the way in which the public sector has not hindered innovation. It's acted as that catalyst. We want to be that catalyst. We've got a clear vision of where we want Scotland to get to, but we recognise that it's rhetoric unless the building blocks are in place, which we are putting in place through our action plans. We can use Scotland's data to its full potential by driving innovation, by improving public services, and by unlocking economic value, including in the field of cybersecurity. And never losing sight that in so doing, we save time, we save money, and in many cases, we also save lives. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Um, what a fantastic talk. Uh, I think it's without question that Kate is one of the most engaging MSPs uh, that we have currently. And um, really, thank you very, very much for, for your attention today. That was, that was fantastic. We do find ourselves um, with a few minutes for questions um, before our break at 11 o'clock. So I'd like to throw the, uh, the floor open to our three presenters, including Kate. Um, if you have any questions for any of them uh, that you would like to ask. Yep, okay, so we have, um, we, we have a, a new uh, audio visual system and uh, I will make full advantage of this. So if, uh, hello, it's hello. a speaker, you just speak into the top of it. And, um, I'm not sure I need that really, but... Um, no, no, actually you don't. Right, this is a question for Kate. Sorry, does this have a microphone inside? Yes, it's a microphone. Wow, That's this right. is really high tech, I've got to say. Okay, so a question for Kate, um, and it's in relation to your work and perhaps our work in general with young people in schools. And um, as an ex-teacher myself, I know that stories and storylines are the things which really engage young people. So um, what, what advice do you have for us as cyber professionals yeah. to engage young people with those storylines? How can we do this right for the next generation? That's such a great question. And I'd answer it, I think, in, in several ways. The first is working amongst yourselves as professionals and with government to make sure that we are covering every school and every young person in Scotland. What I often see is a postcode lottery approach where, let's take, for example, a few schools in Edinburgh have you know, lots of tech businesses going in uh, and doing exciting things with them. And there are some schools, particularly up where I am, uh, in the Highlands, that won't get any visits. So first of all, making sure that we are reaching everybody and nobody's getting left behind. Secondly, for me, it's connecting them from being uh, consumers of technology to inventors, creators, etc., and understanding that cybersecurity is part of that. So my little story about the three girls that still have their hands up, or five girls that still have their hands up, who check Snapchat. Do they understand? They do understand, actually. They understand what it means to be hacked. They understand what it means for their data to be uh, leaked, and they don't want that. And if we've got to take them on a journey from saying, you don't want that, you understand technology, this is how we ensure that we keep you safe, I think is the second point. Um, and, and that's the narrative around, you know, you understand technology, now this is a critically important part of, of the technology that you enjoy. The third thing is that if you go in and speak to a school, great. You'll go in for a morning, they'll be really inspired, and then they'll probably forget about you next week. If you inspire their teachers, then those teachers will keep inspiring the kids long after you've gone. And when you go in again next year, they'll remember. And I recently was, was at a school assembly where uh, it was Google had gone in to do some, some stuff on, with Parent Zone on being safe online. The kids were brilliant. Primary ones who were all able to tell, identify uh, uh, you know, where, where there was risks or potential threats, whatever. And then afterwards, as the kids were all filing out, the teachers turned to me and said, I didn't know any of that. And that's the problem. The problem is actually that even 
teachers that came out of the out of university in the last few years, in that space of time, things have changed considerably. And it's about how we support our teachers to support the young people. And I think that the narrative, as you said it, is crystal clear. The narrative I've shared around, you're all consumers, how do you make sure you're safe? Oh, and by the way, why don't you want to make other people safe as well? And, and that kind of narrative. It's actually quite a simple narrative, uh, but it's about reaching everybody. It's about making it clear to kids, but secondly, it's about inspiring their teachers. Does that answer your question? It does, yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, just to pick up on a few points that Kate, Kate made, um, one of the reasons why we uh, started the Cyber Academy is to try and bridge that gap, to train the trainers. Not, not everybody is born with this information. And if you find yourself um, in need of some education around this, the Cyber Academy and its partners uh, will provide that information for you. Okay, so this is why we're here. Speak to Basil or myself or Bill, he's at the back. Uh, if there is any particular training that your organizations need, be it commercial uh, or education or, or, or industrial, one of the things that we are doing, and, and Basil alluded to this uh, uh, earlier, is provide additional training on a, ver a variety of topics and also technologies. So if you find yourself uh, in need of some uh, education around this, you're a teacher in education, uh, and you, you, uh, you find yourself in the position where the children know more than you do, then speak to us and we can try and address that balance. That's what we're here for. This is what we do. We're educators. Do we have any other questions for, for any of our three guests, three speakers? Oh, I suppose the rest too are. <laughs> 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 I'm, I'm afraid in the interest of uh, maintaining the anonymity of all of them, I'm not going to share. <laughs> <laughs> Question at the back. Do you want to throw the, throw the mic all the way, just, just throw it on your shoulder? <laughs> Thank you. Um, it, was, it was on the back of the fishing, so uh, for, for Stephen, I appreciate you want to uh, keep your uh, uh, various uh, providers anonymous, but I'm wondering if you can uh, tell us at all uh, whether there's any difference between the ent enterprise offerings that these organisations may have had versus uh, perhaps uh, services tailored for individuals, um, knowing that quite a few of these service providers operate in both spaces. Okay, so the, the ones that we tested were the ones targeting end users. We haven't looked specifically at the enterprise offering. So again, as part of an extension of the work, that would be an interesting direction to go. I say what we're particularly interested in in this context was the extent to which the general user is protected by the services that the general user would have access to and would make a, a usage decision around. Thank you. We've got, uh, we've got a few questions at the back. Uh, if you want to throw it towards the corner uh, at the back. Excellent. <laughs> it's getting some good use today. Hi. It's a uh, question for Kate again. Um, working in the public sector myself, I'm, I'm very conscious of the fact that we're very strict with our, we're struggling with our funding. So how do we kind of square the circle where we get funding to put into something such as security and digital security, um, which is not very tangible and um, in comparison to um, the, you know, obviously our more front facing public sector kind of work. And the other element is how do we keep our independence and our ethos of working for the public when we're engaging with larger, more, um, uh, well, private sector companies, so that we're keeping our independence and ensuring that any of the benefits that we receive as a result of their input into our, the work that we're doing um, is actually received by the general public, the children, the you know um, society, and enhancing our society in, in Scotland as a whole, rather than benefiting the industries. Yeah, it's a, another good question. So I'll take them both in turn. On the first one, I would suggest that at the moment, um, and it's a point I made uh, earlier, that if we are tagging on cybersecurity solutions to systems that we are currently creating, then that's a problem. And actually, we need to be approaching 
all the sort of mass digitization that's going on right now in the public sector from a position of embedding cyber security from the outset rather than tagging it on as a solution. And that does get away slightly from your problem of seeing them. They should not be two separate budgets. It shouldn't be pitching for additional funding for the cyber security element. Having said that, I recognize that there are legacy systems. Uh, and, and that's why our, when it comes to um, our, our suite of action plans, we have, for example, and this is not relevant to the public sector, but you know, voucher schemes for SMEs to be able to uh, retrofit, or as, as it were, or to understand um, the essentials, and the same goes for uh, the charitable sector. I think the biggest challenge uh, in your question is a question of leadership. Because if you're making the pitch to a leader in your organization, if they understand that their systems are only as strong as they are secure, and they're only as good as they are secure, then it's an easy sell. Because this is not about a nice to do, this is about a core essential. Uh, would be my, my I, I get that it's hard. I get, I'm a public finance minister, I've got responsibility for budgets. It's challenging times. That these are not, is this a nice project to do or not? This should be the absolute foundation stone of everything that we're doing. To your second point, it can't get more important than taking the public with us when it comes to ensuring that their data is safe and secure and that they know it's safe and secure. And again, for me, this is a question of narrative. So I do a lot with digital participation and you get everything from, I don't want to be ageist, but a, an older granny who won't even give you her email address because she thinks that's a data breach, all the way through to somebody that will tell you everything. And I think at the moment, the narrative around data is a massive problem, the public narrative, the public discourse, because it's informed by Facebook selling ads and vote leave campaigns. And actually the understanding of data, data being a force for good, is not as well understood. It's not as well understood that regularly we use data to improve health outcomes. That's a great benefit to the public. Um, and I think that if we can take the public with us, if we can be clear about what we're using their data for, uh, I think we, we, don't, we, run, we don't run the risk so much of the public feeling like we're selling out on their data. Yeah. It's got to be done in a, a safe, within a safe framework. But that's a lot easier when the public discourse is well informed by what their data is, how it's actually being used. And often they're scared of things that they shouldn't be scared of and not scared enough of things that they should be scared of. Thank you very much. I think Bill's got a final question. Yeah, I've got a, a, a question for the professor uh, from, from Norway. Uh, so we're, we're kind of in this void just now with uh, Brexit, where we don't know where we're going. And as someone from Norway who is sitting outside the EU, you talked about your forthcoming EU project. And I wonder if you have any advice for Scottish universities <laughs> and SMEs, <laughs> not about Brexit, but how we can make sure okay. that we are a core part of uh, uh, the Horizon programme. Uh, I, I didn't really catch your first point, but we, we will take that up. Uh, it's about Brexit. Okay, yeah, okay. <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, well, Norway is, of course, outside the European Union, but it has a privileged relationship with the European Union. And uh, being myself uh, a Greek, so part of the European Union, and not in a privileged relationship with them, I think I can... Well, quite accurately and objectively assess that it is much better to be in Norway than in other situations. <laughs> <laughs> this doesn't mean that I'm a proponent of Brexit. Uh, quite the contrary. Okay. But there is still life, even in research and in horizon outside of the European Union. Um, you see, the, well, coming to this particular thing, yes, of course, we do take part. Uh, I mean, Norway takes part in, in horizon. Um, Norwegian universities are not very, uh, well, they are reluctant in getting involved with Horizon and European projects uh, in a more general setting. 
simply because funding from national sources is much, much easier and much less bureaucratic than every, any, European, uh, any European project. So why should we bother uh, writing all these pages to get the money, if you can get them, of course, for the proposal, and then all these deliverables that you need to submit for the project? when you can get the same amount of money by writing only 10 page proposal and having no deliverables at all apart from your scientific publications, yours and your students. But of course, there is a question of money involved. So Norway pays its share into the framework project and therefore it's uh, quite uh, natural that they would like to get their money back. And uh, this is why in several uh, universities, uh, Norwegian university strategies, there is a very specific goal of attracting uh, Horizon projects. In NTNU right now, I think we are running something like 130 projects in, in, uh, in Horizon. Five in my own uh, group uh, alone. So, uh, yeah, well, uh, there is a tendency, of course, in the past uh, couple of years to avoid uh, having British uh, entities act as uh, coordinators of, uh, of projects, uh, but not as partners. And we will, of course, be happy to continue working with you in whatever way you eventually decide to, <laughs> to, to create a relationship with the rest of the European Union and with the EFTA countries. <laughs> Is that, uh, did I answer Thank the you. question, Thank at you. least partially? Okay. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Please give a round of applause to our three speakers. Thank you so much. Okay, um, so we now have a coffee break. Um, please bear in mind that the lectures are split now between the Riadi and the Lindsay Stewart, which is upstairs. So please do make sure that you're at the right track. If you don't have a, a sheet of paper telling you what speakers are up next, you can get one at uh, reception and uh, they will tell you. But the, uh, the speakers start at 11.30, so please make sure that you're on time. Thanks very much. Take them out all now because I need to get all the. Yes. Runs. Because you're you're going you're going to put it here, eh? You're going to put it here, so I don't have to use them. No, 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 no. Yeah, I'll, I'll put it in. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Hi. Um, so I have. It's really good. Yeah. It's really good. Yeah. Thanks very much. I'll see you around. Thank you. Bill, have you got the stick I gave you? Can we just move the camera up because you're seeing these people's laptops there? Uh, can I see? Can I see that? Yeah. Okay. That's it, yeah. It's better. I need to right. Just keep it. I thought it would be put the people there to sit, actually, but no. Okay, uh, you got the stick? Okay. If not, okay, I'll just try and start. No, it's not here. It's not that one. That's right. That's it. Okay. Right. So I'll, I'll basically start from the other. Yeah, okay. The other place is that here. So call them to find out here. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, so, uh, so I'll make sure the other one. Yeah, so it's continuing recording. Yeah, yeah. So okay. we'll get recorded now. That's fantastic. So just watch. Okay. 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 Okay.
Sorry, I'm just going to play with the lights for a second, folks.
<laughs> um, yeah, uh, Basil's got. Basil, is it eat? Can we just move on another slide? Is there a name on there for this guy? Oh yeah. That See that? Yeah. Well done. You've got the job. You've done this before, eh? <laughs> <laughs> so there's a little allegation tacked up. <laughs> Thank you. 
Actually, I know where there is a logo. Right, now I need to do Control-Z and all this, yeah?
CSI. So um, I I got a little bit. Yeah, I'm still. I mean, I, went, I read through. I read through one of the blog posts. Um, but to be honest, I was. I've got a few slides in towards the end. Yeah. Um, so to, to look for the, the research centres, because that's good stuff that when you present it, just know what you should say. Right. Yeah, so what I've done is, so I, I'm not, so originally it was all going to be all about the, the big data and what an algorithm and all that would run. But you know, after asking Harry for, for ages and then asking uh, Eric Wood as well, what just what Basically, I've got a pipeline for going after the DNA to find that. So if you've got the talking plant and the open learners to be able to put it all back, then it's a nice and sad. Oh, there's, yeah, I read something, there's something about that. Um, what was it? Just, just hang on for one. And one thing I think that we're interested in having a chance to do something about that is not for that tool, but you know, um, the, the learning domain one was a bit, a bit of a project to work on that. Because we could then, you, you've, got, you, you've got to get through the two base um, to find out, because if you're looking at it, if I do the same data as you, know, it's blocked. Twenty five percent of everything else. <laughs> that's it. Yeah, that's the thing. Is that how good? Yeah, because you say yes, we've got yeah, we've got really good security, but it's blocked absolutely all the good stuff as well. It's just not good. Yeah.
So you want this lighting from the middle? No, this lighting until you're ready to start. When you start, press that one. Because okay. that's like the, the introduction light. Yeah. Ian, are you, you going to start short? Yeah, we are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, you're going to start short. I'll just wait and see what you do. Okay, I'm going to kick it on to. You're on. I'm going to kick it on to four and then suddenly you're going to put it into the next slide. Excellent. Can we keep it on that so that's good for your presentation? It's good for photography. And then when you finish, I put it back into the. the uh, Number the, one. Well, thank you. These come on by themselves, right? They should be, yeah. <coughs> Can you try? Can you speak a bit? Testing, testing, one, two, one, two. Can you turn it? Are they on? Yeah. Are they on? Look off to me. That's on. That, that, use you that one. No, that's muted. Unmute it. It should be green. Hello. 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 Oh, good. good. <laughs> that's it. I just put it. No problem. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we're about to start. Um, so we have a, a, a full afternoon of, uh, or morning, until our lunch. It's been a long day already, as you can tell. Um, first up, we have um, uh, Richard, uh, Richard Mears from Ak Akamai Technology. Uh, if you don't know who Akamai is, this will be a bit of a... Uh, an interesting session for you. They are one of the cornerstones of the internet, uh, and I say that <clears throat> with uh, with uh, all sincerity. They are a massive organisation, um, and uh, we have um, the presentation: big big attacks equals big data. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm going to go through. You got me feedback. I haven't got a pacemaker either. Okay, can you hear me? Yep, yep. yep good, okay. Um, so we're going to talk about uh, big attacks, big data. So when I saw the title of the, uh, the conference, Big Data, I thought, I'm sure we can dig up some... Uh, some information that's going to be going to be useful, um, and it was quite interesting listening to Stephen and Kate talk uh, in the earlier sessions. Um, and one of the things that, that Kate was talking about actually reminded me of a, uh, a time when a few years ago I used to do Safe and Secure Online, which was a um, a cybersecurity teaching program for um, kids year seven and. What we used to do, it was sponsored by a company called ISC Squared, who does a certificate of security uh, training. And we used to go around into schools, teaching at year seven, and spend an hour, a couple of hours with them, and talk to them about cyberbullying, talk to them about generic you know, internet hygiene, and that sort of thing. And as, you know, as, as Kate mentioned, it's very difficult at times to try and grab the attention of your average year seven students. So bear in mind this was a few years ago. Uh, to give it a bit of context, you'll realize why. Uh, what I did is said, okay, let's start off by figuring out how much you are portraying online. You know, how, 
how much do you trust about what's happening online? So I used to get them all to say, right, okay, everybody who uses Facebook, stand up. Yes, it was a few years ago. That's when kids actually thought Facebook was still cool. Um, and they all stand up. I said, fantastic. Right, everybody who's 13, please sit down. And they'd all look at me and say, oh, don't be stupid, sir. We're, we're year seven. None of us are 13. I said, fantastic. Right, so you're now all have admitted, especially to your teachers, that you've all lied to get online because you're all 12 years old, and so you all lied about your age to get online. So that's your first bit of bad stuff that you've had to do on the internet. Some were quite creative. One guy was a 48-year-old farmer from Wisconsin. So I thought for innovation, that wasn't too bad. But the idea was that they'd been trying to, you know, they'd already created these fake personas. So when you're talking about cyberbullying, when you're talking about passwords, when you're talking about everything else, it made it, it helped to resonate to the story. And then we started talking about passwords. And passwords was always quite interesting because, um, again, this was a few, a few years ago, so 2012. So people were, you know, kids in those days were virtually working on the principle of their passwords were either, bearing in mind, it's also North London, so it's either going to be Arsenal or One Direction or Harry Styles were going to be the passwords, and that was about it. And we would sort of give them advice about what to use for passwords. And that's changed a lot recently. I mean, when we were, you know, seven years ago, the advice about passwords was what you need to do is you need to change it every 30 days or every 60 days, have an exclamation mark in there, put a, a pound sign there, put a euro sign in there because, you know, the Americans wouldn't know what a euro sign is if they're trying to hack you and all that sort of stuff. All that happened was it made passwords really complicated to use, especially the password reuse and all that sort of stuff. So what was happening was that people just, ended up using their old password because, you know, if somebody said, um, change your password every 30 days, what would you do? you stick a one on the end of your existing password. That's all it was. You didn't, you didn't create any new passwords. You just used the same ones before. And as I'm now sort of, as I'm the sort of the technical expert in my, in my peer group and um, I'm beginning to be, and the sort of technical support to uh, an elderly uh, group of, of relatives, and, and technically illiterate friends, they sort of come to me and say, oh, can you just talk about my little pro problem on the laptop? Or I can't get it to talk to the printer. I can't get on the internet. I can't do this. I can't do the router. And I go around and sort of say, so um, have you changed your password since the last time I was here? Uh, you, you, no, no. Okay, so it's still, still the same one, a fluffy one or something, whatever it's going to be. Um, and I said, well, I, I keep saying, have you tried using a password manager? I said, oh, no, I won't use a password manager. Can't put all your eggs in one basket. That, that's a bit dangerous. Uh, yeah. um, and so I, I decided to actually sort of get my dad one of these. This is a book. You write your passwords in it. Now, years ago, we were told, don't write your passwords down, because people used to write them down, stick it on a post-it note on the screen. So I decided, I tell them, buy my book. Write your password down. Because if somebody breaks in, they're not going to be looking for a book on your bookshelf. They're going to be looking for something shiny and worth a lot of money. They're not going to be looking for books. And you're going to have a password that's going to be unique, that's going to be secure, and somebody from China or wherever is not going to be able to find it. So what I want to talk about, and lots of stuff today, is um, what we generate in data. So Akamai as a company, um, has anybody here, who's heard of Akamai here? That's a lot more than I was expecting, which is really good. So Akamai is an overlay on top of the, uh, on the internet, which essentially allows you to access all of your popular websites, watch your popular TV, all of that sort of stuff in really good fashion. So it makes a lot of the internet quicker, faster, more safe, and more secure. Um, and we do some reports every couple of months through what we call our state of the internet, uh, or we call it the SOTI, because we love an acronym. And to give you an idea of what we talk about with big data, these are some of the figures that we have. So um, we can deliver, at the moment, our traffic capacity is about 80 terabits per second. Um, we have 2,400 global points of presence, which basically works out at about a quarter of a million nodes around the planet. When you add that up, that means we see every day about 1.3 billion client devices, um, 
we see two trillion DNS requests, and that's important when you think about what we're going to be talking about later, but also in relevance to what Stephen was talking about earlier on, and 178 billion application attacks, and that's every day. So think about that in terms of having a data lake that you can go in, start manipulating, start looking at, start analyzing for trends, and start analyzing for uh, new attack vectors and zero days and things like that. So um, this is an example of what we call credential abuse. So um, has anybody heard of a website called haveibeenpwned.com? If you haven't, go to it, put your email address in and be scared, because you will be on it. Um, and one of the reasons that it's scary is the fact that just about, and anybody who's ever used LinkedIn is, is probably on it as well, um, is the password reuse. The fact that people are inherently lazy because we've had all of these problems with giving different information about usernames and passwords, people are lazy. Everybody has a username and a password, which is normally an email address and a password that's been on a website that's been compromised. People take that information and they go and try and put it onto another website. Because once they get an email address plus a password plus a website that works, that's a valuable commodity and they can resell that on to somebody else and make money out of that. And we looked at about uh, of an eight month period last year and we saw about 28 billion credential stuffing attacks. Um, now there was four spikes. Uh, there's a big one in June where we saw about a, um, you know, uh, 250 million attacks and again in July, and then two big spikes in October. Um, and we've actually tried to correlate that to the breaches that happened in the previous month to see if there was a big data breach and that related to a big credential stuffing attack. And we saw about, I think it was about 18 million um, accounts were breached in, in June, uh, sorry, in May. In, Jul in June, we saw 140 million. Again, not much in October, but we did see 925 million accounts breached just before pro in, uh, in September. Now, could you draw a correlation to the fact that you then had those two big spikes? Possibly. But in all likelihood, what it was down to was, um, was something else. So that, that, there was try, I was trying to sort of think of an analogy for this. Um, does anybody remember a song called A Town Called Malice? Yeah? 1982. And um, it went straight in at number one in the charts. Now, in those days, nothing went straight in at number one in the charts unless it was banned by the BBC. That was a surefire way to get number one. But Town Called Malice went straight to number one. And in those days, the only way you could get to number one is basically be on top of the pops or be on Radio 1. And anything else, you would never going to get there. Town Called Malice went straight in. So the first time people were hearing it was on the chart show. Um, so how come it, what, it got to number one? How come it was so popular? And it was hype. It was one of those things where people are just, there's enough... People were started talking about it. So people went out to buy it to find out what all the hype was about. So it was one of those sort of self-perpetuating stories that got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And this is what happened in a, in a, in a similar uh, attack here where there was this a retailer who was working on um, a hype model to try and promote the brand, promote awareness, do a lot of advertising. And they do a lot of branded stuff, that sort of stuff and um, do very short-lived sales at, at quite high, high value. And what you end up with is a case of inventory theft. And you've probably all come across inventory theft at some point in, in your online uh, shopping career or whatever. Um, when you try and get onto a website and you're trying to purchase something and you get click, 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 no, try again, try again, try again, try again. It's because the reason you can't get onto it and then two minutes after the release of the tickets or the, the product or whatever, they've all sold out. The reason you can't get on is because there's a whole bunch of automated machines that are going in there trying to grab all that content. And this is what happened in this one where we saw uh, the normal account was 130 million uh, human requests. In the same nine day period of this, we saw half a billion requests from bots. That was spread over 1.8 million IP addresses, 31,000 ASNs, and 95,000 user agents. So when you, I mean, when you actually look at the, the big spike, that was coming in at 11,000 transactions per second. 
So this wasn't a, somebody trying to steal content. Now, this is somebody trying to basically batter down any defenses that are being put in place, any bot management, any application firewalls, anything like that, to try and beat through what was there. And they used three different botnets to be able to do this, and there's a few details on that later on there. But a lot of organizations think, well, yeah, fighting bots is a, is a relatively simple thing to do, isn't it? We just, uh, we can just put up a capture. Because everybody likes captures, don't they? Yeah. And 60%, this is the reason why people don't put a lot of bot management solutions up there. 60% of people realize that nobody likes doing capture. If we're going to put in a bot management solution, if you're going to be able to add, understand those human requests and be able to separate them from the automated request, you've got to have something in line that's going to be seamless. You've got to have something in line that doesn't impact the user journey whatsoever. Because no uh, e-commerce website wants to put capture in there that's going to turn off any users from doing business on their website. And when you start trying to quantify it, this is quite an, an interesting survey that was done by Ponemon a couple of years ago. Um, so if we look at this sort of, you know, this is the amount of money lost to fraud per compromised account. And if you look at the, the first one, I'm looking at uh, there's five grades there. Most common one is 100 to 500 dollars. That's the value lost for per compromised account. Now let's think about how many accounts are actually compromised per attack. Similar sort of numbers. Most common one there is 101 to 500. So if you just add up the two figures from the two ones, they do 500 dollars from the first one and 500 times the second one, put out a quarter of a million dollars. Oh, and this doesn't happen once. This happens seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven times a year. So you've now got a seven-figure problem. And then when you tie in with that with the additional stuff, which is the other annualized cost, things like downtime, customer churn, because when somebody sees that the uh, account there's been fraud relating to an organization, or there's been credential theft, or there's been something else relating, there's a lot of brand image that's, that's affected. So a lot, of a lot of users may churn, go to a different bank, go to a different provider or whatever. What we then try to do is break that information down of all of those 28 billion credential abuse attacks that we saw. We then try to break them down into which particular sector they were actually fitting in. And you can see here there's uh, retail is the most, most common with uh, 10 billion attacks. But video media and uh, media and entertainment, which is this one and this one, when you add that one together, that's about 11 billion attacks. And when you understand the, the reason behind that, it, it, it's quite clear. There's, um, so a lot of videos, though, like there was an example in Australia a couple of months ago of a guy who got convicted because uh, he'd made uh, money by selling accounts that he basically done credential stuff on. So he did Netflix, uh, Hulu, and Spotify. He went to dumps of usernames and passwords, which are freely available on the internet, and he just pumped them into those three companies and said, right, okay, I've got a match. Here's one, here's a match. And then he basically put that on his website. And he'd keep on doing that with thousands, millions of millions of, millions of, of email addresses. And he made about $300,000 Australian dollars just by doing that. All he had to do was get a username and a password, match it up with Netflix or Hulu or Spotify or whatever, and then he had a holy trinity of those three things, then he could actually resell on the market. He made $300,000 on that. He was eventually found and convicted. But when people think $300,000 and all I've got to do is a bit of this, that's nice and easy. I don't have to worry about it too much. And, yeah, and YouTube is your friend. There's a gazillion ways that will show you how to do it. When you actually break it down, so what we've done here is we've sort of broken down all of the attack, uh, all of the... the Organ, the verticals into individual uh, organizations, but we obviously haven't given them, to, to, I don't know why the names. Um, so you've got things like office supplies, commerce portals, jewelry, and then apparel. Uh, the, one of the interesting factors, especially around when you go look at the inventory theft, is that there's a, a, a very interesting figure about the amount, the, the actual value of the market. So there's the value of the actual sale market, but there's a value 
for the resale market. That's somebody who's gone into a website, purchased something before you can, and then trying to resell it to you on an auction site or something like that. That resale market is worth $1 billion. So there's a huge incentive for people to go out and rent botnets or build their own bots to be able to go in and try and do this inventory grabbing. So of those 28 billion attacks that we saw in that eight-month period, we did a we looked at some of the uh, source countries. Uh, no great surprises there. I mean, surprising that maybe China's not in there, but I think this is the fact that the U.S. is number one is not much of a surprise. They tend to host most of the bots, but they also tend to be the country that is attacked the most as well. Um, and then what we did for um, FS ISAC, which is a financial services um, information security body, we went in and gave them some ideas uh, at a recent conference about what would be good to protect your particular website um, from things like credential stuffing. And um, there was a recent thing by uh, Google, which if anybody ever listens to the uh, Smashing Security podcast, I think the last one that was done on that talked about um, uh, two-factor authentication. Two-factor authentication is phenomenally successful um, in being able to, to block things like credential stuffing. It's about 90, it's seen as 90 to 100% successful, um, especially if you've, got hard, if you've got hardware tokens, it virtually eliminates it. Um, SMS only does it to about three quarters of the way. It's about 75% successful. But things like adding a third informational proof element, as long as you allow your website to, do, to allow pasting of usernames and passwords, because then you can utilize it with a password manager, putting a third informational proof is a really good tool because all credential stuff you attack normally are populated with your email address and your password. If you then ask for your surname, that's not normally in all of those breaches. So it's a data element that the attackers haven't got. So it's just a way of putting something in there that the password managers can manage, but the attackers won't have. So one of the things we did, uh, another thing we uh, looked at was um, API traffic. And um, in 2014, we were just concerned about, you, know, you saw how much traffic runs on our platform, how many nodes we've got. You know, those two trillion DNS requests, for example, and 178 billion application attacks. But we see so many websites that are traversing our, our network. And in 2014, we wanted to look at a percentage of how much traffic was actually going across the network and looked at how much was API and how much was web. And we looked out at about 47% was API traffic. So about half the traffic was API, half the traffic was web. Um, and that was the breakdown on the left-hand side between whether it was JSON or XML, whatever. 2018, 83% of traffic is API. So four out of every five requests that are sent are non-HTML, which basically means that if you're thinking about all of the technologies you're putting in place to protect your websites, that's great, but that's one-fifth of the problem. Four-fifth of the problem is on the API. What are you looking at to put in place to protect the API? All of those queries that are coming in there. And when you actually look at the, what that's coming from, so if you look at the, you know, the API, it majorly media is one of the most common examples we still see here, but the driver behind all of that API is your mobile phone. How many people actually have opened, taken their mobile phone out today and used the browser? Who's used Safari or Chrome on their phone? Very rarely. The first thing you do is you open it up and you hit an app. That was a key point about mobile phones. That's what made them so, much, so useful is you'd hit an app. Yeah, you went to look to what the weather was or what the train time was or when I came up here this morning on the plane, I went onto my BA app for the onboarding pass. I didn't go on to the website. I used my app. And that's what's driving all of this traffic. And when you start looking at the, um, the breakdown of that, you can see that 66% is non-browser. So, yeah, that's what it means. It's coming from your mobile phone. Um, it's coming from your TV. It's coming from your fridge. It's coming from your personal spy in your house or your digital assistant, whatever you want to call it. But all of these devices are generating that API traffic. So we need to be able to aware of how we're going to protect, how we're going to understand what that traffic is, because that's where the attack vectors are going to start coming in from. 
So, again, back on the theory of big data, we love a big number. So, um, this was an attack that we saw, um, and this was a, so we're going to get like 1 billion, 1.2 billion, 1.4 billion, um, to give you an idea of the number of requests that we were seeing. And actually, in that first spike, this attack, we saw 4 billion requests come in over a relatively short time span. Um, now, we have a, a two sort of teams within Akamai that look at these big attacks. We have a SOC team, these are the guys who make sure the attack's being mitigated, the customer's staying up, and everything else. And then we have a CERT team that go, ooh, that looks interesting. Let's have a play. Let's see what we can find out. Let's see what was happening here. Um, because that was such a large attack. And what was interesting with this one, it was that when they started looking at it, first of all, that they, they looked at the, where the IPs were coming from, wasn't incredibly strange, but whatever. They looked at the user agents, they looked at um, various bits and pieces. They eventually managed to figure out that it's probably coming from a Microsoft um, framework that was generating it, and most of the IPs were coming from a NAS. And when they did the, the spread, they could see that the majority of it was coming from the US. Um, but they kept looking at it and thought, well, okay, well, let's maybe look a bit more detail. Let's look at the user agents. And they went through, and the user agent never changed. It never, ever changed. Now, this attack vector attack had been going for a long time, and we've been mitigating it. So the customer was up and running. There has been no impact whatsoever to the customer. And this was really odd, because if you're launching a massive attack and just keep bang, 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 and the, and the customer's not going down, normally what would happen is they try a little bit differently. You know, maybe they change an element, change the order of the headers, or put a different user agent in, but they didn't. They kept on using the same user agent, the same user agent, the same user agent. And eventually we started looking back at the traffic. What happened the previous week? The previous week that we were seeing about 300 requests per second. Now we're sort of seeing you know, hundreds and thousands. Um, and we actually figured out what it was. was it was a warranty tool on a, 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 on a bit of software that had gone haywire. And it was continually calling up the customer and trying to post data onto it every single second. And all of these thousands and thousands of nodes they have, we're all trying to post back onto it. So it wasn't an actual attack in itself. It was just a warranty tool created by the vendor that was creating all of this additional traffic that was actually taking itself down. What we want to then try and do is, whether, these are, whether it's, it's a bot that's generating traffic to, for, from a warranty purpose, so it's actually designed to do a certain job, or you're looking at a Google, job, a Google bot which is designed to do a search engine, or it's a web scraper, or it's something that's trying to hack into your system. Um, we, it's, it's very difficult to categorize bots, and that's the difficult thing behind it. A web application attack is very simple. It's either a SQL injection attack or it's not. It's clear, you know, this guy's actually trying to nick something off you, or it's not. <coughs> With a bot, it's very difficult to say that it's this or it's this. It's not a binary decision. Because you definitely want the Google bots, but you definitely want to block the bots that are trying to steal information, that are trying to scrape content from your website. So what you need to be able to do is think, well, how am I going to deal with this, this traffic? How am I going to block it? Because if I block all the traffic, they may try a different vector. If I give them the data they want, then I'm, 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 it's, just, it's not going to help me in the long run. So do I block the traffic? Do I serve up different content to them? Do I redirect them somewhere else? Do I tarpet them? Do I slow them down? And understanding all of these different types of bots is integral into the way that you need to manage that website. And this is the why the bots are able to be so clever, because they have multiple different ideas on how they can do it. So starting off with the very, very simple down at the bottom, where you've got the IP blocking um, and... Uh, we can just have like a single IP, a couple of IPs. It's very easy then as an IT security person to go in there, oh, we'll block that IP. Put blacklisting in there for that, blacklisting for there. But what happens if they ramp it up? You saw how many IP addresses we had on the previous one, and they were talking about 10,000 IPs or 20,000 IPs. Then it gets a little bit tricky. Yeah, you're going to have IT guys burning the fingers away, trying to do all those. And then they're going to come in with things like randomized user agents, uh, session replay, JavaScript support to get around common JavaScript challenges, going up to actually recording a human behavior. So they'll actually do a session where they record a normal user acting on a website and then replay that back so it, it's able to get past things like, are you using the mouse? Or 
you know, we only clicked on that on that thing on, on the the website that says, you know, I, uh, I am I am not a robot. Yeah. So when they click on that tick box, it, that's checking to see if you're using the mouse. So when you use the the uh, recorded human behavior, it can record that tracking of the mouse over there and then replay that back. So you need to be able to have things that can detect that human behavior as well, or recorded human behavior. Um, so the last bit is, go back, actually, then I, I definitely want to have another conversation with Stephen, who was talking about uh, who was earlier from this morning, because this goes on to something that is a real drive around fishing. Um, and Fishing, I think, is, is, is really interesting in terms of the, the, the amount of, al the amount of uh, data that we have to work with. Remember, right at the beginning, we looked at that slide and we showed the amount of DNS requests we see on a daily basis of two trillion. That data gives us real insight onto the type of, of uh, malicious websites that are out there that are trying to gather data, that are trying to fish you to try and get you to go onto a website so that you will download a payload, that you'll download a keylogger, you'll download something they can use to steal information off you. So one of the, the, the um, slides that Stephen showed you had a uh, you know, click here to continue with the links on it. Most people here, I guess, would look, when they saw a dodgy looking email or something that's slightly suspicious and it has a link in it, you hover over the link just to sort of see what is the URL that's going to point to. So when you get that email from Barclays or from Ocado or whoever it may be, you look to see, okay, is that link going to anything remotely, remotely similar to Ocado or whatever? And chances are, it's going to be saying it's going to go to some random domain that looks completely weird. It makes no sense. It doesn't look like any language whatsoever. It's going to be a random bunch of letters, and they're generated by what's called DGA, which is a, what we call here uh, domain generation algorithms. And the the attackers are generating hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these domains on a daily basis. And this is linked between the the payload and the actual servers. So they're generating these up, and those random domains are being used to basically create a myriad of different... So you can't go in and just put that into your firewall, saying, actually, no, don't go to that one. That's a bad URL, or that's a bad domain. Don't use that one. Because they're creating them every day. These domains may last two or three days, and that's it. I'll get rid of them. But what they're doing is you need to figure out then, well, how are we going to do that? Because they're using this combination of a date plus a C plus a lexicon, and then pumping that up and creating these, we need to be able to track how those domains are generated and being able to start linking them together. And we can do that through things like um, lexico I can never say this properly, lexicographical order algorithms or domain similarity algorithms. So this is about power off in a second, that's why I need to press it. Um, and Using those two mechanisms, what we're doing is we're looking at the characters within the actual domain and looking at that frequency and looking at the probability that those letters will appear in real life. And do you remember we're seeing two trillion DNS requests a day, so we've got a good data pool to pull from to generate that probability. And then we're looking at the domain similarity algorithms. So when we see all of these hundreds of domains being generated, um, Frequently, we can go and use things other OS in, such as Showdown, such as going to the name registrars, finding out when they're being generated, how they're being generated, that tying that in with the IP numbers that are related to those domains. And that gets interesting when you start talking about fast flux. Now, fast flux is a, is, is a really interesting mechanism by which organizations use technology to be able to hide behind the command and control servers and hide their proxies that they're using to be able to get this malicious content. So when you click on that link, where does the URL go to? What IP address is it going to? What is the name server that's giving you that IP address? And fast flux is a method of, um, hi of hiding it by having lots of different nodes uh, all the proxies, all of these thousands of different IP addresses that are sitting in front of them at command or control servers, they're registering and deregistering their IP addresses from the domain. Now, this isn't a couple of hundred. This could be uh, 14,000. This is an example we had. Um, 
and the, the purple dots are IP addresses, the green dots are name servers, and the red dots are um, domain names. And this gives you an idea of, what, of, of a typical phishing attack uh, or typical um, network that's geared around launching phishing attacks, launching application attacks, and how they are putting in place processes to protect themselves. So what's happening is that all of those IP addresses will register and deregister with, the, with, with the, their A records onto the domain. So when you click on the domain, it may or may not go to one of those 14,000 IP addresses. When you click on they also do run the name servers as well. So they're moving the name servers around in the same process. So this is happening on a daily basis. So you can't use a firewall to block the IP address. And when we started looking at the, the mechanism behind it, so there's two methods of fast flux. One is single flux, which is just the A record, and then there's the, uh, the dual flux, which is the, um, the NS record as well. Um, there is a white paper on this which goes into a lot of detail, which is really, really interesting on this. But this d diagram here, this gives you an example of all of the different domains we were tracking of this 14,000 different IPs, and how the IP addresses were registering and deregistering. You can see the spikes and troughs within that. When we actually looked at the country, so we had the hosting service, the, the, the nodes that were hosting the malicious traffic, and then we had the command and controls. When we actually looked at them, we had two things. So 10 countries on the, on the left, which is the top IP addresses per country, Ukraine, Romania, Russia, a lot of common IP. So they're hosting malicious content in places where generally it's going to be quite hard to, to go out and, and kick them off. Um, on the right-hand side, uh, these are the com command and control servers. Now, ignore the first column, which is reserved, because that's all RFC 1918 addresses, so that's, you know, uh, 192.168 stuff. Um, U.S., when we looked at about 50% of the IP addresses on the U.S. top 10 IP addresses, um, they all related to Forbes 100 companies. You know, they were uh, IP addresses from major organizations, banks, insurance companies, uh, e-commerce sites, that sort of stuff. And what they were doing is they were basically trying to get the IP addresses so they could inherit the reputation of those good companies. So they're saying, okay, well, this all, the, the end, look at these, all, these different, all these good IP addresses. They must be relatively, it must be inherit that, it must be good. Um, but they never used the IP addresses, but the IP addresses were there to, to trying to inherit that benefit. That's just turned itself off. Um, okay, so um, I think I'm just about, yes. So wrapping up, um, all of the information we've gone through today, so I've done quite a few blogs, we've gone through quite a few monthly uh, reports that we do. It's all in what we call the state of the internet. Uh, so all of that data we saw from all of the, uh, the petabytes of information that we capture on a daily basis um, all goes into what we call state of the internet. Uh, do go on to the akamai.com website or go on to the, the blog site and uh, download some of the white papers. Most of the stuff we talked to today is all in the white papers. And if you have any questions, I'll be around later. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, fascinating. Um, the numbers that Akamai deal with are incredibly large, so, so um, this is not uh, to be sniffed at, not something you can handle on your own home network. Um, the next up, we have um, Ivan Salter from Royal London. Uh, information security, the psychological gap.
Good afternoon, every, everybody. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, the Cyber Academy for giving me this opportunity. Uh, being surrounded by experts, by students, government, people that they know about security, it is, it is just a, a pleasure to me. So, when I was invited to the Cyber, uh, Cyber Academy event, the big data event, I was thinking what I'm going to present, what, what, what I'm going to talk about. And uh, I could talk about technologies, I could talk about malware, DDoS, and I thought, why we don't go to the foundation? Why we don't talk about us, about the humans, how we process, how we perceive security? which I think is the, the biggest gap. So that's why I talk about the psychological gap. We invest millions in controls, security controls. We waste all our time just trying to protect our data, but at the end of the day, and you will see that in the next slides, the next, you will see that human error is always there. So I was going to talk about a, a little bit about me because if we are talking about, if we want to talk about psychology, uh, it's good to talk about our ego. What was my motivation? How I, I was drive to, to choose a, a career in security? So I was, I was a very creative guy. I, I, I like to paint, I like, I, th I thought to be myself some kind of artist. But when I was a teenager, I started to flirt with uh, computers. And I, I thought, well, I have some skills. Let's go for it. And I studied a computer science de degree. But also, I found out that many of the models, computer models, they were somehow based in our brain. There were some similarities. So I said, well, I'm going to study a degree in psychology. And there is when it come, came the dream about mixing artificial intelligence with psychology, do some research on it, but it didn't happen yet. So um, the alien topic, I started to work as an information security consultant back in 2004 when security was an obscure thing. So I worked for a company in Spain and uh, what I did is uh, make co uh, like around 100 companies compliant with what it was the Data Protection Act. And it's when I met the first hacker, let's call it Grey Hat, and I worked with him to do some, a, a, a perform some pen testing. And it was great, it's when I said, well, I like computer science, let's go for security, this is lovely, I really like security. So the crisis came into Spain, I tried to follow my career in security, no opportunities, so I moved to Scotland my dad's country. <laughs> so I start uh, in Sun Microsystems, which as you know, has, uh, was bought by Oracle. And it was when I, I learned about incident response, change management, also through a lens of, of security. Then I had, after a few years, the opportunity to go to Edinburgh University, something different, uh, the academy. So working for the social, uh, the school of, um, um, of economics with great researchers there. So again, I had to have an oversight on IT but through the lenses of security because we were, I was manager of the behavioral economics lab. So we had subjects, we had data. So all of that had to be protected. And finally, I was tempted to go back to the private sector and Royal London, uh, one of the biggest uh, mutual insurance in UK, gave me the opportunity to start as an information security and risk manager. So I moved from something very technical, hands-on, to something more risk-based, and I learned a lot about risk assessment and how we see, how we perceive threat, because it's all a little bit sub subjective. Um, so right now, a few days ago, I moved to second line as a senior information security officer. So I'm still looking into security. Oops, sorry. I think there is, this is, 
this puzzle around? Because it is not my, this is not the presentation, that I, the last one that I sent him. And no. So can I connect my computer? Sorry. So it has some pictures here. Sorry for the, the interruption. No, but it, this first slide, I made, I made some changes. You made some changes? Yep. Okay, so I, I, I could I, I could go with it. That's fine. Okay. All right. <laughs> Technical problem here. Okay. So why why psychology? Believe it or not, we are here talking about information security, and I think it's very much linked uh, with, with with psychology. What are the names that influence a lot? In information security, artificial intelligence, and computing modeling. Well, the great ma mathematician Alan Turing, with the test, with, with the famous test of Turing, when we can distinguish between a human being and a computer or not. Then John von Neumann, the first model of, uh, of what it was a computer with an uh, arithmetic logical unit with memory. It was very similar to, uh, to, to what it was a brain. Well, <laughs> kind of. Uh, Neil and Simon. So these guys also, they had a great influence uh, in artificial intelligence. They contributed to the information processing language and the two first AI programs. Social psychology. Now that we are talking about social media, how people are deceived, social engineering, you may guess that social psychology has a lot to say about it, a lot. So the first, uh, the first three researchers that I, I would like to uh, uh, outline is uh, Solomon Ash, which saw how we can be under pressure, how, how, how we can change our behavior. Uh, Stanley Milgram, with one of the greatest experiments that you've probably heard about it, the one that subjects they have to uh, gives electric shocks to uh, um, uh, an actor. So under pressure, uh, following the, uh, uh, a per another person that was kind of authority, they ended up killing, literally, that, that actor. Uh, Philip Zimbardo, with the experiment in Stan uh, Stanford uh, Prison, people just with, uh, trying to be police and other people trying to be prisoners. So things went very, very wrong. And why, how, this, how we can connect that with cyberbullying and with hacktivism and all, all, all that kind of stuff, because we are behind the mask when we go out to the internet. And I will explain that after. And behaviorism and behavioral uh, psychology has a lot to do with when we talk here about information security, awareness, and training, it, is, it has a lot to do with behavior and attitude. And we are so focused on knowledge, but given the proper award, proper award or, or, or the proper punishment when somebody behaves securely or not, this is the way to go and the way to change behavior and understand how people understand security to change the attitude. So the three big names here, Skinner, with uh, operational conditioning, punishment, and behavior. We can change action. Uh, Marcus, uh, Martin Fisman, an agent, with the theory of reasoned action, what is the outcome of our action? So we are always, our brain is measuring what is going to be a, ma the outcome of behaving securely. It's going to be positive for me, it's not going, and it connects what is behavior and attitude. And Rogers, with the founder, uh, was the founder of protection motivation theory, which also has, you can dive on it, which is very, very interested, interesting. So now I'm going to focus on the individual, in us, on us. Uh, so we are users, we are friends, members of the family, customers, and employees, students and how we perceive confidentiality, integrity, and availability, which we all know in information security, how this, tried, uh, this 
concept were. So I'm going to go through these different spheres. There are more than that. So I'm going to start the personal domain, the personal sphere, the circle of trust of <coughs> friends, of family, or partner, kids, the social network media, and I want to focus also there, and how we behave now that I'm being a, part, a member of a company, how we behave as employees. So what I found, some of the observations that I found is that there is, a there is not a, a trivial degradation of the concept of confidentiality, integrity, and availability through the spheres. Instead, varies completely how we understand these concepts, depending on the, on the sphere we are. So how we understand uh, these three concepts in personal life? So when we talk about confidentiality, my mind goes directly to 1950 with the United Nations with the Human Declaration of, uh, uh, with the Declaration of Human Rights, uh, wrote Article 8, which gives us the right to have a private life. So whatever you are in security, uh, a security expert or working for security, or you are just a normal user, we understand in personal life what confidentiality means. We shut our blinds. We tell a secret to a friend, thinking that it's going to be trustful and it's not encrypted. So we are going to do all that. We want a private life. We want to seclude information. So we understand what it is. Even now that digital, uh, digital uh, EOIT came to our homes, we start to have some kind of different concept of confidentiality because Alexa, don't record, please. Don't tell that to my wife. So it is, we don't understand that other, other devices that are recording our conversations in the background, we can tell something to a friend, but that, so it is a little bit blurred, uh, that concept. Integrity, how we understand integrity. For, uh, for an information security manager, integrity is the data has not, has to be accurate, not corrupted. But if we, if, we, if we think about us as humans and how we perceive the world, it is not information. It is also information, a stimulus that comes from outside. So our brain is processing continuously information. And integrity for us is to live a life that is predictable, to have control of that. So because how the feedback that the world gives us, it is very much connected with our identity. So that's why we have, need to have that control, uh, that integrity of information. Everything is stable. We have stable patterns. And availability. It is, again, our friends have to be available, or money, or belongings. If some, some of them are missing, we panic. So that is how we perceive confidentiality and for integrity and availability in our personal life. So when it comes to social network, things get messy, topsy-turvy, I would say. Why? Because research, again, that is social psychology, research tell, tell us that we our brain has evolved all through the history to give us, now I'm seeing you. I could see how you look at me if you're interested or not. So I receive a stimulus from you. But, whoops. <laughs> yep. Yep. Okay. Sorry. That's all right. So I received a stimulus from you. So, um, what happens here is that in front of a computer, I don't see a human. I don't see the tone of a voice. I don't see the nonverbal language. I miss all of that. So we are a little bit blind. So it's when we do very, very stupid things, very stupid things. We have a false sense of impunity. We think that we are anonymous. We think that we own data. And you, as, as you can see in the graph, the diagram that I put there, 
23% of users, net users, are completely free, or we can say that they're completely free. So information is owned by companies. So we suppose in political views, religious views, without, it doesn't matter. We are on Facebook and Twitter, we do it. And companies that are investing a lot of money in protecting our special category data. And we go to, to, to this sphere of our life and we throw there all of it. So that is a problem. And also for the companies, when, you, when we come with our BODs, bring your own device, with all the applications, it's what, it, what is also called information security, shadow IT. We exfiltrate data, we take photographs in the background with one, one screen of our, so we don't have a proper uh, understanding of what is confidentiality. When we are in the sphere, we lose, we miss the point. Integrity, is information reliable on the internet? I'm sorry, I'm going to be very cynical, but I think it, it doesn't. We think, we, we, we hear a lot about fake news, virals, sophisticated phishing attacks, and all of, all of that is based in people that, believe it or not, they understand how we think. And they are taking advantage of it. And availability, that is the, the one. When we, when we think about availability in systems, we want the systems to be available. But no, no, no. We are so dependent of the social media that the we are us that we have to be available 24 hours. And that has an impact in our, our personal sphere and also in our work sphere. When it comes to the company, <laughs> I took some random statistics because I don't want to bombard you. It's all about psychology. So my experience tell me and some the numbers tell that most of the data breaches, security incidents, they have human error as a root cause. <coughs> and why is that? How we perceive confidentiality, integrity, and availability at work? Again, I'm going to be very cynical. I think confidentiality ends when we are hired, where we sign a contract or a non-disclosure agreement, or we complete a CVT. That's it for us. Because the rest, security, belongs to the techies, belongs to the board those that they take decisions. I have to do my job and security is not for me. Integrity, we, we spend a lot of money in backups, in protecting our systems that data is accurate. Again, us mistyping, minimum information, the handling information the wrong way, human error. And that is affecting data quality, it's affecting a lot of integrity. And availability, again, as a worker, this is not my issue. This is the business continuity and disaster recovery team, IT security. This is not for me. So we see, we see how, depending on the spheres, we have a different concept. So we have to work, that's why I'm talking about the psychological gap. We have to understand how we understand, uh, how we, how people perceive the different concepts of CIA through the spheres and build a holistic view because that is going to help with awareness and training. Mutual responsibility. There is more than compliance. So there we have a mo four models, but I'm going to be very concentrated in high commitment because with all the news about security, cybersecurity and all this stuff, Companies are very committed with the GDPR, with the FCA, with all the regulations. They are very high committed with security. The problem is that I think, and it's my view, and I want to convince you on that, that most of the companies, they are, oh, in this place, they are so obsessed about compliance. It's all about the data policy. It's all about the requirements. Users, they have to follow the policy. And what at the end, 
And I'm going to tell you two stories. At the end, what happens is that the user or is frightened because perhaps if he does something wrong or she does something wrong, it's going to be punished, or is going to be indifferent. Indifference, indifference generates breaches, and that is something that research tell us. So, two stories, a ancient history, that's why, again, psychology, how archetypes, everything is connected with information security. Perhaps you know what is this, or not. Prometheus. Prometheus took the fire from Zeus. And the policy was very strict. Do not share the fire with humans. Don't take the knowledge. Don't take science. That was the requirement. No explanation whatsoever. No risk, risk assessment. Zeus didn't, risk, uh, didn't do any risk assessment. Just tell Prometheus, don't, tell, uh, don't take the fire. And he was, very, he was punished for that. So that, again, it is the model of compliance. It's all about following requirements, and that's it, no explanation. As a user, you don't have to know what security is. You have to follow this. And the other one is the story about Genesis, Aden and Eve. The God, the I am who I am, again, a policy. Don't eat from the tree of wisdom. Don't eat this apple. Did he explain Adam and Eve? what was all about the apple? You know, just follow the rules, because if not, you're going to be punished. Eve listened to the snake, ate the apple, and you know what happened. <laughs> so again, compliance. After these two stories, can you think a little bit different about Edward Snowden? Just a question, not to answer. So we have this scenario about high commitment and compliance, but I encourage companies to move to a mutual responsibility model. It is a model, a culture, security culture, where we know which is our responsibility. Everyone knows the responsibility. It comes from top down. We see the senior executive not only taking decisions, just sending information about security, how uh, worried are or concerned are, are, are about security and behaving securely. So you will copy that behavior when you go to that company. And we all know how to behave securely. And it's again, it doesn't mean that you're not going to be punished, but on the other hand, also you're going to be awarded when you behave securely in a mutual, res in, in a mutual responsibility model or company. So I'm going to talk, and another thing that we have to overcome, and that comes uh, from behavioral psychology and social psychology, the five dysfunctions of a team, and what we have to overcome. The absence of trust, the fear of conflict, a lack of commitment, uh, avoidance of accountability, and an attention to results. Absent, we have to gain the trust of our team. And how we gain trust? showing ourselves as humans, as vulnerable. It doesn't mean that you don't have to be confident, but you have to say, I am a human, I could take, I could take decision, but, uh, decisions, but also I can, could commit errors. The fear, the fear of conflict, you see that in, in, in companies when they talk about the politics uh, of, of the company. Being politically correct, you, you don't want to say if you find something bad you, or some, somebody high behaving in a non secure way, you're very careful with what you're going to say. But in a mutual responsibility world, everyone knows their responsibility and that is not going to be a problem if you do it in a constructive way. Commitment. Again, we have to have clear or requirements to be highly committed. But those both models that we talked before, compli the compliance model and the mutual responsibility, they have a high commitment. And accountability, that is the hot potato. When you go, when you get into a meeting and you talk to the board, who is going to take accountability of it? Some people, they want to be accountable because you need, because of regulation. But in reality, you will feel more safe to be accountable if 
you are backed up by all the company and you know that you work in a safe company and everyone is behaving securely. And attention to results is all about being green. It's all about our ego. It's presented to the board, we are green, we are, we are uh, within appetite, risk appetite. But in reality, I, and it's, it sounds a little bit polemic, but I would rather say we are amber, we are in danger, or there is a threat out there, rather than saying green just to tick a box and performing well at the end of the year and receive a bonus. And I have here some, some techniques to do, because I, I think we are running out of time, yeah? But because the other, <laughs> okay. So, so some conclusions, how, how, to, how, to, uh, how to improve information security awareness and, and training. So again, companies, they invest money in CVTs but it's not only about knowledge. It's not only about knowledge. There are other elements here that is the attitude and the behavior. When you read a CVT, you are receiving knowledge, but your attitude towards security doesn't change or your behavior. And this is very important to make security, enhance security, your attitude being positive towards security and your behavior being secure. So there are a few techniques here. So how to translate CIA to the wide, wide, uh, wider audience and connect it with our personal sphere. Talk about security, but giving examples about our personal life. Because it's all, always sound very techy about phishing, emails, all these all this figures, big numbers, but we don't connect it with our personal life. Bring authorities, regulators to tell, the, tell us the story create a mutual responsibility, as I said before, and fix the five dysfunctions to create a better, uh, positive attitude. Okay. <laughs> Knowledge. <laughs> Sometimes I recommend to tailor, see what, what your business, different business functions requirements are. So it's not the same at HR department as consumer, uh, a, a, a consumer face uh, department or a marketing uh, department. So the foundations of security are common, but I recommend to tailor that depending on the, on the department. Security weeks also. Why we don't do any, uh, every year a security week in our company? Just bring, as I said, people that security experts to talk about security, but more for the wider audience, not very technical. And behavior, as I said, is what behaviorism says. Reward, reward secure behavior, reward it. I'm not saying to give a check, money, but do some competitions, some uh, mention somebody in the news that they are behaving properly and punish not very much. Just always have a chat, mutual responsibility with your land manager if you secure, if you behave badly. Just have that chat without having to be frightened. Um, a strong uh, group security culture. When you go to Rome, when in Rome, do as Romans do. Well, so thank you very much for, for your patience and listen, listen to me. Uh, and as a final conclusion, I would say that we would have to invite more psychologists, people that they are in, in, investigating in the field of information security. It's all about technology. But I believe behind technology, attacks, everything, we are us humans. So that's why it's so important, psychology. So thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Next up, um, last but by no means least, uh, we have um, Harry McLaren from ECS, uh, Use Case Management at Scale, Framework Standardization, Bayesian Control, and Automated Deployment with Scrum.
How's that? Can everyone hear me? Looks like it. Let's get the slides sorted. The uh, slot just before lunch is the slot I've actually had three years in a row. Um, you have to balance the need to get through your slides as quickly as possible so everyone can eat, with also balancing the fact that I have a predisposition to talk quite quickly. Um, so if at any point I'm speaking so fast you can't understand, you just put a hand in the air, I won't ask you a question, but I will try to slow down. So I'm going to talk about use case management. Uh, I'm going to mention a little bit about scaling it out as well. I'm going to talk about framework standardization risk and automated deployment, as explained. Um, this is who I am. So my background is in security operations and security engineering. I've worked for ECS security since I graduated from Napier University. I studied computer security and digital forensics. Um, now my role is professional services lead for sim engineering. We work a lot with Splunk, which is a big data platform, which I'm going to mention a little bit towards the end. But my actual previous roles, I started as a SOC analyst, so security operations center, so processing the stuff that comes out of all the technology that we love. Um, I then moved into incident response as a responder, a security engineer, and now as a managing consultant, I take care of a load of engineers that actually do that work. For those of you that aren't familiar with Cyber Scotland Connect, I highly recommend you check it out. It's a community organization based in Scotland that just tries to be a funnel for all the other communities and great work we do out there. And also, if you are interested in Splunk, I run the Splunk user group at Edinburgh. Uh, my employer, very quickly, ECS Security, so we're a managed SOC provider. We provide SOCs up and down the UK. We have a multi-tenanted SOC headquartered here in Edinburgh. And we do fundamentally a lot of advanced threat hunting, threat detection, and response type stuff. And we're Splunk's chosen SME for security in the UK as well. So in the next, I say, 25 minutes, I'm going to try and get it closer to maybe 17, 18 minutes. I'm going to talk very quickly about detective controls, just so we're framing this entire conversation. What are use cases, so we can hopefully align on a rough definition. I'm going to talk about a common taxonomy for use cases. So this is the Magma framework, which is a fantastic piece of work that I'm going to go through. Version control, so use cases as code, how to document them in a, an appropriate way. And then finally, talk a little bit, how, a bit about how we've been using, um, essentially, um, Ansible and Puppet and automation software to deploy these things in an automated way to scale out when you're dealing with hundreds of use cases. Click is probably a good call. Okay, so these are three of the primary types of security controls that you can have. Okay, so preventative, as you might imagine, is trying to stop threats ever occurring within your environment, impacting your business. We have detective controls, which is what we're going to be focusing on. So these are things that discover attacks, whether they be active or passive, attacking your organization. And then corrective comes after that, and they try to decrease the impact of attacks that are, in fact, happening at, within your business. Um, so examples of preventative, we've got IPSs, firewalls, antivirus. Obviously, when these things fail, we then want to know enter detection. So detective examples would be things like honeypots, when we're trying to tempt attackers to attack us in ways that we can then detect and respond from. We've got log monitoring, which is where the use cases that I'm going to talk about come in. And we've got things like threat hunting. And this is where we do not have existing detective measures in place that are automatic, but we actually go into the data to try and find out what may or may not already be out there attacking us. And then corrective, incident response, orchestration, taking actions to try and limit that impact that an attacker is having. So frameworks are really important because they help us standardize. Um, you've already heard from many speakers this morning that have mentioned frameworks in one way or another. And these things, they, they just help us solidify and get ahead of the game. But rather than having to work out, well, what are all the different types of instant response processes we should have? Oh, well, look, NIST released a really nice one, and SANS made it really readable. Awesome. So really important to use frameworks. Um, before we start talking about Magma, we're going to talk about what a use case is. So this is the dictionary definition of a framework, sorry, of a use case. It's relatively useful in the sense that it you know, helps stop some arguments that I have at work on a regular basis, a specific situation in which a product or service could potentially be used, but it's not very specific. It doesn't, it doesn't really give us much use within the security context of when I say I have a security monitoring use case trying to detect credential stuffing, how I might outline that and define it. What attributes might it need? 
So this is where magma comes into it, and you'll excuse my, me including a Pokemon. It's not a Pokemon, it is in fact a framework. So this is uh, Management Growth Metrics and Assessments, was released by FI Isaac in the Netherlands, uh, I think 2017. Uh, I think we're using a slightly different version of PowerPoint here, so sorry for the slides getting a bit messed up, but that doesn't matter. So this is a framework that tries to, one, give you a taxonomy for de defining use cases, the drivers, and the things you need to fuel them but it also gives you a way of looking at the maturity of those use cases and trying to plot them in a way that's standardized. Now, when you're dealing with one or two use cases, this isn't really appropriate. It's complete overkill, and it will take you longer to read the PDF than it will to actually implement those few use cases. But when you're a company like mine and throughout our customers have developed and implemented thousands of different use cases, managing that at scale becomes an operational nightmare. If you want to update one, which one? In which environment? Which attribute did you change and when? Did you introduce a risk into an organization because you fat fingered a zero? Which is, in fact, something that happened a while ago, but I'll not talk about that because there was no impact and everyone was fine. But the other thing it does is it gives us a taxonomy for the attributes that a use case, is, a use case should have, and it maps them to other frameworks, which I'm about to go into. So, these are the various layers. I'm not going to cover all of them, don't worry. Right at the top, though, we do have drivers, so business or compliance. Right at the bottom, we have detective technologies that are the use cases are deployed upon. And then at the very bottom, we have events, i.e. the log sources that fuel the use cases. We're going to squarely focus in the middle. Um, level one use cases, this is essentially mapped to the kill chain and a few other threats that I'll share in a second. But this helps you at a really high level just say, well, what am I looking for here? Oh, well, I'm going to be looking for reconnaissance, or I'm going to be looking for actions on objectives, or I'm going to be looking for DDoS, or something like that. Real high level, but straight away helps you to start categorizing your use cases. Moving down to level two, we start to look at the tactical use cases. So this is, will include threat actors. This will include things along the lines of, well, within DDoS, what type of DDoS? Is it application-based, network-based? Is it volume-based? or is it going to do something else? It helps you, again, move down to that next layer of granularity and the attributes that come with it. Now, you also notice there was one-to-many relationship. A level one use case can have multiple level twos. A level two can have multiple level threes. And as we move out of what's called the threat layer, so that's just defining the threats themselves, we move into the implementation layer. And within the use case definition, this will contain two primary components. The first is the actual detection logic itself, so in the case of Splunk, that's SPL. Other scenes will have different ways of describing what a use case is, but it's the language that's used to actually detect the threat. The other thing it will have is the actual technique that it's trying to detect. So this is mapped to MITRE's attack framework, which I'll talk about you know, shortly. But this essentially, right the way down at a very granular level, says, OK, so we're looking for DDoS. We're looking for an application-level DDoS. And we detect that because we know they use this technique when they try to do it. So straight away, working at either end, you're able to expand upon and categorize exactly what you're looking for and why. <clears throat> so level one, as I said, maps the kill chain. So the kill chain was originally developed by Lockheed Martin. It's a really useful way of categorizing um, threat actors and the attacks that they put perpetuate. We've got pre-attack phases, we've got attack phases, and then we've got post-attack phases. I'm not going to go through each and every one, but the important thing is here, it's just a way to categorize your use case. What is your use case looking at? Is it a pre-attack use case or a post-attack use case? Is it looking for actions on the objective, i.e. stealing your data, taking down your environment, etc.? Or is it actually trying to detect when a, an attack is scraping your website for the details of your IT staff? That is the first point that we start to categorize the use case. Other areas are things that don't fit into the kill chain, which is why they're important to consider, because not everything does. Things like DDoS, extortion, trying to get your company blacklisted by fraudulent activity, sabotaging, etc. So as we move down to level two, you're not meant to be able to read that, but actually you can on this great screen, so that's good. But these are some of the categories, and I think there's uh, actually 61. I think I accidentally missed one because it made my table look um, neater. But um, these are the next level down. These are the actual things that are occurring when we take that top level category going down. So we've got obviously things like, oh, did I do an animation? Yes, I did. 
So we've got things like detection evasion techniques. So you were now saying, well, we want a use case to actually detect when malware, for example, is trying to evade being caught by our advanced malware protection software. Or again, we were looking at application level DDoS, protocol level, volume based. And remember, you can have a one to many. So we start at the top, actions on objectives, or let's say DDoS, and then we've got three other DDoS type of attacks that's linked to that high level use case. So we move on to level three implementation layer. So this is where we're talking about the attack techniques, and we're also talking about detection logic. So the attack framework, so this is from MITRE, it's a fantastic piece of work. This actually profiles and lists 244 different techniques and a number of ta um, techniques and tactics, sorry. Um, and these will say things like, you know, have a plain text description of exactly what it is. It will have technologies that could be used to detect it. And it will have the kind of logs that you might want to bring in for those detection based uh, rules or use cases to actually let you know when it's happening. Um, so again, it's not a great image for the screen, but there's a lot of them, as you can see. And they're all broken down into their various areas. And the whole idea here is if you are able to say, well, I've got a use case that looks for a shared web route, or I've got a use case that detects for, uh, I don't know, um, compile after delivery. So if my Outlook process is suddenly compiling software, that's not normal, so I might have a use case to detect it. That's the most granular we're gonna go with in the methodology, but you can define a lot within it. So, for the sake of argument, let's say that you've all gone away like the incredible security practitioners you are, and you've gone and implemented a framework. Let's, for example, say it's Magma, and at the end of it, you've got this fantastic use case factory. So you define them, you have sim engineers or big data professionals you know, building these use cases and deploying them within your environment. This is where you, however, start to run into a problem, because how do you actually manage that at scale? It's great that you've got a process, it's great that you've now been filling in a Word document for every use case, but how do you actually index them? How do you find them? How do you record change? How do you do things like tune, where you want to modify the rules to be more, to detect more true positives instead of false positives? And these are the problems that we face in our business before we you know, really took apart the problem and looked into these types of things. So what we did was we turned to things that developers have been using for a very long time, as has Microsoft Word. So, Everyone that's used track changes in an office suite or similar, even in SharePoint, for example, should be able to grasp the basic concepts of version control. But first of all, we've got to have something to put in. Now, putting in an XML-based Word document, for example, or let's say an Excel sheet into a version control system isn't ideal because there's tons of superfluous metadata, you know, how should the text look, all that kind of stuff that would get drawn along with it. Neither is a text file that's just one long sentence with a ton of attributes that you define. And this is where the standardization comes in. So this particular example is taken from Sigma, which is a generic signature format for scene systems. And it's really, really interesting because they've picked the exact same things that we picked when we built ours, but it, they're using YAML files. So it's a really simple way of defining attributes and fields within a file that then something like Python would read and then do something with. So as you can see within this one, we have a number of attributes that we might want within a use case. We've got the plain text description, we've got the author, we've got the type of logs that we're interested in, the event IDs, because this is a Windows-based use case. And straight down, this is level, layer three, remember, so level three as a, as a use case, we now have this use case defined as code. This is the kind of thing that a version control system loves because every time you change a character, every time I add in a new event ID, it's gonna record exactly what happened and who by. You then get this incredible granular history that you can go back that's auditable, that enables you to roll back if needed, and more importantly, enables you to then automate the deployment of. So now we're gonna talk a little bit about Git. So Git is a version control system. It's probably one of the largest used in the world. Um, you might know that Microsoft recently bought GitHub, which is fundamentally based around Git, and they contribute heavily to it in the open source community as well. But Git really covers this concept really, really simply. You have a master branch. This is what would be described as your production branch or your live branch. It's the thing that is often deployed into production. And for the sake of what we're talking about, this is where your use cases are. All the use cases that you have deployed into production are within your master branch. So straight away, 
what's in production. I don't need to look in production. I don't need to open a graphical user interface and click into hundreds of thousands of use cases. I just open this and I can see all of them listed out really neatly. Okay, brilliant. And now I want to make a change. So I open a ticket, I have change control, I have all the checks and balances the process tries to enforce, but I can't make a change to master. I try, I try and open a use case, try and make a change, try and save it, and I'm blocked. And that's because this, the tooling will force me to create a feature branch or a change branch, for example. So that branch is the same as master, but now enables me to make modifications. All of this is tracked in what's called the commit history and enables me to see any changes I've made and indeed any changes anyone else has made. So I go along, I rapidly prototype some new use cases, maybe that have come out the back of threat modeling or the latest white paper or conference talk I've seen, and I get to the point where I'm happy. I test my changes and I'm ready to put back into master, meaning I'm ready to put it into production. Now at this point, the tooling enables me to do things like check that my code is okay, because what I can do is simply say to a co-developer or SOC analyst or similar, can you just check before I commit this in? I can enforce in the tool set that I have to have that kind of check, that someone has to approve it with that entire history being recorded. So that's really useful. It's especially useful in businesses like ours where we have um, hun over hundreds of analysts potentially making changes to use cases and with the want to make sure that those changes are both accurate and can be rolled back if there's a problem. So what does this look like at scale? So at scale, you have multiple developers working within the same repository. So let's say your master use case repository. And they're able to work simultaneously because the system itself, when you want to merge back in, will simply ask you to resolve any conflicts. But depending on your workflow, hopefully you're going to be working on different use cases anyway. But if you're not, it's okay because the system allows you to make those combined merges and press on. So now let's say that you deployed the framework, you have some incredible use cases, you've deployed version control, what's next? So next is then pulling it all together. And pulling it all together enables us to then visualize it, which is the final thing I'm gonna show you. So as a process, we have our use case, we have first and foremost defined our level one and level two, so we understand the business drivers, we understand the top level threats that we're trying to protect against, and then we have prototyped our level three use case. This is our detection logic that outlines the exact techniques we're trying to detect when they're executed by an attacker. We've committed our code into our dev branch, meaning that we're playing with it, we're testing it, we want some feedback, so we get it validated by a peer, and they approve it to go into master. Now we've got our code in master, what we know is that it's ready to go into production because it couldn't be in master if it wasn't. So we now have our pipeline built. Now within what we've done, we've essentially created a number of scripts that rather than create config files that we have to manually deploy, we simply have a script that goes to master and says, hey, you've got some new use cases for me. It's able to look at the commit history since the last time it deployed and it deploys the new ones into production. Obviously, there's change windows and all the other checks and balances involved, but the technology doesn't require us to do anything other than ensure those approvals are there. So we now have our use, new use case package, and it's been validated and pushed into production. We now have new use cases in production. We have a clear auditable history of exactly where they came from. We have a well-defined level one through to level three use case history, so we know exactly why this use case got deployed. We know what attackers it's trying to fend off, and we know what techniques we're looking for within the technology logs. So when you actually pull this all together, and Splunk is a technology for big data, it's the one we use, but there's many others, because it's now all as code, we can do what you can do with all big data samples. We can visualize it. So rather than you know, use cases being static binary pieces of config, or packages that we would have to take apart on a disassembler or a database we'd have to try and pull. Because it's within a big data tool, we can start to visualize it and using some relatively straightforward dashboarding techniques. So what Splunk did in this app, which they released for free, which you're happy to play around with, is they enable you to actually take apart all those attributes of your use case and then showcase it in an app. Now, you might think that's only useful as a sales tool, and it is, but it's also useful for a SOC analyst looking to deploy a new use case in a different environment. So our SOC analysts work on many different customers, and those customers have different requirements for security monitoring. 
But if I'm looking at one environment and going, you know what, I, you know, I've got some time, I'd like to deploy some use cases, rather than just having to come up with a new idea or you know, go through a ton of source code, I can open the app and go, oh, well, actually, yeah, we don't have any basic brute force detection on this account. That was silly. What's this use case about? And rather than having to go into the use cases that were defined as code, even though they're nicely defined within a YAML file, we've got this lovely user interface that we can play with. It's also a user interface that you can then put in front of your customer, or indeed, whether that's internal to your business or externally, and say, well, why don't you have a browse? A new business unit's coming online with a great digital initiative. Why don't you look through all the use cases we've got that might be applicable to your cloud strategy? Oh, okay, I will, fantastic. And of course, because it's a big data tool, we can filter, we can play, and we can make other interesting visualizations like this one. So this is that essential same picture from before of all the MITRE attack techniques, but it's using a heat map to actually show in real time exactly what use cases are deployed within the environment. So by opening this dashboard, if I'm looking for control gaps, I can glance and go, quite a few. I'm unable to detect an attacker if they are in this particular, using this technique within my environment. And then I'm able to obviously consult the actual MITRE attack definition and say, well, how could I do that? And maybe that's now a ticket or a request for the people that develop my rule sets to make sure that they've closed that gap as soon as possible. The other thing I can do is I can do a differential between data sources I'm ingesting and use cases that I have within my library but haven't yet deployed for those data sets. And so by tweaking simply a dropdown, because it's, again, big data tool, it's just a simple dashboard at the end of the day, I can say, well, what data sources do I have that could fuel use cases that haven't been deployed yet? Another map, another heat map that enables me to go, well, we've got another six that aren't even deployed. Could we just get them deployed, please? Oh, of course, no problem. And it's that kind of analytics that by doing all the previous steps, you're then able to do. And that fundamentally comes down to risk management. It comes down to looking at your organization, identifying the gaps, and prioritizing the mitigations that you want to put in place to try and mitigate the risk. So, uh, as I said, the app is uh, free to download, free to experiment with. It's got a ton of use cases out of the box with it. Splunk itself is also free to download and play with up to like 500 meg a day. Do have a play. Um, that is pretty much me. There's a ton of resources. Uh, none of these hyperlinks will work if you're sitting in the audience, but these slides will be shared and they will do work. Google them all, they'll come up. Um, and finally, uh, as I mentioned earlier, if you're not a member of Cyberscot Connect, free, it's free to join. It's not a membership organization. It is just for the community. Please do check us out. And uh, yeah, any questions, please reach out to me on Twitter or by my email. Thank you. Thanks very much, Harry. Uh, just waiting for the microphone to connect. Um, these things do take up time, unfortunately. Oh, thanks very much. Uh, we'll use this one instead. So, um, just before lunch, uh, we might have time for one or two questions if people are curious to ask one of our three presenters. Uh, any questions? Uh, we do have the nice throwable microphone, uh, which I'm more than happy to throw. Or unless Harry wants to oblige. Uh, anybody got any questions for either Harry or two of our other previous presenters? No, I can see. Oh, yes, yeah. yes, one over there. Wait, oh. Sorry. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> bit, bit too keen. There you go, Harry, you can have this mic. I actually just want to ask a question about hype brands, because you were talking at the earlier, at the beginning of your chat about hype and how that has opened up the security risks within um, the internet and the way in which people are now, you know, retailing, you know, accessing retail. Uh, is that something that you see is going to increase? Because I have teenage children and this is the thing you're really into, is into, you know, these download dumps and all these sorts of things that they do on a regular basis from um, large um, retail, you know, hyped brand organisations. Is this something that you're seeing as being a big threat in the retail sort of sector? Um, I, I think hype to a certain extent, to a certain extent is, it generates a certain amount of attack traffic. I don't think it's uh, a specific trend. There are many, many uh, other drivers for the credential stuffing. Um, and the associated attacks with that. 
Um, it just so happens that those sort of high events have created some very notable um, uh, attacks. But yeah, generally we're seeing any event where there is more demand than there is uh, product available. There's always going to be uh, an opportunity for these types of bots to go in there and do inventory theft. Do you have any other questions? Yep, if you want to throw the, uh, see if we can get it across. Here we go. Excellent. Wow. Funky technology. This is a question for Ivan. I remember him as a student. Um, you talk about psychologists, but what about the role of ethnographers and sociologists in understanding what's going on in an organization? Yeah, that, that is a really, really good question. Uh, I think you're right. It's not only about psychology, but all the human sciences. Because uh, it's, a, it's again, it's all about us, about humans, how we take decisions. So there are many, sociology has a lot of research. The other, the other day I was in Google Scholars, and there is a lot of research, a lot of paper, very, very interesting papers that I encourage all of you to, to go and find around deception on the internet, identity uh, management, when, when uh, hacktivism, uh, cyberbullying. So there are other, there are other uh, fields that should contribute the, the same as psychology. But as you know, there is an overlap with psychology and, and other social sciences, like uh, behavioral economics and how we take decisions under following a, an authority and all this stuff. So I don't know if, if I re <laughs> respond to your question uh, or you need some more clarification, but I, I, think, I think you are right. Other, other social sciences, they should contribute to that. No, no it's great. I mean, it's, a, it's a good discussion to have, and I think it's always just useful to remember that yep. there's um, security is more than technology. But I think everyone kind of sees that now. Okay, thank you. So thanks, Ivan. Okay, um, it's now coming up to uh, 10 past, we've just gone 10 past. Do we have one last question, or do we want to break for lunch? Break for lunch? Okay, fantastic, thank you very much. So please give a round of applause for our three presenters. Um, if you make your way, there's plenty of food, so no panic there. Um, we start back at uh, two o'clock, thank you very much.
Yo. Yes. Sure, I think that you're presenting or sharing with some of them today. Right? No, tomorrow. Tomorrow. Yeah, tomorrow. tomorrow. But no, 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 the, the thing about the parking, the people who are parking there, they can see the oh, yeah, they, they can see the people in the living room. Oh, yeah, they can see the living room. No, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I think that you're, um, and I wasn't going to write that down. But that's the chair, because I, I, I'm assuming that we're, I am assuming you're a peaceable part of the crowd. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Good. So we have... Oh, yeah. Stick them in here. Oh, you can oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, right, so uh, we, we only have a bit of a selection. So this is done because of the, the, the photographer needs the light that way for taking photographs. Um, yeah, it's not, it's not necessarily hugely great. So all my questions have to put them in a U and not stop. If you want to stick in the cold, that's fine. Locked. 
So when are you up next? Where are you? Is that off? So you've got, you can see exactly what's going on. Oh, brilliant. That's great. That's, that's, what you, <clears throat> that's where you are. So if you want to swing this round, so this gives you what's up on the screen. Actually, you can put it, it's, it's, it's all very much changed now. So if you want to stand there, you're front and centre. You can see what you're doing in here, unless it's distracting. Um, but that's what you're going to be swinging. So you don't have to look over your shoulder. No, I, I like you that. Can, you, can look at, you can look at that. Great. Well, actually, we have, do have closing speeches, and everybody will be coming here. Um, so if you do have a run, <laughs> actually, <laughs> I don't think there's any chance of you coming in before Bill. Don't no. come, don't come in. I'm in that train. N no one outlasts Bill. <coughs> Testing. Thank you. Go get a look. Okay. Go get a look. Thank All you. Right. Uh, lunch. You know where lunch is, all right? Yeah.
Me. Oh no, that's you, is it? Hang on. I'll go back, I'll go back. How many slides have you got? 54, got 30 minutes. Yeah, but I flow through slides. Seriously. Here we go, lastminute.com. He's editing the deck now. Now, see, that's, that's, that's the best way to edit it, yeah? Come on, Eamon, yeah. hurry up. Shut up. Exercise in a box. Yeah. You're living in a box, baby. Well, you you can sing car. that if you want. Sorry? You can sing that if you want. All right. Oh, my God. Oh, my God, that was unexpected. Yeah. He's got 54 slides, man. I'm, I'm feeling a little bit. Uh, I've only got 17 that I was going to mess with. Uh, I'm, I want to get control because I want to check if my piece, my presentation right, is actually yeah. there. It's not. I'm telling you, it's not there. Not now. He's <laughs> just deleted it. Just plug in a completely unsecure USB. Well, you could do that. Hi, Steve. Stuart. Stuart. Nice to meet you. Hey, nice to meet you. Cheers. 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 Uh, and you're from? Wallet Services. Oh, you're doing all right. You're all right. You're um, yeah. Pete. Pete. Uh, yeah, everybody knows Pete. Well, no, no, but uh, I mean, actually, I had a coffee with him. And who else has been involved in this? He's still here. Uh, Stuart Fraser. Yeah. Well. And Anna Osman. I was going to come over here. Still try to uh, sell them through public services. Yeah, it's not fair. Well, actually, is it worth it? It's not. It's just it's yeah. such a pain in the yes. ass. Yes. <laughs> um, uh, uh, my presentation's not here. I need to go and find Basil. Go see Basil. Is mine Basil? Now. Basil? Wait, you might be in the wrong place, though. Because none of them are mine. Yeah. If you go up, there was an afternoon session. Oh, right. Look at the afternoon session. Okay. This isn't good. Yours isn't there either. Uh, no. So four, five, four and five. We're four and five and we're missing. Yeah. Okay, let's go find Basil. Basil! Okay. Yeah, oh, is that mine actually? I don't think it is. No, it's not. It's one. It's one, two, three. That's the morning session. Yeah, that's not mine. That's the Akamai guy. Well, he created the afternoon session. Yeah, but yeah, we, we had it. Yeah, I saw him do it. We need to find okay. Basil. Come on, then. Oh. Hold on, just, why don't you just type in afternoon and see if we have it? I don't think there's a phone. No, 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 right, no. Yeah, okay. come on. We better find Basil quickly. Well, he's putting his laptop. If you're any good, you'd have it on a stick, guys. Sorry, basic stuff, you know. Yeah. I'm only winding you up. <laughs> Has Basil left his USB key connected in here? No. Well, there is a USB here. Is it a white one? No. No, I don't see a white one. Is that is that yours then? No, no I don't know. Actually, that is the uh, that's for the clicker. Ah, right. It's just the receiver for the clicker. Right. You thought you might have left it in here. No. Right. Thank you.
Fantastic. So we Baz is just getting the presentation. Yeah, Baz is just bringing it on. No worries. Just, we just had a chat with him, so we're getting it sorted. Good, good, excellent, excellent. So cool. James, you're on after that. There's a clicker. Usual. Yeah, I'm just waiting for the presentation. Here he comes. The man himself. The man with the goods. Oh, I just need to get it. Mate. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I've changed. That clicker was dying. I've changed it around. There's no worries. Oh, fantastic. Oh, excellent. Yeah. Thank you so much. I was going to replace the batteries. It's always happened. Yeah. So lad, you want to, if you're using it here, you want to swing that round? Okay. Do your presentation. But they're also on the big screen there. Awesome. <laughs> so I came in. Well, Sorry. Well, I ain't got two minutes. Okay. I spent most of my life on the late and eating six now. So welcome back. Please do take a seat. We'll be short, starting momentarily. Or in a few moments. <laughs> or in there, a few there's moments. There's still people in the, in the chat. There's still also. people eating. And <clears throat> there are still people eating. We'll give it five minutes. Amen's. Yeah, drop Amen into the afternoon. Um, you don't wish to get stuck in here in a couple of weeks. The what, sorry? Wish Neon's stuck in here in a couple of weeks. Yeah, he is, yeah. Nineteen. What's he doing? He's talking. About what? Hopefully cryptography. If he's coming here to talk about his pets, I'm not coming. No, he's talking about cryptography. Yeah. I'm just joking, huh? Because I just started this Secret <laughs> Lies book in 2000. Uh, oh, yes. No, 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 no. Oh, just read, read the introduction. It's, no, he's, it's, a, he's it's a good guy. He's a very, very good guy. The Schneider. <coughs> Schneier, sorry. It's a Schneier. Yeah. Schneier. Oh, Schneier. Um, but yeah, it was just a... No, I, see, I saw him talk in London last year, and I saw the invite, and I thought, damn it, I can't actually make it because I'm not here. So I was really annoyed. But it's going to be recorded, hopefully. Are you going to come to this one? No, I can't make the Shire talk. In you can't. I'm, I'm, not, I'm on holiday. Oh, if you buy a book and give me it, I'll get him to sign it. But Welcome I don't know how to do it. Secret demo it. about the assurance of a critical <laughs> asset in oil and gas supply chain. No? This process no. involves multi-factor... All right, Baz, we we good? Can I have a quick edit before we start? Thanks. Yeah? I just yeah. need to change something quickly. Yeah, okay. This is your number yeah, yeah, two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Sorry. Perfect. Yeah. Thanks, mate. Perfect. Thanks. Well, thanks for yeah. doing that, Baz. No. I'm just doing a quick little edit, mate. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, it's fine. It's fine, mate. I played it. Oh, no, I'm fine with it. I'm yeah. fine with it. Oh, I don't know. Let's do all yours, mate. Uh, the video, the video. Are you going to be talking in the video? Yes. So you don't need the sound from. No, me. no, no. I'll, I'll mute that, it. That's fine. Okay, that's cool. it. All right, you don't need the sound from. No, me. no. It's just so I don't have to type and show. Oh, what right. I'm doing. oh, oh, excellent. The, 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 the demo. Okay, that, that's fantastic. That's okay. great. You're good to go, mate. Cool. We're good to go. We're just going to wait for people to get up. And up. Okay. Uh, so wait for two, three minutes. Sure. Yeah. 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 Thanks. No worries. I'll see you tonight, yeah? Tonight, it's happened tonight. The dinner. <laughs> I've forgotten completely about it. Where is the dinner? Sorry. <laughs> no, honestly, I'm so busy here. Honest. Tonight, here, 7 o'clock, at, okay. at the River Street. The River Street? Yeah. It, right, actually, yeah, here, so I stay here till. You can stay here, there will be coffees and teas yeah, yeah. while you're here, you know. I'll just go and do some, I'll just go and do some work, yeah. Yeah. Fine. There's space. There's space. Yeah, I've got tons yeah. of work to do, so it's fine. Okay. I was going to head back to the office, but it's fine now. No, no, no. Because at seven o'clock is a reception. River, <laughs> so river suite here. Yeah. Okay. You, you passed. You passed by that already two weeks ago. Two weeks ago. You got traffic. Okay. Yeah, I just wasn't really paying yeah. attention. No, no, I admit no, no, I was just following. No, no, no. Perfect. Yeah. Thanks for reminding me. I'll ring my wife just to let her know. Yeah. 
because I actually played Basel forever. No, no, I, I was yeah. on holiday last week, so I can. <laughs> you're, you're coming tonight. Right? Yes, yeah. I think Pete's 50-50. Okay, but he's a Pete. Find a friend. Sorry. Ask the audience. Okay. Cool. Okay, super. Thank you, Basil. Thank you. Okay, welcome. Um, welcome. Oh, that's better. So we have uh, some more um, presentations for your delight. Um, hope you enjoyed your lunch. And uh, this is the Riyadi. So if you're supposed to be in the Lindsay Stewart, you're in the wrong place. That's the one upstairs. We have uh, Steve Pavitt from Wallet Services. He's going to give uh, a, a talk to us, a presentation, on building trusted business processes with SICA. Thanks very much. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, if you've got any questions halfway through, feel free to sort of just shout and heckle. Um, it always kind of, if you wait until then, you might miss one. Uh, apologies for that smug looking photo. It's not really who I am, but it's my company photo. Um, Wallet Services is an is a Edinburgh-based uh, startup. We started as a, trying to build, well, we are still trying to build cross-organizational workflows on blockchain, um, and then we've moved away from blockchain more into a more generic DLT, uh, as we face some of the issues actually using blockchain in a production environment. We, we, we kind of moved on to uh, DLT. Uh, we've got the two co-founders there, Peter, uh, Faye started, uh, he, he was one of the sort of first guys in Microsoft Scotland and he helped grow sort of Microsoft Scotland into what it is today. Uh, Stuart uh, Fraser, he started a cyber security company and sold to Dell, so there's quite a lot of sort of security and enterprise solutions in there. Uh, I myself um, left, uh, studied at Napier. This was actually my first uh, campus. I was one of the last students, I think, last computer students to do Napier, uh, but that was a long time ago. Uh, so yeah, cool. Uh, moving on, I thought we'd just start with, you know, it's really interesting because cybersecurity is a big thing now, but when I was at uni, we didn't even talk about it. I don't think I did one course on cybersecurity, infosec, uh, unit testing, none of this stuff actually existed in, until I left uni, so I've kind of missed all this, so I've had to learn it all myself and not do it. Um, but I really like, I'm Bruce Neers talking here in two weeks, I don't know who you know, he's an American cryptographer. Uh, Harvard Law, Harvard, uh, Harvard, MIT. Uh, but he's an American cryptographer and he really knows his stuff. And one of the sort of seminal books on InfoSec that he wrote was Secret and Lies. Um, and in 2000, he was keeping this sort of diary of stuff, I presume, as he was writing it. Um, and this is his first entry. And it's, uh, somebody stole 3,000 customer records, uh, 3,000 credit cards. And this actually got into a book. Uh, and if you think where we got, from then to where we are now, and this is sort of 19 years later, the last where we are now in the you know, annual breaches, 1,244 millions of records uh, constantly getting breached. You know, no system seems safe. You know, if you have an attitude of it will never happen to us, it's probably the wrong attitude. It's when will it happen to us and how will we react? Uh, and if you look at the bigger, you know, for quite a while we thought it's okay. We've got Facebook, we've got LinkedIn, we've got Uber, we've got Google, these guys are hiring the best people in the world. They know what they're doing. But actually, Uber's been breached, uh, and their breach was fairly straightforward. Somebody managed to grab an administrator, username and password, log on in as administrator, and download all this data. Uh, Marriott, Hol Marriott got breached, and they didn't know how they got breached. Um, Facebook's had a couple of sort of small breaches. Amazon's had breaches. Everyone's getting breached because fundamentally, um, we're not solving the issue of protecting our data. It's just not, we either, either the problem's too complicated for us as humans, or it's getting, you know, the systems are too complicated to be protected. Um, so, and partly it's because protecting data is really, really hard. You know, it's really difficult. You know, we, we do lots of different things to protect data. You know, I was having a chat before lunch about GDPR about how you protect you know, user accounts, how do you protect it when it goes across countries. Um, constantly we're looking at how to protect data and we're losing the battle. We don't seem to actually be even 
drawing, we are losing. If people want our data, they take it. Um, either through malicious needs, uh, accidental need, uh, means, uh, we just are completely unable to protect our data. Um, I, I decided I'd steal this from Jurassic Park. <laughs> it's fundamentally true. Data finds a way. Secrets find a way of getting out. There's nothing we can do about it. Or it seems there's nothing we can do about it. Um, you know, we've got InfoSec now, but we still have problems. We have firewalls now. Didn't really have firewalls in 2000 when I was at Napier. We could look up whatever we wanted. We still have these issues. We don't seem to be answering the question because fundamentally, as soon as people are in our systems, they're grabbing our data. Um, so this is how SICA came about. The guys had a... I joined very early. I was, I think, employee number four, but I'd been working with um, identity and security and cryptography for sort of the previous five years when, I'm, when I met the guys from Wallet Services. And they, they're a bit older than me, as you saw on the photo. They were the two old guys. And they got to the point where they're really sick of how complicated everything is to do. Yeah? And whenever you try and do cross-organisational work, whether it's opening a bank account, opening a business bank account, if you're multiple directors, applying for a mortgage, numerous things. You constantly are filling out pieces of paper and sending the paper off into the wild and hoping for the best that something happens. And the best you can do, or the best we seem to do as an industry, is we can get that piece of paper and replicate it online and then send it out and just sit back and hope, and hope that we get the process completed eventually. Um, so we, came, we, we started thinking about how can we make cross-organizational workflows a reality? How can we protect the data? How can we make these realities? Because the other thing, the other part of this problem is organizations are really bad at working together. They have real concerns about working together. Um, for example, if you want to be two organizations working together, you have to either have some sort of shared, if you're running two APIs, you have to have some shared administration, some shared IT. You have to agree, this person's going to own the API and you're going to consume it. If they change it, you have to change it. You're coupling your, your, your companies together. That causes issues. Um, another thing you tend, to, you tend to find is shared identities. You have some sort of shared identities in there, whether it's... Um, Jill and accounts is passing it to Steve and somebody else's accounts. You know, we, we understand too much of the organizational structure and one of the things organizations like to do, we're no different, everyone else is no different, is organizations like to be able to reorganize to best suit their needs. Whether it's the customer's needs, the business needs, the legal needs, whatever, they want to reorganize and these shared systems have a problem because fundamentally you've then exposed a bit of yourself to another organization and then you feel or do we have to tell them? How do we deal with this? How, how can we protect ourselves? So when we wrote SICA, we, we set ourselves some really hard... Um, when we were designing SICA, we, we set ourselves some really hard goals in that we didn't want any shared IT at all between organisations. One to N, if you are two organisations shared, there should be zero shared IT. Uh, we didn't want any shared identities. It, they, it should be completely decoupled from the humans that work for your organisation. Um, and we didn't want any shared administration of the system. You should be able to configure your system, uh, configure your firewalls, and all we need is you to accept how the data going out and the data coming in. And that should be control controlled by you. So we set ourselves some really sort of uh, strict rules about if we were going to build SICA, it had to be sensible. So this is what we did. Um, if you look at the modern world, I'll go into this a bit more, I suppose. And this is only two, but to be honest, in a multi-organizational workflow, there can be three or four or five. You know, that could be, and we see this a lot in the public sector. So if you imagine, um, I'm a rugby coach. I coach my kids' rugby team. To get my rugby club to allow me to coach, I had to fill out a PVG form. It's a sort of piece of paper. That form then got passed to my rugby club, and they got all that information about me. They then had to, the person in that rugby, my rugby club had to fill in their PVG number. Uh, it then went to the SRU and it sat there for weeks. And the SRU had that piece of paper for ages. Don't know what they did with it. Don't know how good the IT systems are. I don't think they're that good. They may be okay. They may be amazing. Don't know because there was nothing about it. It then got passed to Disclosure Scotland. And then from Disclosure Scotland, that form maybe got copied into their systems. I don't know. There's no, there's no documentation about what they do. Probably went to Police Scotland to do a criminal record check. Probably went to Call Credit to do an address lookup. Uh, 
probably went to some other agencies within Scotland to determine if I had any, you know, what uh, disclosures they needed. And then eventually, I was sitting there for months and months and months waiting, couldn't do anything, couldn't, just sitting there waiting, and eventually I got my certificate through, all good. But that's a black box scenario, and that's a bit of paper. And if that piece of paper got lost, it's gone, I had to restart. If somebody had changed that bit of paper, I have to stop and restart. You know, there's no transparency, there's no trackability, there's no traceability, there's no queryability, there's no audit, you know, there's, it's a black box. You're just putting, in, putting something in the top, waiting weeks and weeks, and it's coming out the bottom. And this is an expensive process. And this, this process is repeated, whether we're talking about public sector, uh, like Disclosure Scotland, or you're talking about uh, using a, a mortgage broker, and you know, he takes your data, and then he copies the same data you give him into all the different mortgage providers, um, or you know, anything we're talking about, your data is put in once and it's copied all over, and you have no control of who gets what. And the problem is, we end up being reduced to paper, or if paper's not an option, we tend to end up getting reduced to Excels and emails, which is an unqualified process. We cannot use Excel and email to pass this secure data about because we don't, we don't know. And the people that are doing it are trying their best to do the best for the company, but they're not data security experts. They don't know that organization B needs this bit of data, this bit of data, this bit of data. They're just taking an Excel dump from the database and passing it lock, stock, and bar across. And this is happening every day. I'll, I've, since leaving uni, I've worked for at least seven organizations and at least seven of them, all seven I know of, apart from Wallet, uh, have sent data across to another organization in either, either an Excel or an email or a Word document or a data dump of some sort in an unqualified process. Now, we have data protection offices, we have legal frameworks to protect against this, but fundamentally they're, so, they're currently so detached from the people doing the job, people just want to get their job done and go home. We have to get this, we have to close this gap. And that's what we want SICA to do. So instead of these decoupled situations, what we really want is, and this is where the DLT comes in, so apologies for sort of waving my hands and shouting blockchain, but this is where DLT comes in. Now, blockchain up till now has been pretty good for one thing, and it's transferring money about and burning, you know, energy resources. Uh, we've moved more into DLT, and in fact, we're kind of moving more into distributed register technology, where a ledger is about money and values, a register has data. So for example, one of our transfers will quite often contain personal information, it will contain some documents, it will contain whatever, so our transactions are a lot bigger. But we still need organization A to connect to organization B onwards and onwards. So the way we've tried to do this is we've created the SICA platform to do this. Um, so if I start at the bottom, we have our DRT, DLT uh, framework, uh, storage. On top of that, we have our Supernode technology. It's pretty much the easiest way to describe it is it's our enterprise API on top of the DLT. All it's really interested in is transactions. You give it, uh, you know, you give it some data, it, trans it makes a transaction, puts it on, and it sends it out. Um, and second designer are sort of higher level apps, I'd call them, and they sit within our ecosystem of SICA. Uh, the SICA designer, the easiest way to describe it is a workflow builder for cross-organizational purposes. And what we want to do with SICA is we want organizations to come together organically and build processes together. So they identify the actors who's involved, but not humans, they identify groups within organizations. So if this is a, a process between, say, myself, who's in product in my company, James, who's in security in Lloyd's, and Tim, who's in GDPR, we wouldn't be trying to send the data to James and Tim because James might go on holiday and Tim might retire, or vice versa. Uh, we want to send it to James's department. So if James is on paternity leave or he's on holiday, somebody, we can just move somebody in, they can access the data and then pass it on. Uh, and the executors just are standard way of executing these processes. Now, one of the, one of the great benefits that blockchain has given us is uh, the, crypto the can I say it? cryptography methods with blockchain. In that, everyone gets a wallet. But again, we don't want individuals, we want users. So what we've done is, when you deploy Sicker, you will deploy it with your identity. It's not our identity, we've got no interest in doing anything with identity. 
you bring your identity. So if you're using Azure AD or you're using LDAP or AWS identity, you provide your users, you provide your organizational structures, and then we create wallets that mimic those organizational structures. And they're what we use as actors within SICA. Not users, not humans, not applications, but the groups in your organization. And that means if you want to restructure your organization within SICA, you just leave the group, the wallet alone, and you can restructure as long as that wallet stays the same, the keys are there. Uh, so yeah, we'll go on. Yeah, and so SICA, so here's a sort of basic view of the designer. We've got title, actors, steps, permissions, and public data. Uh, and the permissions is really exciting. Uh, and I'm kind of excited to talk about this because this is my favorite thing about SICA. I'm a bit of a geek. Uh, because fundamentally, when we build systems, and James is there, and he's probably done, he, actually, we've done this together in a previous company, is you, you'll get your project managers, you'll get your developers, you'll get your testers, you'll get your database admins all together in a room, and you'll build a system. And then you'll go to your management, and you'll say, let's deploy the system, this is ready. And then they'll take all that, and you'll move off onto another project, and they'll give it to the security department, and they say, make this secure. And then the security department works out the roles in the database and who can do this and who can do that and who can do the next thing. And it increases the time. But the security guys either have to learn what you've all learned that you've discovered in your project, or they just follow, you know, or they do it any way, they, whatever sensible way they want to do it. But the best people to make that decision are the people building the process. If we can get the people building the process to do it, then we're cutting out this time, we're cutting out this, this separation, and at the same point of saying we're going to do this, you can agree the contract, the process, we see the process as a contract. So uh, we'll, I'll show you the, the, I've got a video of SICA and ex, design and execute, and I'll show you this uh, next, actually. Oh no, this is the architecture, sorry. Uh, we're totally cloud-based, we, we think this is the way forward, you can, you know, we have the SICA designer identity. Again, that's all provided, you know, you provide your identity, you provide your cloud. And in here, we've got wallet access, transactions. We can connect other blockchains if you've already got a blockchain platform. One of the things I should say is, everything we do, uh, all our keys are kept away from the users. One of the big problems with Bitcoin, I know James is gonna cover this in more detail, but most Bitcoin wallets are, are compromised when people steal the keys. And as Bill Buchanan quite often says, if you follow him on Twitter, it takes more energy to boil the oceans than break a 256 key. Uh, so we don't give users keys. We don't let them see it. We just keep them all. We just generate them, use them. Nobody sees them because you can't lose what you don't have. Uh, and then our storage is Mongo. Uh, yeah. So demo. Let's see if this works because I've got it. Okay, play. Play, play. Welcome to the SICA demo. Oh, no, let's turn off the voice. In oil and gas supply chain. This process involves. Sorry. Uh, so, yeah, there's just this. This was copied from a podcast because I'm too lazy to make my own demos, obviously. Uh, so, again, with the SICA. Designer, we use a, a IDP, so we're really seeing the process designer come in here and log in. And the process designer group, I should say, is a process designer group is a group of individuals identified within the cross organizational boundaries. Yeah, they are your business analysts. That's who we see it. They're, they've come together, they understand the process you're wanting to build, and it's their job to build this process and then publish it, and then it's there. Um, so here we see the person editing a, a process. They put in a title, that's all sort of basics. Uh, then they pick the actors, and these, these actors are different groups within the different organizations, okay? So operator may well be a group within, this is oil and gas, so operator would be a group within the company requesting the part to be manufactured. The tier one manufacturing is probably the big manufacturing partner they have. Tier two subcontractors is who they subcontract it off. And Assurer would be somebody like Lloyd's Register who's interested in assurance, who's interested in that part is safe to go on the oil rig or to go in the North Sea or do whatever, okay? So we pick actors and then we generate a series of steps. And each step is what the actor, each actor will execute as they go. Uh, 
And because it's a workflow builder, we've got things like date fields, we've got number fields, we've got document uploads, we've got all these different types, multi-options, whatever. Uh, and these are represented as you execute the process. Uh, this, this is all very sort of human-based, but I would say you can also, you know, this is completely driven by API. If you want, you can have an application, be a member of a wallet, and it can log in and do this. Because the idea is what we want to get to is where IoT devices can write directly to our uh, storage. Uh, and then we go on. I, I'm actually only really interested in showing you the permissioning bit because I think that's where it kind of comes into its own. Uh, come on. And we're looking at the processes. Here we go. Come on. Yep, we'll get there. Okay, the permissioning, right? So when these, because this is a transaction, blockchain started as a, a transaction-based system and, and we've implemented the transaction-based system. So when the operator who is completing step release IPO and ITP populates this data, they're sending a transaction to the next actor, okay? But instead of set, now that's not very secure because the next actor is getting all the data. So what we do is when we create that payload, that transaction body payload, we take everything that all the other actors are needing and we encrypt it with their public key. So they're, they're the only people that can decrypt it. So although the data is getting passed into the storage layer and everyone's getting it, unless you have the public key, the private key of the wallet that we've sent it to, you can't decrypt it. Okay? So straight away, the data is getting passed around, but unless you have the right private keys, you can't decrypt it. And the private keys are all kept within each, each other's organization, okay? So a private key never leaves an organization. Public keys get transferred, but you need to do that. So, and this is where we see the permissioning adding up. And the other thing I'll, I'll quickly say is, as default, everything we put into a second process is encrypted. Nothing is unencrypted. Everything is completely encrypted with the receiver's private key, uh, the receiver's public key. The only difference is, if you want to make data public after, you can then decide to make it public after, but not before. So it's secure by default, it's encrypted by default, but it seems to be a much secure way of building a system and then wondering what you should do with protection. Do protection first. Um, and, yep, and then we're gonna quickly go through the execution and you'll see, you'll see the next bit. So here we go to the executor and the operator or the operator the user logs in uh, and they start the process and they fill out the data. And again, that refers back to what we said the step one was. And because step one doesn't receive data, they don't have any, tier one comes in and they execute. And we'll have a look. And that's the data that they expected to put in as part of the step. But according to the, oh, I've missed it. According to, I'll show it next time. According to the permissions, they receive other bits of data, but they can't change it. They are not allowed to change the data once it's on the chain. If they want to change it, they have to reject the workflow. It has to go back to the original person, and they can update the data, but nobody else can. So this is step three, and you can see that step three needed the PO details, the description of work done, number to just date complete and PO date. And the whole idea is that you only get given the data you need to do your bit. So your tax surface is reduced. Instead of, with the Disclosure Scotland form, getting everything and saving it all because you don't know what else to do and you might need it in the future. If you don't get data, you, you know, if you only get public data or, or certain bits of information, then you get breached. Okay, you breached your data store. That's horrible. Nobody wants that. But it's encrypted. And the only data that you're exposed straight away is the public data. That should be non-sensitive straight away. That should be information that nobody cares about. Yeah, okay, nobody wants people to know your PO number or, you know, whatever. But this should be non-sensitive. And this is how we have to start looking at data. We can't just put data into a bucket and create lots of roles for all the responsible people. And then when the hackers come to get it all and are not responsible, we have to put data straight away into a format which is fundamentally secure. So that it's more hassle for the hackers to hack that data, get that data, and then realize, oh, right, we have to start decrypting it. So every single bit of data also has to have a different key in case they've managed to access one of your keys. They should only ever be able to access one bit of data. So we always have to be thinking, how do we put data beyond you straight away? 
So if it is breached or when it's breached, it's not the end of the world for us. It's not an experienced situation where they're, you know, scrabbling around desperately trying to, you know, explain themselves. It's, yeah, okay, we got breached. But nobody's reading the data, you know. Uh, and this goes on and on and on, and, you know. And this is how we see processes completed. Uh, there's a couple other things that I sort of talked about at the beginning, which was the black boxness of the black boxness of processes, and that if you use multi-organisation systems, there's very little you can do to track them. You know, you can call. So what we've already done here is the applicant, and because it's a ledger-based technology or registry-based technology. We can see all these transactions. We can't see what's happening, but we have access to them all. So we can't see the contents, but we can quite happily grab, grab some metadata and then start reporting as it goes on. And one of the nice things also is because every transaction is written with a, a timestamp, we can start tracking completion, which means if you're sitting there waiting for a PVG check or you're sitting there waiting for a part to be manufactured or you're sitting there waiting, you can come online and you can see where it is. And if it says step three takes seven days and it's only day three, there's no point phoning them and shouting at them and saying, give me, your, give me now, because you know it takes seven days. If it's day 10, that's the point. Because a lot of time, especially in the public sector and organisations, we spend trying to deal with people's processes because they do not have visibility. That's a lot of time we have to waste saying people... I mean, everyone's called up the bank, everyone's called up the council and said, I've done this thing where as a result of thing... And, you know, you spend half an hour on the phone getting past pillar to post and nobody really knows because they're all different subsystems. The other thing you can do, and this is where public data comes into it, I think, is because everything is encrypted, it is fundamentally unsearchable at this stage. We think that is far more valuable than just allowing people to search anything. So if you make public data, yeah, what you can do is you can search it because it's public. So you can be searching for your PO numbers. This isn't sensitive information. This should be public. Anyone should be able to see it and not care. That's what we say is public. Everything that is beyond that level is sensitive. So, you know, and my, my rule of thumb is really simple. If it was data about me, would I want everyone to know about it? So that's our level. That's how we define public data. Uh, now, because it's a transaction-based system, we do have the ability to build transaction viewers. Um, and this is just, this kind of looks like a blockchain transaction viewer if anyone's looked at sort of Bitcoin or whatever. We've got, you can go back in time, you can go forward in time, you can see the sender receiver. We've got some transaction metadata. And what we can see here is that, again, this is public. Anyone can see this bit of it. Uh, and again, we've logged in as Karina, who did the video. We've got the metadata. Again, it's just tracking information. We've got the public fields because anyone can see that. And then we get to the important bit, which is the private payloads. And as you can see, Karina is not a member of any wallet. So, she, so when she tries to decrypt it, she just gets the raw data. She doesn't have the keys to decrypt this data. So even though Karina's sitting in an organization, she can't see any of the sensitive information. And even if she was the IT administrator, and even if she had all the passwords to all the Oracle databases, if that organization never got sent that bit of data, even if they take it all and dump it in an Oracle data, or dump it in an SQL light database, they don't have access to it because it's encrypted. If you don't give somebody something, they can't get hacked. They can't, get, they can't lose it. So we, we're wanting to work on at least information privilege. The less you need to do your job, the better. Yeah? Uh, and that's it. So that's the end of the video. Um, I'm slightly over time, so I'll just quickly cover these. Uh, We've got a few use cases we're working on. We're working on a Scottish renewables, uh, power renewables for replacing wind, uh, old wind farms. The old wind farms that they put up at the early 20th century are all kind of old. Uh, but the problem is you can't pull these wind farms down because then you lose all the carbon that you've saved. So they're constantly trying to repair, the, repair them. So they have, Scottish Power has a deal, uh, has, you know, they're setting up this shared DLT uh, between. Scottish Power, uh, the field engineers, and you know the different or the different sort of subcontractors they use to do it. Because again, even Scottish Power, they can't in enforce this. They don't have an appropriate system, so they can't enforce a system. Uh, other quick process. I'm just coming to the end. Food and um, 
Yeah, food. Uh, anyone who's read anything about blockchain, you can see the huge amount in the food industry. We've got a couple of processes going with some partners. Uh, again, public sector, I've talked a bit about that. And finally, the oil and gas, as you can see it. And they all kind of look the same because fundamentally, whenever organisations come together to create shared processes, they have the same issues. And we have to kind of be dealing with them. And a lot of the issues is how do they create a shared, a shared data set that they can come into without compromising their internal organisational structures. Uh, oh, final, final slide, I promise. Uh, I'd say wallet services guiding principles are encryption should be the first and not the last line of defence. If we encrypt first and be sensible with our encryption, then actually breaches become far less concerning because even if we get breached, nobody can read the data. All data should be treated as confidential unless it's explicitly declared public. I think that model's kind of slowly changing. We're moving that way. Uh, data should be shared on the least information if basis. If people don't need it, don't give them it. If you don't need it, don't get it. And again, specifically with keys, you can't lose what you don't have. Uh, so that's it. Thank you very much. OK, thank you very much indeed. Um, we're now going to be um, listening to James Cran uh, from, from Lloyd's, who's going to talk about key challenges in the cyber landscape and the new model. OK. OK, okay thanks very much. Thanks. OK. Um, so. Yeah, it should be. Okay, sorry about that. Um, okay, well, thanks, uh, Adrian. Uh, thanks, Stuart, for your talk. Uh, so I'll get, get started. So first up, these are my views. Uh, not nothing to do with my uh, employer. Um, so what did I put the Highland Cows on? Well, I put the Highland Cows on because lots of companies treat their users like cows. They herd them, they try and direct them, but they don't actually empower them to do what they need to do. So, you know, we do compliance, we do training, and we kind of get herded through like cows. Aren't they beautiful? Isn't Scotland a wonderful country? Um, so, chat and house rules, if you want to say anything, obviously. So, this is the agenda. We're going to talk about challenges, talk about wanna cry, situation awareness, how to fight back, and a weak inclusion. So, Ransomware, let's start at the beginning. Ransomware's been around for a long time. It's been around, coined in 1996, as crypto virology. So the concept has been around for a long, long time, although obviously sometimes you read in the news, you'd think, oh, it's a, it's a new thing. It's only just, just appeared, but it's been around for a long time. So what, what's, the, what's the problem we're facing in, in most cases? Well, we're facing this issue here um, that basically... We're getting a, a phishing email. So in comes a, a classic invoice or a bill. It could be anything. Um, may contain a bit of JavaScript. And typically, the user will open this because, again, they've been treated like cows. They've not been empowered to actually think sometimes. And they're, they're following along, and, they just, and, and then they get infected. And it could be um, an online banking trojan. It could be dry It could be anything. Um, so that, that, this is still an issue. And at the root cause of this, is that basically people are curious. We're all humans, and we're not really trained to sort of eyeball every email coming in. Imagine you're sitting in your company, and you're getting 200 emails a day, 400 emails a day. Are you going to be able to eyeball every email? Probably not. So it's an issue. Then we got the ransomware issue. And, and ransomware, this is, um, Eamon's familiar with this. Um, I'm sure he's seen it several times. We sit, you come in and, you, you, you know, there's a, there's a customer service aspect to this. There's a bit of psychology going on. They've told you your, your computer's in, encrypted. How can you recover your files? What can you do? And how do you pay? And typically, it's a Bitcoin and Bitcoin wallets. Um, hopefully not in Stuart's system, the Bitcoin wallets, but, um, but you've got wallets in your system. Uh, so, yeah, so, so, we, so we proceed. And then, so this is it. This is how they get you. So... Firstly, they talk about time criticality. You have to pay me within 24 hours or you're going to lose all your data. The consequences action, second part. Customer service approach, 
You don't know how to get Bitcoins? We could ask Stuart. But you, they'll give you a helpline where you can get, find out how to get Bitcoins, how to pay them. So it's all very, very nice. And authoritative imagery. Sometimes they put up pictures of the FBI, uh, Met Police, Scottish Police, and say, you know. And then finally, BTC Bitcoins. That's how they ask you to pay. They ask you to pay in Bitcoins. So it's a, it's a bit of a psychological trick in the same way that phishing is. So a lot of this interaction with a computer is designed for, not really designed for humans, so people make mistakes is where I'm coming from. And then if we look at the underground, uh, this is from 2017, so a few years ago, but we see how effective ransomware has been because one of the top selling items on the underground marketplace is ransomware. Your credit cards, 30 cents, 50 cents, nothing, you know, cash out services, uh, they give you a percentage of the cash out. So a lot of things are available, but ransomware toolkit there, $1,800, so worth a lot of money. And uh, you can make profit as a criminal if you were that way inclined, if you were heading that direction. So if we look at um, what's happening um, from the internet, IOCTA report 2018, we see that We've seen a lot more ransomware hitting, and uh, there's been a big takedown by uh, EC3, Europol, um, and the Dutch National High Tech uh, have been taking action against these sorts of things. Um, but we're still, we, we still saw a lot of ransomware happening recently. Big, app, big event was uh, Maersk. Maersk had to reinstall 45,000 PCs, 4,000 servers, and they were out of action for approximately, I don't know, two weeks or something. Well, they had to do everything manually because they had no computing capability. But there was a positive. The CEO saw this as a good side of the incident because it really kind of it was an important wake-up call. I think that the challenge for everyone is that you don't want to have to be a mess. You don't want to wait for the wake-up call. You want to get your defenses in before that happens if you can. Uh, and that's, that's really um, what, what you need to focus on as, as, as um, cyber people. Then we look, let's look at WannaCry. So WannaCry, Microsoft released the patch in roughly about March 2017. We then saw the Shadow Broker leak um, where some of the kits were used, and then WannaCry hit using some of the Shadow Broker kit. Um, and we, the, the really interesting thing is that this was, a, this was a global problem, right? So WannaCry hit across the whole globe. It wasn't just a UK problem. Uh, obviously, it did hit the UK, Scotland, and the and, uh, United Kingdom. But it's, it shows how something like a piece of ransomware can be incredibly disruptive if it's let loose on the, on the internet. And so it is a major threat. And uh, kind of last year, 2018, we were still seeing 75,000 victims of WannaCry across the world. So it's still people haven't patched, they haven't blocked things. So it just goes to show it's, it's, it's a real challenge to... From a, from a defensive perspective, if people aren't taking any action, it's really hard to defend. And then just recently, uh, this year, we had the North Kydro attack. Um, looked like it was destructive malware uh, attack at North Kydro. Um, Norwegian aluminium company, Hydro, was struck. Uh, and again, another example of um, ransomware, destructive uh, malware hitting a company and causing them serious losses. So it is, this is an ongoing problem. Ransomware cannot be underestimated. Now we're coming on to Stuart's uh, talking about cryptocurrency miners. So, so crypto jacking is a new thing. So as we've transitioned from ransomware to uh, crypto mining, what, so why are we going to crypto mining? Well, because I no longer have to ask you to pay bitcoins. I'm just going to use your computer for free. And I'm going to mine bitcoins. So I'm going to make profit that way. So for the from a criminal perspective, this is an easier win because I don't have to do anything um, like ask you to pay bitcoins. It's a very straightforward, I'm just going to use your computer and it'll be fine. Yeah, don't worry about it. It might get a bit hot, but you know, I'm, I'll make some bitcoins out of it. And then, then we look at the other, other issues. We're seeing financial malware. This is an example of Carbonac Cobalt, um, where again, it's the same attack vector. There's spear phishing email coming in. Um, the uh, the user, oops, oops, sorry, the user um, again clicks on it, infects a number of machines, and then there's the kind of the cash out, so money transfer, um, inflating balance accounts, and controlling ATMs, different attack vectors that they use to cash things out from. So, and then uh, we had had this from the uh, IOPTA report last year, so. 
DDoS. DDoS is an issue. It can take down um, services, obviously. And it, as we become much more internet focused and, and service dependent, we're completely dependent on cloud services um, and different applications now. So if we if we can if the criminals can attack a service, then potentially they can take down um, industry, the business, and, and cause issues. So this is an example where. Uh, the stressor site, which is basically a stressor site, basically is used to as a DDoS tool, distributed denial of service, and in this case, they were able to take it down uh, using combined efforts of law enforcement. So, a great, great effort from law enforcement there. And then if we kind of go forward in time, where is everything going? So everything, and Stuart probably testified to this, everybody's going to their phone, right? Everything's going to be on the phone. Everything's going to be an application. You may have APIs, but everything's going to be an application. So we're going to have everything, probably our health records, everything from the phone will be accessible, right? So we absolutely need encryption, uh, security of the data, and we need to be able to defend this. Because if we look at, look at mobile malware, it, it's an evolving topic. And I think as we go forward in time in the future when we've well, well, you may even have printed circuit boards on your, on your arm, but let's, let's, let's assume that's not the case. Let's assume we've still got devices. Then this is where it's going to go, because everybody wants to do everything conveniently, quickly, from their phone, with no bother, right? And then it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be complete talking about issues if we weren't talking about card not present fraud, where basically people are stealing money using instant payments where they don't actually need to have the card present. So... Again, a, still an issue reported by Okta 2018 uh, report. And then, of course, we come on to my favorite topic, cryptocurrency. So what's happening in cryptocurrency? So we're seeing hacks on exchanges. We've seen lots of attempts to steal money directly from exchanges. Um, phishing people for their account details. Uh, of course, we've already talked about crypto mining. Ransomware payments we've already talked about and then information stealing malware. So lots of attack vectors on cryptocurrency and why, well, we all know the price has just gone up again. So it's worth it from a criminal's perspective to attack this. But it shows, again, how we need to build security into these cryptocurrencies or a distributed ledger te technologies. It's absolutely fundamental. It has to be in there from, from the ground up, from the very beginning. Um, otherwise, uh, you know, we can't rely on the old models to defend. So this, this, is, um, this is showing cryptocurrency use. And the reason I'm, I put this up here is because we saw the peak at 2017, and then it dropped off to 603 in 2018. This is, this is money going to the, uh, the dark markets. The reason I put it up there is because in, in, in 2017, we, we saw the law enforcement have their Hansa market take down. So that really successful piece of work, and you can show they had a direct effect. But they didn't completely kill the market, as you can see, um, but they have made a... $100, $100 million impact on, on the criminal uh, funds. But of course, the danger is this, this could recover, so we can't be complacent in, in any way. So where's the, where's the money going? So if, we, if we're trying to create a new security environment like Stuart talked about, or a new approach, we need to look at where the money's going. So we see money going in lots of different places here. We see money going for illicit online markets, trade secret, intellectual property theft, data trading, which is just cards. Um, and then ransomware was a billion, billion, pound, billion dollars there. So lots of losses happening. And this is really where security comes to its own. This is where it should be defending these key losses. Because if you think about it, what's the point in security unless it's helping the business succeed? It's not helping the business succeed. It isn't actually doing its job. So I think every business needs to look at what value do they have, what's their crown jewels, and what can they do about it to protect it. So if you've got intellectual property theft, you could protect it potentially with a distributed log, um, ledger technology, encrypt it. But I think it's, it's fundamentally, as Stuart said, we need to protect the data. We need to protect the things of value for each organization. That may be intellectual property. That could be film copyright. That could be music pirating. That could be anything which your company holds of value, basically. So what's the problem? Well, I think it's a, the, the key issue for uh, at the human level, going back to the human level, is paying attention. What's happening? If you're not paying attention, um, how do you know there's an issue? So let's give a, let's a concrete example. You could get somebody coming into your, your company, 
standing in the public space, and does anybody question why they're there? What's that person doing there? So good security is about looking for changes in the baseline, so what you, what you expect to happen, and then reacting to it. And that's not just walking by whistling like this guy, it's actually paying attention and actually noticing what's happening. Because if you're unable to defend even your basic public spaces, you're potentially creating a security risk. Now, you might go to, so, well, so Stuart may have his private keys in his building, but if I can get into that building, I can potentially steal those private keys. So this is about the basics, people being observant about what's going on around them and not just walking past. And then when you see an anomaly, um, we tend to sort of want to ignore things because I see an anomaly, I'll just put my fingers in my ear and I'll ignore it, basically, because I don't want to get involved. Um, but again, this, so when, the moment you see an anomaly, you need to train your users to be able to challenge. So if I see this man here walking into my building and I don't recognize him, I should be able to feel fully empowered to challenge him and get him out of the building if I want to. This is about empowering the users and being aware of what's happening. Okay? Um, if you're unable to do that, if your users aren't trained and they're treated like cows, as I showed the cow picture earlier, then maybe they don't, have the, they don't feel empowered to challenge. But it, this, is, this fundamental of physical security is most important because it doesn't matter how much tech you've got in the, in the room to defend yourself. If I can walk into the front door and I can get into the building and I can plug in a USB and, and steal data, then, well, great, I've just got your uh, secure key. I've just got your private keys because you left them on a server sitting in a network because you thought you were secure. Um, so I think, I think this is a real important thing to get this communication and training through to users so they really understand. Um, when they see an anomaly, they do something about it. They need to be empowered. Uh, I've got a good example of a red team test, well, social engineering test that somebody told me about the other day. Guy came in, and imagine this is just a, a, a charger cable. So he went into, he went into the room, and he, and he said to guy, guys, I just want to test your computers with this charger cable to see if it, the mobile will connect and charge okay. Is that okay? So he plugged in the, the charging cable on its own without a phone into the computer, and he had a little switch in his pocket and some malware sitting on the, on the, on the thing. And he pressed the button, and it up on the user screen popped the successful test and a big smiley face. So the users just quite happily let this guy plug in a, a standard mobile charging um, item, uh, cable, and the next thing he did, he simply pressed a button and up popped the screen. So he did that successfully with 12 users in the company and nobody challenged him. Nobody thought, isn't that a bit strange that he hasn't connected the phone to the, user, to the uh, charging cable? He's just press, he's pressing a button in front of me explicitly saying, okay, let's do it. So this is another example where the users need to be empowered to challenge and think about strange stuff happening and anomalies. If an anomaly is happening, they need to be able to challenge it. They can't be allowed to fall, fall under the weight of believing that it's all, everything's okay and, and everyone trusts. We, we, we're fighting a human nature. We're, we're struggling, of course, because we all want to help people. We want to be really helpful, but we just need to maybe be a bit more empowered, a bit more challenging, and make the users not, not the cows, but maybe the bulls, and actually challenge people more. Situation awareness, again, young lady here. The mobile phone is probably the curse of the modern society. Everybody's constantly on their phone. I see it every day on the train. Everybody's looking at their phone, obsessed with their phone. People, some people in the audience may be looking at their phone right now. Um, and it's a complete loss of context and awareness. So, good example here. So, we've got the, the, the lethal combination, I call it, where people are looking at their phone and they've got their earphones plugged in as well and they're walking in a dark space. Now, really, it's probably a suboptimal plan. I think you need to be looking around you and being aware of your situation. The context, is it a risk? And it's not just about... So this is, a physical, this is a physical risk, which we tend to ignore, but you can translate this into the cyber risk as well. So if we look at a, a cyber situation awareness program, then maybe you're processing something and you're really busy and you're trying to do five or six things at the same time. You're looking at your phone, you're doing this, you're taking a phone call, you're, somebody's speaking to you, but then you're on your computer and you click that link because you're doing so many things, your 
cognitively, cognitively overloaded. So I think you can apply this awareness to physical situations as well as to cyber situations. And you need to deal with that. And it's all about empowering the users. The users need to be able to, need to be alert and aware to what's going on around them. And they need to be able to say to somebody, no, I don't want you taking my picture. I don't want this happening. Whatever it is, right? They need to be able to say the right thing because um, without that inner strength and that ability to challenge people, then they'll just be the normal passive selves and they'll just accept whatever's happening around them. But I think that's, that's the real message here is we need to empower our users and say, no, I'm not prepared to accept it. I'm not prepared to share my data with you just because I want to get an insurance policy with you or whatever it is, okay? So I need to, I need to understand that. And as, as a kind of my favorite, in breaches, breaches everywhere, it shows that you know, we're basically failing in security industry. We're not really securing stuff well enough. We've got so much data getting lost. And why is this data, why is this data not controlled better? Why do we not have things in place to control people's personal data and prevent this thing happening? Well, Stuart may have a solution with his company. My view is that we should be looking at a brand new way of thinking. So I think, I think we need to be thinking about um, having our data, but having it secured in our own wallet. And if I want to do a contract with Stuart or whoever, then I should be able to lend only a key which accesses the data you require for that service. And in fact, what I'd, I'd actually prefer to do is I'd actually prefer to use uh, a processing algorithm which doesn't allow you access to the data, but actually processes the data, and only the algorithm can see the data. So I'd actually like to see this situation. But one step further, I'd actually like to see users fully empowered so that when I've got my wallet with all my data, my medical data all in it, I actually get paid for sharing it with you So for you to allow your algorithm to run it. So when your algorithm runs it, you give me a small, small fee. So I sit here and I actually earn money from my data as opposed to this passive situation where currently I just hand data over to you and you don't even pay me, right? So I think we need to move to a new model where we have tokens, we have data, but we actually only allow people to access that data if they're prepared to pay you for your data. So it's a complete inversion of existing models. You can still do all the assurance that you currently have. It's just a different model. So instead of me handing my data off randomly to any company that decides they, they need it because they need for whatever reason. If they want to do it, they can do it, but they don't actually get my data. They just get an out, they just they have an algorithm which processes the data and um, then gives them a result. So they can, so Disclosure Scotland, Stuart, in your case, you wouldn't hand over your personal data. You'd hand over um, a wallet, a key to your wallet, which only the algorithm would process and then Police Scotland would get an output saying, yes or no, is this person okay? So you wouldn't actually ever lose your data. It would never lose your, leave your wallet. The only thing it would see it would be the algorithm. So just an idea. Um, and I think we need, to, we, need to, we need to sort of empower ourselves. It's again, my whole theme here is about empowering users, but empowering users to control their data as well, not just their security environment, but their data. So can we empower our citizens to have control of our data? Um, that's really where I'm kind of coming to towards the end. Um, so coming towards the end, prevention is better than a cure. You need to be situationally aware of what's going on both in the cyber and the real world. I can't emphasize this enough. A lot of the education on cyber is based around sitting in front of the computer, but actually we need to look at holistically at the problem. So look at the real world. Obviously keep everything patched, and the reason for that is one cry, really, is self-evident. Keep your staff educated, but not just educated, but empowered. Empower them to act, to challenge people. Uh, keep your systems backed up, ideally in a blockchain, secure blockchain, <laughs> just said. Uh, and uh, I think we need, need to think about new business models for data and security. How can we empower our users to secure their data, share it in a way that doesn't put them at any risk. So all these breaches happen to these companies. It doesn't affect me because guess what? They didn't have my data. They just processed it. And then my final point, network segmentation file. The basics, really the basics of security need to be implemented all the time. Because a lot of the time, it's just the basics that people make mistakes on and that's why we see failures. 
we look at the old West top 10, it hasn't changed in 15 years substantially. There's still the same errors. We're not actually solving application security issues. And as unfortunately, as we head towards the potentially the app economy, as Gartner calls it, in the future, then everything's going to be an app. So if we can't secure the apps, you know, we're not really doing anybody any service. So we need to be thinking about these new models of securing data. And as I say, the app economy, the API economy, whatever you want to call it, whichever one you use, you need to be able to secure it appropriately. Now, if that requires segmentation and firewalling, that's an old technique, I know. But translate it into the modern world of securing, putting your protection around the data. Uh, and I think that's the, the recipe for success. So with that, I'm done. Thank you. Thank you very much, James. Uh, fantastic. So last, but by no means least, uh, one of our favourite presenters. Um, we have oh, Emma Keane. Yeah, yeah, I'll get it done. Who will sorry. present, let's make the mask of cybercrime. Yeah, let's take the mask of cybercrime. Good afternoon, everybody. How are we? It's getting near sleepy time. <laughs> James and I did not collude in our presentations um, in any way, shape, or form, um, but uh, um, you'll see some similarities and parallels as we go through them. Um, and uh, that's me up there, Detective Inspector Raymond Keane, being uh, responsible for the management of cyber investigations, digital for forensic investigations in Scotland for Police Scotland for the last number of years, and also for national cybercrime investigations. Um, so that involved a certain going to the likes of Shetland in Yale to arrest uh, Jake Davis as part of the anonymous intrusion, uh, right through to some of the present day challenges we have around paedophilia and all sorts of things. So I was kind of thinking in regards to taking the mask of cybersecurity and what we were going to speak about today in regards to um, will we give you the generic threat landscape? Will we talk about something specific in an academic review? Um, I was going to talk about a recent coursework paper I submitted as part of my MSc. I'm doing at uh, Edinburgh Napier on web application attacks and uh, talking about, uh, James just mentioned the OWASP top 10 and has there been any recent changes? Actually, just did a paper on external, sorry, external entities and um, no, that's boring. I'm not really comfortable with that. That's highly technical and you'll all be asleep. So I want to talk about Scotland. And I want to talk about, I've been part of the cyber security scene for the last 10 years with Edinburgh Napier and the Scottish Business Resilience Centre, Scottish Government, Scotland IS. And I wanted to talk about some of the good things that are going on. Um, you know, um, can Scotland be a world leader in cyber security? And some of the traction we're getting at the moment and the international look-in is quite significant. You'll hear the Irish accent and sometimes actually I give out to the Scots in regards to we're not very good at promoting what's good in Scotland. So over the next 15 minutes, I'm just going to whiz through some of the activity we have on a national scale in regards to uh, protecting this landscape that we're spoken about. So I'm currently on secondment to the Scottish business resilience. Resilience is the word, really. And, and you know, James spoke about prevention. Uh, Stuart Wallet Services, protecting key data. Data is the new oil. But let's go back to basics. So. Um, I'm in charge of cyber services within, Scot within the SBRC, head of cyber, and, and we supply the other, um, the other areas of business that makes us an attractive model that has been looked at overseas. Has the landscape changed much in the last five years, ten years? For me, at the coalface of investigations, working with the various law enforcement international institutions, I don't think so. The NCA we work very closely with, and that's their recent cyber threat to UK business. Um, the NCA National Strategic Assessment last, only produced in the last two weeks, and there's one from industry for Symantec. James mentioned the IOCTA one. And the goalposts haven't changed much in regards to who's out there and who's doing what. And for me, you know, I use that slide, the usual suspects, but social engineering, hacking, ransomware, James spoke extensively about phishing and malware. And, and it hasn't really changed much. And that's um, what's been reported to law enforcement within the UK. What concerns me more is what's not been reported, and that's a challenge for us in trying to encourage other people, more people in regards to reporting cybercrime. And, and on the issue of non-reporting, people, I do fully accept, accept the argument in regards to 
if that's an international crime gang from another jurisdiction launching some botnetted activity through some bulletproof hosting services, what chances have PC Plot of, 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 of uh, catching and identifying those individuals? And I'll show you some of the examples of some of the more proactive and aggressive initiatives that we're using in regards to honeypot, sucking the badness out of the internet and, ta and targeting international crime gangs. Make no mistake about it, this is where it's going to go. Um, data is the new oil. Acquisitive crime, 54% of acquisitive crime is now committed online and that will continue to grow. Um, and what are we doing in Scotland about it? And, and some of the issues highlighted earlier on, this was a classic in regards to Maersk, um, WannaCry, formed out of Eternal Blue, something that's been around for years, seen eight years ago, nine years ago in the Banking Trojan um, configure. Um, so it's, it's these this horrible pieces of malware re, kind of reinventing themselves. Um, Maersk and, and non-Petia, was it of unintended consequences? And I think that's the vulnerability. And, you know, James spoke about 45,000 machines. It's not like that we can go back down to PC World and just buy 45 boxes, 45,000 boxes. You know, it was, it was a huge, huge hit for Maersk. Could that happen in Scotland? Yes. Absolutely. And what about our critical, critical national infrastructure? How safe are we there? How safe are we with the Internet of Things when lots of our silvery stuff that's been produced has that default password? Password. So, you know, back to basics for me. And what we're seeing at the moment is, uh, is okay, there's a little bit of technical uh, competence around um, the, the construction of the email. Okay, um, spoofing the email header, spoofing the website address, but business email compromise is on the rise. And we have organized criminality looking at you. If you're a key position within an organization, they are looking at your LinkedIn profile. They're looking at your Facebook profile. They're looking at your digital footprint. They're harvesting that data for that Friday afternoon attack when they will try and send some email that they may have identified through your topology, the content of that email. And this is some of the, uh, the kind of the lecture inputs we give to businesses. So moving on, and then I suppose we've spoken about critical national infrastructure. I've spoken about, um, I've spoken about social media abuse. I've spoken about acquisitive crime. But is it a case that uh, nation states are influencing how we vote? Yes, from the audience. Uh, is it my, well actually, these, these, the views I speak about today are my own. But yes, this is kind of scary that if there's a nation state influence in regards to uh, how we elect the most powerful man in the world. Um, you know, how bad is the North Korean threat? Um, was uh, the UK exposes Russian cyber attacks as, as responsible for the likes of non petia Is this happening? Yeah. Um, again, I'll let you make your mind up about that. This is the chief exec of a close organization. We work with the National Cyber Security Center, and he's speaking about it's a matter of when, not if. So will we see the likes of non petia and WannaCry? And people always sometimes say to me, ah, oh, Eamon, Scotland. James put the lovely picture of the Highland Coos. Sleepy Scotland, gorgeous, come see the land of the brave. Um, but yes, it's very much active in our back door. This was an, a, a little operation we were involved in with our, with our Croatian colleagues in regards to two very uh, innovative young men selling stressor tools in a, in a dark web environment. Quite ingenious, but a 24 seven backup service if it didn't work, but uh, that was in, in Glasgow. So we're gonna see more of that in regards to what's happening in our streets. Um, and, and no doubt about it, in regards to organized crime. The organized crime gangs now see that it, this is more lucrative in regards to if we're sending out hundreds of thousands of emails, um, the chances of getting some criminal gain from that is much more prevalent, much more lucrative than the importation of kilo, multi-kilo amounts of class A drugs. So I think we will see a major seismic shift in regards to this type of crime. And are we prepared for it? So this is in regards to the good things that are going on in Scotland, in regards to um, have we, are we a centre of excellence? Can we be a centre of excellence? And my argument will be yes. And if we create the right atmosphere in Scotland in regards to innovation, technology, and wallet service is an example of that, and, and, and fintech and others, that we can attract some of the big guns in regards to. I think the top 10 companies in the world now are in the technology centre, sector, sorry. So if we're creating that atmosphere in Scotland, yes, we can attract them. Um, 
And it's, again, I suppose Kate Forbes spoke about this this morning, and I will compliment the Scottish Government in regards to the action plans. Um, they are great tool toolkits for, for going forward. One particularly close to my own heart is the Learning and Skills Action Plan and the work we do there. This is a kind of a wee map of Scotland in regards to some of the activities we have. And, and again, a little bit more of a federated approach in regards to not operating in silos. Together we are stronger. And that's my challenge out to each of you out there in regards to your sector. How involved are you? How often do you look outside your own sector in regards to cybersecurity? Um, we've got the uh, Tay Cities deal coming up in Dundee, the urban regeneration there, um, 12 million in regards to cyber to build cyber uh, associated industry, sorry, companies. We've got the Glasgow FinTech Hub and the Halo Project on the west, and we've got the Edinburgh Cities deal. Uh, we're over here in Police Scotland, the Scottish Crime Campus, and we're also linked into London. And, um, we've just established our depot at, at Linithco, at the, or, at the Oracle, the old Sun Microsystems building. And of course, you know, um, I don't forget our rural cousins. Don't forget that 80% of our GDP is, is from a, a small, medium enterprise. So we need to look after um, the small man. Um, we've created the depot in regards to what we're trying to do there is, is, is to blend industry with law enforcement. And I can't emphasize in no other area of crime do we need to collaborate more. I think what worked for me from investigative teams where um, some have just walked into the office from, from um, a fantastic knowledge of how criminality is breaking into our systems, working alongside our investigators, working alongside our, our, um, our, our detectives, our, our investigators. In fact, I sometimes use the analogy incorrectly. Murder, rape and pillage are easy to investigate. What I mentioned earlier, earlier on in regards to that organized crime gang from that other jurisdiction that we have no contact with, we've no formal agreement with, they're the difficult ones. So in the depot, and I encourage you to become involved in regards to that, in how can I become involved, and I've mentioned the Tay Cities deal, um, we work very closely with our regional organized crime units across the country. Um, I've mentioned the NCSC, I've mentioned Europol, um, and some of the initiatives that were mentioned earlier on, and the Met and of course the FBI, who would have been here today, but I think they're tied up with some sort of a visit. <laughs> Wren went down a bomb, so it's the wrong word to use. Wren was very popular here last, at the, at the last. We're also, and this is for me in regards to uh, the Scottish Business Resilience Centre and the word resilience, we're also helping assist in building the Manchester Digital Centre, similarly in Yorkshire. Uh, we're also assisting in London and in Wales. And it strikes me funny in regards to why are Scotland, why is this model being looked upon as, as an excellent model across the country and even out to, into Copenhagen? So we're doing something right in Scotland. And this takes me back to, you know, should we be promoting Scotland the brand much better and how we collaborate together? And uh, that's an important one to me and can only be encouraged. Somebody said that was just like the inside of Eamon's brain. Um, again, it's just, uh, this is just one ecosystem with the police um, focusing on the Scottish Government. Um, Harry McLaren from ECS pr produced another one in regards to his area of business, which was a lot more uh, kind of private sector orientated. Where would you put your organisation within that uh, diagram? That's just a question to reflect on. And how am I integrating and how am I giving back and how am I assisting in keeping uh, Scotland safe from cyber security? Uh, recently, we had a great initiative with Scotland Cyber Week, um, culminating in, in the Cyber UK conference, at, and there was 5,000 people uh, a day through the campus event over in, in Glasgow. Again, some of the energy, that, that's some of the international attraction that's, that's, that, that's got how Scotland is being perceived. We're working closely with FinTech community in regards to a recent success, again, well over the 100 companies that are now up and running. We need to do more. We need to do more. Um, we need to make sure that we are assisting these young guys and girls that are coming out of our universities um, in creating really good and innovative ideas in regards to technology and engineering. Uh, we need to create that culture to, to support them, not only a proof of concept, but right through to, uh, to market. Um, and, and again, I suppose, in regards to providing investment opportunities for, for, um, for our, uh, our school leavers and our university graduates. This go, we, we see this a lot in regards to, well, you know, cyber skills shortage threatening the UK for 20 years. Um, and I think most industries do 
have a problem in regards to we're going to have a skills shortage. Why? I don't know the answer to that one, but what are we doing to, uh, in Scotland to collaborate and try and help with that? We work closely with the Scottish Informatics and Computer Alliance Society, of which Napier and Bill are very much a part of, the 16 universities. We've worked very closely with ENUSEC at Napier University, a really thriving hackathon community, hackathon, hacking community, um, and again, for my sins, the Cyber Academy. Adrian, when did we go to Europe for some Horizon funding under the DFET project? A while ago, so we have created a cloud-based environment for students to learn their craft, and Police Scotland was very much a benefit of that one. Um, and this is part of the challenge for, uh, for this industry in regards to mapping out an accredited career pathway, and some of the work we're doing with Skills Development Scotland. And if this is working properly, if we talk about you know, the growth and the extent of jobs within the cyber industry in regards to networking, software development, system engineering, financial and risk analysis, and security intelligence. Holy, and we, I do facilitate a lot of meetings in regards to sharing of intelligence. But it was mentioned earlier on, the most important thing is, why do we do what we do? We have a two-day conference here on big data, and we mention security, security, security. We mention law enforcement, we mention repelling that attack, but why do we do what we do? And sometimes I think we cluster with all sorts of um, complications and sophistications, but it's to keep the business going. It has to be aligned to your business risk. It has to be proportionate. And this is an area that absolutely, I think, is, is, is growing for us in regards to instant response and aligning, making money in regards to doing what we do. Now, of course, it's not all about commercial gain. Of course, it's about providing that pro prosperity and wealth. But these are some of the range of, 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 of pathways that are coming, and this is just one I picked in regards to networking and the growing extent of, of occupations and potential careers in here. And this is something we're doing with SDS. And I think for young students, if you're in that environment at the moment, the future is fantastic. In regards to, I think it's a really, really vibrant sector with so many opportunities. It's another one we're involved with in the University of Glasgow and equally in Abertay. And the Scottish Business Resilience Centre and Police Scotland have a close affiliation with the, um, ethical, uh, the Abertay Ethical Hacking Programme. And I suppose in regards to why I stand up here as a policeman, and James' slide was about prevention. And I'm old enough, sadly, to remember when Mr Ford and Mr BMW invested millions in, in, in their car production when they had to, to put a, take off the little top, um, sorry, the little black button in the door, and they put in car alarms and immobilisers. If you live in an urban environment, you should have an alarm in your house. Um, now you need, I think you need to treat your digital, your own personal and corporate digital footprint in the same way. You need to be careful in regards to that. And, and for me, in regards to the Scottish Business Resilience Centre, that's what we're here for, working with Police Scotland, working with a range of partners, because we cannot do it alone, absolutely. And these are some of the groups we facilitate at the, um, at the centre. This, the expert group brings together about 55 se uh, senior security officials right across all sectors, sharing information, sharing the recent threat vectors, sharing intelligence, sharing initiatives about internships and recruitment and the ways forward. Uh, we have the Trusted Partners Group, which is a really uh, super group of guys in regards to there are incident responders and our cyber essentials accreditors. And, and a go-to place for us in regards to who do you call when you've lost, if you, you've had a Maersk incident? God forbid. Are we really good at incident response in this country? There's a guy who's in the audience, I won't embarrass him, but um, go to an incident response um, lecture tomorrow um, and you, I, 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 you will learn a lot. This for me is a growing area in Scotland. I call it the cyber hug. Whether you're um, a person who's been systemically stalked on Facebook, somebody who's stolen your identity, um, you have a massive ransomware attack or a malware attack, those first few errors, we call it victimology, the impact on your life is significant. And are we really good at doing that? And that's areas of business that we're helping within the SBRC. And finally on the right, um, we share through the financial group um, the latest threat vectors. And what was it last week? I mean, I think there's more frequency now in regards to CVEs coming out. It was an RDP, um, vulnerability and there was also a SharePoint vulnerability. Do we get that out quick enough to our, to our partners? Other cyber initiatives there which are pretty extensive. I highlight internships because you're in front of me as an audience of employers. Are we doing enough to contact 
Napier and the various universities and using um, our, our indigenous talent in regards to these key roles. In fact, cyber apprenticeships right underneath it is equally as important. But then um, these are some of the initiatives we have. Um, also, if to make you more aware of, of the National Cybersecurity Centre Board Toolkit, and we're talking about pr preparation through resilience, through prevention, and this is a, a really good toolkit that the NCSC have produced. Adaptable to any infrastructure, but some great ideas in regards to um, how to protect your network. There's also exercise in a box, a portal-based exercise, CTF-type red teaming, um, where you can go on and you can pull down, actually, injects and, and um, various instructions in regards to how to test your, uh, how to test your, ex sorry, how to test your company. And I would suggest we don't, we talk a good game in regards to uh, cyber resilience, but this is something that could help you, and again, uh, adaptable to most organizations. Cybersecurity challenge we had here, and we're preparing for the cyber awards, the great and the good in regards to um, um, what we're doing in Scotland. And even here at the bottom, I'll, I'll highlight the Turing testers in regards to some great work that the girls have done out in West Lothian through their university, and now they're giving back to the younger, um, and uh, to me, an excellent initiative in regards to what the Turing testers, they moved from uh, university, so high school, and they're now in university uh, going forward. Anybody a member of CISP in the audience? I'm disappointed. Please take away, have a look at the cyber, sh cyber security information sharing partnership run by CERT UK, run by GCHQ, run by the NCSC. Actually, I mean, you said three companies there. Who's it run by? It's run by the NCSC, but it's a place we can share on the Skynet node, which is up in front of you in regards to the latest threats that are hitting your organization. Lots of good stuff on CISP. Um, and then again, in moving towards conclusion, um, just in regards to cyber resilience, and I mentioned that we, you know, a pre-planned exercise. Do we take part in a pre-planned exercise in our, in, our, in our infrastructure? I appreciate it's difficult to get your key personnel away, but please take away in regards to, when's the last time we actually, what if it went wrong? Where is our backup? Who's going to take control? What's our contingency plan for backup? Are we backing up on site? Um, who's, going to help, who's, going to take, who's going to deal with the media? And, and, and I refer to kind of Dido Harding here, Dido Harding here in the Talk Talk incident. And I don't blame Dido, Dido Harding. Um, I blame actually our PR people who pushed her out in front of the world's media, not knowing what was going on in our organization. So have a what if press media statement ready in regards to if that was your company, I could pick on somebody in the audience. I could make it up in regards to what if that happened that you could not alone speak to your, forget about your customers, you couldn't even speak to your staff. And, and Maersk and DL Piper were one of that in regards to an, an example of that. So some ideas there in regards to going forward and cyber essentials is something we always promote. Are we moving towards a mandatory accreditation within cyber, within industry in Scotland? We have uh, cyber essentials, cyber essentials plus, we have 27001, we have the NIST directive. In other areas of business, we spoke about PCI compliance. If you're doing business with the government now, you have to have cyber essentials. In five years' time, will we have that because of the potential consequences of an attack on our CNI or one of our key banks? I'm not saying you heard it here first, but also in regards to Cyber Essentials Plus, we're giving away, the Scottish Government are giving away free money. The Scottish Government are giving away free money, Jim, in regards to take a thousand pounds and you can get Cyber Essentials Plus. Um, so if you're interested in that, please have a look at that. And that's, um, it's, it's again, pretty okay, basic in its application, but it's the five key parts which I had up there are a move towards Cyber Essential Plus and at least you repelling attack in your organization. This is some of the stuff we provide at Scottish Business Resilience Centre. Yes, um, Curious Frank is a commercial side of our business where we use um, students and graduates from various universities in regards to vulnerability assessments, pen testing, um, testing your networks and, and some other stuff. But it's also a focus on, on our ethos within the Resilience Centre is partnership. Absolutely partnership and collaboration is the key. And there's me finishing up, Adrian. And I'm on time, which is even stranger. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for your attention. Thanks very much. Please give a round of applause for Adrian. Fantastic. Let me get my heat up.
Actually, we must also thank you, um, actually, on behalf of maybe James and Stuart, that you didn't get, you came here and you didn't go to Bill's lecture. I, I can, I, so we do seem to have a few minutes. Uh, we have uh, the other group joining us uh, at half past for the closing, uh, closing presentation. Um, from, uh, I think, uh, our Vice Principal of Research and Innovation. So we do seem to have time for questions. Uh, if you have any questions for our panel um, of speakers, the three speakers that we had, um, that would be Stuart, uh, James, or Eamon, uh, please can you stick your hand up and then we will throw the appropriate cube in your direction. Excellent. Person at the back. Give it, give it a good throw. <laughs> Actually, uh, sorry. You know, we do the Chris Simon Christmas lectures every year, and we have about uh, we get, we do four and a half thousand young people, um, and we've got about three hundred in this in auditorium. And you know the way you get paranoid about health and safety, and from a policing perspective. And here, Bill Buchanan reaches into a, a box of sweets, and he just goes whoosh, <laughs> to two hundred children. And I said, please don't start throwing things about. Kerry. <laughs> Occupational hazards. Awesome. Stick your hand up if you want to ask a question. It'll get to you in the end. Right at the back. Have a filler for you. Okay, is, you want to ask one first and then? Oh, I was nominated. No, it's up, the gentleman up the back. Sorry, before we turn into chaos here. That's not a gentleman, I'm sorry, that's a, I, you're completely in the dark, I do apologise. Hi, sorry. You are in the dark, sorry, just so. Hi, thanks for the presentations. I'm Georgina Jameson and Edinburgh Napier University's Knowledge Exchange Manager with a focus on the Industrial Strategy Challenge Funds. Could you comment a little bit, please, on the type of hardware that we might need to just back up all of your software initiatives that you mentioned. Um, and the reason I ask is because the Industrial Strategy Challenge Fund is releasing funding, looking at hardware and how it links in with software. So if you have any comments on that, please. Wow, what a great question. Mm -hmm. um, do, you, do you know that Adrian is currently studying a PhD in that very subject? In the, <laughs> uh, I think it was, I'll, I'll bounce it over. But so uh, so fr from, from our perspective, and I can pick up this with you, uh, it, 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 the answer is it, it depends, okay, um, because it depends on the particular strategy. We have to tie this into, if we're doing it as a university, we have to tie this into our IT strategy. And, and the real answer is, do we want to push this off into the cloud uh, and run it through those services, or do we want to bring it in-house? Or, or do we want to do a hybrid, which is do some of each? And, and so that really is a, a question, a larger question, because we already have a degree of cyber protection within the university. We're not completely inept at what we do, although it may seem like that at times. Um, but we have a strategy, and I can introduce you to the people within our sister uh, uh, kind of um, uh, institutions within the university to, to talk about that. But from a general perspective, um, the hardware that you would need is really a mixture of what you currently have, because if you bring in new skills, you have to then look at the maturity of your institution and how it's set up. Um, but you know, th there are a, a larger um, set of hardware servers, how much volume you would need, what that means in terms of management, um, the skills to run that. So there is a much larger question on cost and longevity, because this is something that has to go in perpetuity. It's not something that can fade away. We have to own own that as a university. Um, but but I'll pass you over to James, so maybe he can enlighten you on some of the other stuff uh, as well from a financial perspective. Or from a security. Yeah, it, it does. It, I think I think the criticality of your data is a key question you've got to ask yourself. How important is that data to you? And then based on that, what security do you want to put around it? So those, those are the first, first questions you need to be asking yourself. Adrian's already alluded to, obviously, sizing, how much data, what's the growth, how much data it's going to be. And uh, as Stuart's already alluded to as well, encryption. Uh, by default, everything should be encrypted at rest. But 
if he, you potentially, I mean, you could even come speak to Stuart because uh, he, he could uh, he could offer his DLT solution, which was uh, a way of encrypting data. But again, it depends on how quickly you need to access the data as well. Um, there's a whole bunch of questions you need to ask yourself. Uh, yeah, I'd just say the, the other two things is uh, you have to balance up protecting the data versus the usability of the data. And, you know, you can encrypt everything every way, but, you know, and nobody really, well, some people do, but it's because you need to use the data. Um, so you've got to work out which data you want to protect more and classify it. I mean, there's some good models around for doing it. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Do, do, we, have a, do we have another question? I, I did see two hands go up at one point. Uh, we just asked one. There was one in the middle somewhere. Yep. Oh. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, exactly. Strain myself going over the desk there. Um, I was just going to ask, um, we've had quite a lot of talks today, uh, particularly looking around the, uh, or particularly trying to exhort uh, the user awareness and um, how, how we get people on board with security um, uh, awareness and, and so on and so forth, and also the problem of how we educate and bring people into the field. And this has been a, a running theme throughout the day. And, and I guess I, I kind of wanted to ask the question is, Apart from what we have already with the Cyber Academy engaging at, at that level of, of education, particularly uh, around the sort of younger and our, uh, students at high schools and, and, and so on and so forth, um, and uh, Eamon, you talked about a bit about that as well um, in terms of some of the, th the initiatives happening with uh, uh, throughout Scotland on that. But I'm just wondering, we, there's a whole whole room full of uh, professionals in this in this field. And um, I, I just feel like we're not very good, I'm um, rambling here a bit, um, but we're not very good at um, taking that message out of our community uh, and speaking to people. And I'll and take that, Adrian. If we can't so. do it even in our own organisations, how do we bring people in? No, a really good point. Rambling, you've just seen it for the last 20 minutes. So yeah. what, what I would say to you is there, and, and uh, you know, in 20 minutes trying to cover the activity that's going across Scotland, and, and again, it's this, sometimes do we operate in silos, but we are now um, actually world leaders in the fact that we, we are offering in our education program um, cyber orientated awards at primary level. Uh, we have awards at fourth year, fifth year, sixth year in regards to uh, digital forensics, uh, ethical hacking, and data security and assurance. We have the H&D, H&C, and the, under, the undergraduate program at level 10, and the masters at 11. And so we're constantly uh, driving that education process through and the, and the gender imbalance in, in initiative in regards to our education in schools. Um, through some groups like the Trusted Partners, and, and it happens to me frequently in regards to, uh, we're I spoke to a bunch of fifth and sixth years yesterday, but I go back to my industry partners and ask them, could you give me, a, could you come along and give me, uh, give me a system uh, help me with this presentation from an industry perspective, you know, to try and put uh, to put them in front of uh, the audience, a, a young ethical hacker, a young student, somebody who's been in the security industry for a long time. I sometimes think we hear we've lost that generation gap in regards to we need to get, you know, um, we have six, five and six year olds with iPads and, and phones and we need to address that also. So it's just some of the part, of, some of the initiatives that are going on. But again, I would always, um, any time a presentation request comes in from me, I'm going out to some of my industry partners within that locality um, with a view to creating that kind of parochial feel around internships, apprenticeships, potential employment, um, uh, come give me a hand with that chat. So that's, some of the, that's just some of the initiatives that are going on. So, so I'd, I'd like to come back to you on that. So there is, uh, I'm, I'm representing IC Squared as well today, so uh, we have a, a training program based around Garfield for children. So it's about ch teaching children to be safe online, Not lots of nice, easy to follow videos. And the idea is the children learn to be safe online, then they ch teach the grandparents. Um, there's also uh, an example of, uh, in Scotland where there's actually, a, like for children, there's a cyber train, there's a cyber test area where the children can learn basic cyber skills and, and some basic things. There's, there's a URL, particularly in Scotland, which is really good. 
So you need to look internationally, not just within Scotland, is what I'd say. Uh, just to follow up on that, there are other academies as well. As Eamon just you know, mentioned, Cisco Academy, uh, we, have, uh, we run that uh, as well here. Um, and also Checkpoint, they also have an academy. Um, and, and to pick up on your larger point, I think that there is, um, or, or there could be more effort put in by professionals within the field to try and engage and spread the word around STEM technology in general. I mean, we are all engineers and practitioners and to encourage the younger generation to be more digitally aware. I don't think that's necessarily um, a, a, an issue. We, they all have mobile phones and are glued to them. So they get the fundamentals, but the issues around security and how secure is that device, they need to be more aware. Everybody needs to be generally more aware. I mean, even when you're a professional in an office, you saw the stats today, it, it's slightly alarming, right? I mean, you know, even 3% of IT professionals, IT security professionals still click the link. I mean, come on, it's your job, right? So, you know, even at those stats, three in a hundred still is three too many. So we do need to be more aware even, you know, uh, f for that. So I, I do think that, you know, I I'm speaking to the converted, you're here because you're interested, you're motivated. It's the people that aren't in this room that are the problem that we need to try and address. Here, because. Here. You know, that, that's, that's this self-selecting nature. You know, you already get it. You don't need to listen to me to tell you how important it is because you're already here, right? It's the other people that we need to reach in your organizations that as ambassadors, you know, we are all trying to make sure that we can spread the word and make everybody a little bit safer. Um, and that, that's the kind of mission that we're on, really, and, you know, collectively. So please do try and take that message back to your organizations. And there are programs around, and if you have difficulty, we are more than happy to try and, you know, approach your organizations on your behalf or with you to try and see what can be done uh, at their pace. Because everybody has a different maturity model, right? And it's being able to align these messaging, this messaging with your organization to take you on that journey. And if you're finding it difficult to kind of crack that nut, then we might be able to provide a little bit more support for you to try and do that. Okay? Thanks, David. So I think we've now finished um, this particular lecture. I, I, I get the impression that um, everybody's now joined us from the Riyadi, uh, from the uh, Lindsay Stewart. Is that right? Yeah. Excellent. Okay. So that means Bill finished. Do you want the microphone back? Yeah, 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 that'd be great. There was no way. <laughs> Still works. So I think uh, that we are waiting for uh, Nick to, uh, to provide the speech. He's supposed to be here at, well, six minutes ago, actually. But does anybody know where, where Nick is? What's that? Uh, six, six. Ten minutes ago. Ten minutes ago? Yeah, he was, yeah. Okay. So it seems as though we have some opportunity for more questions. Um, if anybody wants to ask anything uh, generally to, to our three presenters or anything else that might spring to mind, more than happy to throw the, uh, the cube at you. The tokenization model you talked about, about shaving data, yeah. um, it's quite a good idea. Uh, but how would you, they, I think the, the processing of the payments for it is where I think that opens a whole new pile of box of problems that you're trying to, because I agree OIDC, OAuth 2 is just giving data away in the hope that nothing bad happens. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, so um, I mean, that, that was more, I admit, it's more conceptual because I've, what I've, I've looked at blockchain, I've looked at DLT, I've looked at different mechanisms. Um, 
And uh, for me, that I'd have a separate, I'd, I may even use your service, I might have a separate process flow for payments with a separate DLT, which would dedicate to payments which is completely separate from my data, basically. So it, that's how I'd address the issue. Yep. Um, so one of the things we've been talking about and we're going to implement soon um, is this idea of wallets to claims, but also instead of like OIDC and OAuth 2 is how we all log into Facebook and stuff, nobody knows, and Google and all this. And one of the things is, I think the answer is attest attest attestations of data. It's once you've proved data, put the knowledge of that data in your wallet, and then you don't have to pass your name. You just have to say, I have a name, and Napier says I do. And that should be good enough for the data processors. Yeah, I mean, passing you, personal data has to stop. Yeah, you're, co you're coming to the, the fundamental issue about identity and how do I identify who I am and how do I therefore authenticate having I defined my identity. I think that's where you're heading. No, I absolutely agree. I think it's a, it's a fundamental challenge for everybody is this whole identity piece and how can we prove who we are essentially yep. in, in a digital world consistently yes. without, without somebody copying my identity in some way and then um, you know, pretending to be me in some way. So exactly. I think it's an yeah. absolute massive challenge. Yeah. It's connecting the pink squishy thing to the digital you as the connect, biggest issue. Connect, still connect, never connect. Solved it. Until they start putting chips in the back of our head, we're, you know, we're going to have to just think of it a better way. Yes. Okay, thank you very much, guys. Thanks, uh, that James. was a great interlude. Thank you so much. Please round of applause for the presenters. So we have um, our professor, um, Antonopoulos, um, who is our vice principal for research and innovation at uh, Napier University. So um, he'll provide our closing speech. Thank you very much. Round of applause. Thank you. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Okay. Enough positive answers so we can proceed. I can certainly. Here. Okay. That's fine. Um, here you are. Okay. All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. And um, uh, can I thank uh, Basil and uh, Bill, my colleagues, for the uh, invitation? Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So I'm Professor Nick Antonopoulos. I'm the Vice Principal for Research and Innovation uh, here at Edinburgh Napier. Uh, university and I will be taking about 15 or 20 minutes uh, just to share with you my thoughts around cybersecurity and emerging technologies, uh, which is of course, you know, the theme uh, for this particular conference. I hope you have found the conference so far uh, very, very useful. It's certainly uh, very, very relevant uh, and I sure hope that you will be able to enjoy also the second day uh, tomorrow. Uh, so what I will try to do is just talk uh, briefly um, about the importance, of course, of cybersecurity, its uh, kind of core components, its key issues, uh, a little bit of statistics and data in terms of uh, attacks and preferences uh, of uh, cyber criminals, identify the key challenges within the industry, try to highlight also uh, some uh, overlapping and some relationships between cybersecurity and a whole host uh, of emerging technologies. Collectively, these days, they are referred to as Industry 4.0. I'm referring, of course, to AI, machine learning, big data, Internet of Things, as well as cloud computing and high-performance computing uh, in general. Uh, I will conclude with a few figures in terms of how the industry is likely to look like uh, over the next few years in terms of numbers. And then I will spend just a few minutes to also highlight uh, we as a university what it is that we do uh, with respect to the challenges uh, that we have. Uh, just before I start, just a little bit of my own background. I'm a physicist and a computer scientist. My own area of specialization is uh, cloud computing and artificial intelligence, specifically neural networks, and how do we use those methods to enhance uh, information retrieval in large scale uh, distributed systems. A little bit of a prolonged title that, but that is uh, what I do with my doctoral students. Uh, so, uh, moving forward, I believe when it comes to cybercrime, that is a one-way street in terms of growth or no growth. It is growing and it is going to grow even further. Um, and the reason behind that is because there are two fundamental uh, elements. Uh, firstly, really, there is an ever-expanding number of online 
services. Secondly, there is the increasing evolution, of course, of cyber criminals uh, and the uh, eternal kind of you know, game or play uh, against cybersecurity experts in terms of who outsmarts uh, whom. Um, companies, unfortunately, do remain highly vulnerable uh, to uh, cyber attacks. And those that have the highest vulnerability are those that fail to create a culture of security within the organization. So it's not just about incorporating cybersecurity in systems and operations, but it's the question as to how well the human workforce of the company truly appreciates that challenge uh, and, and, and that issue. The impact of um, cyber attacks, of course, is very, very significant. We're talking about commercial losses. We're talking about public relation uh, issues, disruption of operations, extortion, just to name a few, and I will be having a slide later on about that. And I'm afraid with constant technical innovation, there is a constant number of increasing kind of dangers that come to the surface. And I put here an example in terms of migrating critical data about a particular company or its operations onto a third party uh, cloud provider. There are many more examples where trying to adopt emerging technologies also incorporates an inherent risk when it comes to cyber security. There are quite a few different types, of course, of cyber attacks, and this is a rather kind of, you know, simplistic way uh, of, of showing how, you know, a little bit of a typology, I would say. Um, typically, we're talking about service unavailability, so denial of service attacks, uh, ransomware, uh, they tend to form uh, sort of, you know, the bulk uh, of the attacks. Uh, data theft and exposures is really another uh, typical uh, attack involving data breaches and ID uh, theft. Uh, monitoring and manipulation uh, is yet another type of attack, of course, uh, particularly harmful because we're talking about long-term data and information harvesting from within the organization. And of course, the fourth type, I would say, it's the own and obliterate. So you take uh, administrative control uh, of infrastructure and then you use that as part of your entire set of assets to launch strategic attacks against bigger corporations, government, uh, utility infrastructure, uh, and so on. So quite comprehensive, quite a few different elements that can involve a cyber uh, attack. But from those elements, we can also start appreciating a little bit in terms of what are those key components uh, behind cybersecurity. So we are talking about monitoring the network, of course, uh, and understanding from that traffic as to whether there is an incident ongoing and how we can respond to it. For the same purpose, we are talking about host monitoring, server monitoring. So we try to understand whether applications are operating nominally or otherwise. Um, we are talking about automating processes, trying to simplify them, making them as effective and efficient as possible. The less complex our processes are, the less inherent risk from a cybersecurity perspective uh, there is. Also, we are talking about threat intelligence. So it's not just about defending against what is happening now, but do we understand what is likely to emerge in the near future, how it may affect us, and what can we do about it uh, at this point in time. Behavioral analysis these days is also uh, quite common. Uh, simply, this is a method to understand what level of insider threats are uh, in a particular organization. So what if we don't get things right? Uh, then, of course, we have successful cyber attacks. And this is a uh, little uh, bar chart that I got from the technology trends a couple of years ago. Uh, I believe it's still current in terms of the relationship of the different fields, um, indicating really that customer records and IP are by far the most targeted uh, assets in organizations. Notice that this particular graph here is specifically for SMEs. And I just wanted to mention that a little bit more. Why SMEs? Compared to larger organizations and corporations, SMEs have less ability to recover after a significant and successful cyber attack. So for them to be able to defend successfully against one is actually even more important compared to much bigger and more established corporation. The challenge, of course, in doing that, being successful against cyber attacks, is really a very big one. And there are many reasons as to why it is big. Firstly, uh, we have a constant 
uh, tsunami, I would say, of new malicious files uh, and threats that are surfacing on a daily uh, and weekly basis. Um, secondly, uh, we do still rely on SQL-based uh, tools and infrastructure because they're quite affordable, uh, because they're quite prevalent. However, they do have inherent risks. And removing those risks means that most companies will have to invest uh, on more significant and expensive uh, software infrastructure. I left the other two elements as last because, in my view, they're the most significant. Firstly, the digital physical um, convergence. This is actually what Industry 4.0 is all about. It's not just about harnessing emerging technologies. It is about integrating them with the human workforce. So it is now better understood by businesses that a, a complete solution to uh, security is not just digital or physical, but a combination of. Well, getting that combination right is a very significant challenge and a difficult question for most uh, companies. Last but absolutely not least, this element about understanding knowledge and techniques. So still, I feel there is a very, very significant number uh, of people working uh, in the industry who do not have a full awareness of what cybersecurity is, how devastating cyber attacks can be, and how frequent they are in practice. Raising that awareness, raising that understanding is an essential part of that challenge to be able to move uh, forward, I feel. So, someone can say, well, I mean, it's not only challenge, uh, we also have some significant extra tools uh, coming into the armory in terms of protecting against cyber attacks. And these are, of course, all these emerging and disruptive, to a certain extent, uh, technologies. Uh, taking, for instance, big data analytics, uh, as an example. Uh, through that, we can afford more real-time monitoring of secured uh, systems. Uh, we can certainly try to deliver safety and security, what I would say, for the masses. We can run many more complex queries real-time over huge volumes of data. We can actually get deeper insights from our data and use that to protect against cyber attacks. Uh, one typical example is to try to use these techniques uh, to discover uh, ongoing network attacks which are actually well hidden within our typical uh, network traffic. And crucially, one will say, well, big data analytics is a fantastic tool uh, to help us prevent rather than just uh, cure. And again, one could argue the same goes for the other technologies, for example, cloud computing and Internet of Things. Uh, they go hand in hand. It's marvelous news for businesses. You know, you can scale your services, you can customize your applications, access them from anywhere, get applications to the market quickly. IoT is going to have a proper uh, explosion of growth. Now the 5G service in the UK has been deployed by E, and I believe Vodafone will be launching uh, shortly. And unlike, of course, you know what most people think about 5G, uh, which is just a speed upgrade over 4G, it is actually uh, the key infrastructure which is needed to be able to fully deploy uh, the IoT uh, model and framework. Um, going further, of course, machine learning and AI is also part of that toolkit that we can successfully utilize to provide uh, better cybersecurity. Uh, for instance, we can certainly utilize that in the context of video streams because there are quite a few researchers that predict that going forward, more and more content on the internet is going to be uh, in the form of videos. And we can utilize that for an awful lot of useful uh, security applications. Uh, it is a critical part of what we refer to um, as smart uh, cities. And certainly, we can try to provide through that way intelligent, comprehensive, and rapid uh, threat uh, detection. However, not just for machine learning and AI, and by the way, I mentioned both because they are related, but they are not exactly uh, identical. But whatever goes for ML and AI, as well as cloud computing, uh, IoT, um, and big data analytics, it's not just the cybersecurity experts that can make use of those freely available uh, toolkits. It's, of course, the cyber criminals as well. And there is evidence to indicate that this, what I refer to as inter-eternal game, 
between experts and criminals is likely to go on so these tools and techniques is not going to be the silver bullet through which we will be able to stop the tsunami of cyber attacks because they do have those two facets the good use and the not so good uh, use last thing to say when it comes to all these technologies there is also a balance that needs to be hit with privacy it is absolutely incredible the amount of information that systems will be able to harvest about any one of us uh, and our behavior over time um, through very simple means and from that to be able to predict what it is that we will do and when we will try to do that. So not a silver bullet, but certainly um, a whole set of techniques that we can utilize uh, to improve the way uh, that we are providing cybersecurity. Going forward uh, in the future, again, I provide here a few uh, numbers. Cybercrime damage, these are uh, worldwide kind of figures, $6 trillion uh, by 2021 in terms of damages, uh, $1 trillion in terms of cybersecurity spending over the next few years, a huge demand in terms of cybersecurity specialists, and I do highlight that um, simple yet a pretty powerful attack called the ransom, ransomware, and of course, uh, you do remember, I think it was just over a year ago, the massive ransomware attack to the NHS. Uh, perhaps you can recall that, it was particularly uh, devastating. Seven billion dollars uh, is expected to be the damage by 2020 around the world just from uh, ransomware. So it's, I would say, a very mixed kind of picture, full of opportunities, but also full of threats. And it is a question as to how do we use those opportunities to alleviate the threats. I will be closing this short presentation of mine by having just a few slides in terms uh, of Edinburgh Navy University. So, so what it is that we do in the context of the challenges that I uh, highlighted. So as a university, we will be focusing on the overlap of three elements. Firstly, what we are really strong at and cybersecurity uh, is of course one of those themes. The core challenges that industry and business face, as well as the key government and regional priorities, we believe by hitting that um, overlap between the three circles, we'll be able to maximize the quality and volume of difference that we make, positive difference, may I add, uh, to the uh, city, the region, and beyond. Um, our vision really is about focusing on innovation really strengthened by advanced technology and data science. So we are planning to actually uh, fully embrace uh, the technologies that I referenced above. And we want to do that in two ways. Firstly, to be able to bring together all these core enabling technologies for Industry 4.0 to be able to offer a collaborative research uh, and business service to the region and beyond. But the second bullet point is equally important not just for me, but for all my colleagues here in the university, it's about education. So as a university, we have a major role to play in upskilling the workforce in the context of all these uh, technologies, systems, and processes. Um, in terms of sector focus as a university, we are going to look specifically, obviously, into health and well-being, uh, the area of smart cities, energy in the environment, and supply chain. This is something we are currently discussing, but we feel that these are the areas we will be focusing on. All of these underpinned by what I refer to as data science and technology, and cybersecurity is one of the most important components uh, of data science. The others, of course, being high performance computing, data visualization, artificial intelligence, and machine uh, learning. So this is what we are trying to do uh, at the moment. We are planning over the next couple of years to potentially launch a university innovation hub that will be hosting all our external uh, collaborative uh, work that we are doing with other organizations uh, and, the broader, and the broader business. But I would like to finish really with nothing else but the Cyber Academy, uh, which is really the organizer uh, for this event. And just to say a few words about it, really a very novel and a well-established initiative uh, by the university and my good colleagues here in the School uh, of Computing, specifically set up to address the challenges that I mentioned before, 
to business and industry. And exactly as per the vision that I articulated earlier, not just providing an environment for collaborative R&D and true innovation, but also offering that upskilling, that training, that raising of awareness uh, regarding cybersecurity. And of course, it is very much uh, open for business, so really, really happy I will be later on uh, if you would like to come and speak to me or my good colleagues uh, from computing in case you have in mind a particular collaboration or particular opportunity. And with that, I would like to thank you very much. I hope I didn't take that much of your time. I hope you found the day very useful, and I hope you will find tomorrow even more useful. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Andronopoulos. Thank you very much, everybody, for being here. Uh, we do have some time for set aside for questions, if there are any for the last uh, few speakers or for uh, the vice principal. Of course. <laughs> Where's the box? I'm supposed, supposed to throw it to you. Oh, uh. Good. Okay. I don't know if this thing works or not. So. Uh, okay, so I have a question for the vice principal, if I may. Um, I saw you think about smart cities, really interesting, and obviously one of the drivers for that is IoT. However, I, I, in my opinion, one of the challenges for IoT is security. So how do you see addressing the issues of IoT security in smart cities where IoT may be produced and there's no real standards for security properly, and so there, there'll be a legacy of IoT devices which may be insecure, and then hopefully Edinburgh Napier University will provide the standards and then we'll have secure IoT devices. But how do you, how do you see us addressing that gap in smart cities going forward, sorry? No, thank you very much for this question. There isn't an easy uh, answer to that. Firstly, I will thank you very much for your comment that uh, EMU is likely to produce the uh, relevant standards uh, going forward. No, I'm aware of the challenge uh, in the way that um, you put it and it is quite, uh, quite evident. Uh, in the form of various types of cyber attacks that can occur within the context uh, of uh, IoT. So in other words, already there is plenty of infrastructure uh, in place, but the appropriate kind of you know, security layers are not uh, there at this particular point. Um, I believe probably there are a couple of different options uh, going forward. Uh, so one option which I would say has been used uh, you know, quite widely uh, within computing in general is the uh, proxy approach. Uh, so highly likely that we will start witnessing a raft of security solutions for IoT that will be offered through, um, let's say, proxy servers. Uh, so effectively, the security service will be offered through a separate network, and therefore there will be an intermediate uh, kind of connectivity that will be required. Uh, for that, and probably that will uh, buy the industry an amount of time until we can migrate into newer versions of IoT protocols where security is truly uh, embedded there. Um, the key challenge I would say here is not just a question of standardization uh, of protocols, uh, but also really also in the design of the physical IoT uh, devices, uh, and it is uh, incredible to see, uh, and I have seen that in various contexts, that the stringent standards that are applied elsewhere have not yet been applied to this particular domain. So I do uh, echo your concern. It's a very real problem. I do anticipate uh, that one way forward is going to be through that particular approach of proxy services, which has been done before in the broader computing arena, um, only to be able to have enough time to design things, I would say, a little bit more properly. But <clears throat> I have to say this is, I will not prolong my answer, but it is another example of uh, considering security as a bolt-on uh, after the primary software system has been designed. So, so, so that has been really a concern. Yeah, and, and I think the challenge is it's time to market, okay, so that that's... That's the, that's the real, commercial reality of the IoT companies. And, I, and I've seen other examples in Barcelona where they save millions of pounds using IoT to, for conserving energy in smart cities. So it does work, but I think, yeah, there's this balance between return on investment, time to market, and security. Thank you very much.
Good. Uh, any, any more questions? Nope. Then thank you very much all for being here. Round of applause for the last uh, Tomorrow, tomorrow we have two more. Uh, another day of uh, the second day of the conference. We have two streams: one in cybersecurity and one in GDPR. Oops. Thank you. Uh, GDPR. Um, it starts at 10 o'clock. We'll be looking to uh, see you all tomorrow. Um, and thank you very much. Have a nice afternoon. All right. Thank you, Nick. Lovely, great speech. Thank you very much. Eamon from the Scotland and the South Academy. Oh, no, okay. Thank you very much. You know, now, you know, in my police file, you're under known associates. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, James, quite nice to meet you. So, that, so that, you that you know where you stand. <laughs> All right. Thanks, no, for, no. thanks for inviting me to speak. Uh, no, uh, yeah, thank you, Basil. Very much appreciated. Uh, I'll yeah, see you later it's, on. It's, it's yes, a very common issue. All right, yeah. It's very nice to be yes. with you. Yes. Uh, and getting things out to market. Yeah. But it's the best just thing. Just oh, here's the phone. Okay. I'm in the way. Yeah. Is it four? Uh, oh, thank you very much. All right. yeah. Can we get the handcuffs? <laughs> you stay on, uh, on, on your left, so, yeah. Yeah, right. so we can get a bit of the panel. All right, that's great. Oh, come on, now, come on. <laughs> <laughs> we, don't get any we don't get any younger look. <laughs> James, you do. So, so I, think, I, think, I think it's a great possibility to save money and save energy and, and to balance out more money that's wasted on the blockchain. <sighs> You're right. Money. Yes. So, so, so we are on the deal. So I, I see you no, I'm going to go. Uh, what time is it now? Fine. No, 16. I'm going to go home and do some, uh, get some work done. And, uh, yeah. Carl's yeah. picking me up at half six outside. So that's it. Uh, so I'll see you at 7 o'clock. See you later. Uh, all good. Very much. Yeah, and I've seen a lot of failed smart cities as well in terms of like Malta where they built on the heart of it and they stopped because they ran out of money. So I think it's a, it's a good thing to have urban means. No, I, I and, and, and I, but I think what would be really, really cool is if we get ahead of the lead in terms of saving money in smart cities. Uh, they, they, and they, 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 they might be distributed yet yeah, later. later. How we do things speakers, here, can but, we, can we uh, save all the presentations will be online. Can we switch off the lights? Can we make okay, all the lights so, uh, smart uh, and better for them? So let, 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 let's let's uh, let's uh, let's 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 let's
perhaps the, the biggest push comes from the department that we may not think. <laughs> so we may think that everything is going to come from IT security, but they are. It may come from somewhere else. But it may come from risk and compliance. So yeah. because now we the, yes, because now we are very much interested in with the, with the ethics and GDPR. Yeah. Yeah. Because the IC the ICO is shaking the, uh, the building. Just let you know. Let just let you know <laughs> that he's also one of our graduates. Yeah, uh, and uh, he's also uh, uh, Ivan and Harry McLaren from PTA. I, I, I'm bringing them both in as associates in the university. Good. Uh, so they'll be part, officially part of the team, but also they'll be involved in that training. Uh, yeah. 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 training. Can, can I suggest something? If there is a USB type in the system, yeah. it's much easier. Yeah. A method that has worked with, uh, let's say, a few other particular big companies, let's say, yeah. You know, for this case, mm -hmm. is a simple workshop yep. whereby we can, you know, sort of, you know, share, you know, within a small team, mm -hmm. some challenges, some work we have been doing, mm -hmm. uh, but it can also be clipped into what the father said, you know, listening and the response. So, so a session whereby we will try to understand your challenges, yep. and then we'll be able to respond back, and then we can see how we work together. So, all sorts of different ways. Um, but, but I'm interested, you know, to say to guys, <coughs> you know, your time really to be driven by the problems that you've got, yep. and probably you have at least one. Uh, <laughs> 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 um, and then we can build it. I had uh, what uh, Basil said about graduates. Uh, this is really an issue because um, I can tell you quite a few uh, corporations have you know, very much interested in doing, you know, in their talent pool yep. uh, in that particular way. So. Some work, depending on what you do, may be, may be fantastic as a, you know, as a project or uh, perhaps a short placement or anything along those lines. So replacements and all the set up, uh, graduates will, will be great. But other one is when, what we talk, that perhaps is a little bit more ambitious. Uh, funding, uh, PhDs, yes. for certain, uh, certain they, fields, uh, like, like, like the, the, the data strategist uh, in NET who said that uh, uh, he's given a carte blanche to start the strategy from scratch. Oh, right. So he's, he's not patching existing things. <coughs> he's allowed to do. And what they want to do is uh, get to a point where every piece of information inside a computer where you're learning can be traced and can uh, oh, the thing is total governance. So you know that Nick entered this information on that terminal on the 5th of October at 3.45 p.m. So, so and and oh Basil right. saw it on the next January. And Ivan added this, you know, next April. And 26 people have, have retrieved this record so far. So that blockchain is one of the ways it can be done. And you know, yeah. we have the blockchain research uh, with the Bill Lab. So when they said, oh, we will do this and we'll see, can we make a... Uh, can we develop a student to the set okay, how many, one or two? No, 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 probably around 10. Well, in, in that case, you, you're not going to get your, your, your own students, you have your own lab. <laughs> I, I, I don't want that to come uh, for the state. No, it does, but yeah, yeah, but you know, it, it, yeah, makes, well, it makes sense. It, 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 makes, it makes sense. It's very, very strategic. It's not just the money. It's not just the money. It's the, the no, amount of it's time. People will get a control. A contractor uh, yeah. costs much more money. Yeah. <laughs> the, So knowing how, how to do that. Yes. And so that's so that's it, it is all about the sorry. big moment. So our, our, our relationship with uh, uh, Toronto London is just starting. Uh, and we owe a big thanks to, uh, to Ivan. Not the same because he's, no, he's no, a friend. No. I'm saying because he, he, he actually chased the West, the West Times. Honestly, the West Times. And I was preoccupied with other things inside yeah. the academy. Yeah. He said, 
Why didn't you answer the email? <laughs> you know, the, we want to give you the money, and you why you didn't answer the email? <laughs> it's like, yeah, he was, he was more Now eager. I know I'll be asking the same questions. <laughs> but <laughs> above and beyond that. Um, so I will be very keen just to sort of, you know, see the next reflection on this stuff. Tell me yeah. what, tell me what, I'm going to put you on your, on your table now. Okay. okay. Uh, yeah. Because I hope the British are stable. I hope you will survive. Um, <laughs> my wife has loved that accusation for me saying, you know, if you were not in that position, you would have been a lawyer or a politician. I said, right, okay, I will see the positive side of that allegation uh, rather than sort of, you know, getting me on your side. No, but we'll be very, very happy to discuss it. Yeah. And if we can set up a work that was appropriate and something that, you know, we can agree. Yeah, that would that, 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 be great. So, yeah. Sorry, seven. Seven. Se seven. Seven. Yes, it's half seven. Seven o'clock is the meeting. Okay. 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 and budgets, so it can be it can be quite complex, but if we can have an initial kind of, but it will make sense for perhaps all the relevant stakeholders to be present. Yes, believe, yes. believe it or not, uh, at the end I think it's going to be more beneficial to anyone else, but I dispute that. Yeah, yeah. They will receive some training from, mm -hmm. the, you know, from all yeah. these tools, but at the end they are the real people. That yeah, the, the, the governance, you know, and, and, and the company, but this is what I'm trying to do with the Cyber Academy. I'm looking to build long-term relationships, things that will, you know, uh, it's I not one, <laughs> one off, one off, or can we get a sponsorship for a, for a conference? No, it doesn't make sense. You know, you know, these were things really from the past. Yeah. Yeah. And the, you know, this transactional kind of style is not beneficial to any party. Yeah. Right. I mean, from, from, from my side, um, we do have some excellent targets, but we do not have infinite what I'm trying to understand in my first sort of, you know, few months is, you know, how do we best utilize that uh, talent? And for me, in terms of my plan, it's about prioritization. So, so I need to understand how this relationship is likely to look like because, in being very, very honest, I'm not in the business of going around sort of, you know, oh, yeah, we can, we can do all that. And then suddenly there is a realization we have, you know, half an empty uh, already overload with other things, you know, to do all that. No. So it takes, otherwise, you know, we'll not be able to deliver on, on what we're after. Yeah. So, no, this is, this, uh, that's why I'm not in a rush. I, don't, I want things to be done yeah. properly. Cooking, uh, like yes. us too, yes, right? Yes. Yeah. Slow yeah. cooking. Slow cooking is always <laughs> I'm really, really, the best. I'm, I'm, the I'm the really really sorry you were brought into my table. So, <laughs> 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 no problem. <laughs> I'm going to be seeing you shortly. <laughs> I have to. Uh, my friend. Uh, you <coughs> I'm not sure. Is there any corner shop or something close to Cor this? Corner shop, no. A supermarket uh, nearby, no. Uh, yeah. What do you want? Well, because I always want to buy some food, but I, for first I have to I have to uh, record that.
Did it? Yeah. Just need to watch it. Uh, I can't believe that. I can't believe that. Can't believe that. Can't believe that. Can't believe that. Can't believe that.